chapter 29, The World of Fire tonight from William Bramley's The Gods of Eden. One significant byproduct of the American Revolution was a philosophical reshaping of how people viewed revolution. When Benjamin Franklin was in France to win French military support for the American cause, he engaged in an intensive public relations campaign. He vigorously promote, promulgated the idea of virtuous revolution, a concept which had already found increasing favor in the Masonic lodges. The public at that time tended to view violent revolution as a crime against society. Franklin was successful in changing this perception by encouraging people to accept violent revolutions as steps in the progress of mankind. Revolutionaries were no longer to be frowned upon as criminals, he argued, because they were idealists writing for the freedom and justice. A new motto was coined. Revolution against tyranny is the most sacred of duties. These bold ideas electrified Paris and helped to win open French support for the American cause, but at a terrible long-term cost to human society. The ideas expressed by Franklin have helped to stimulate endless bloody revolutions ever since. And I would say that today, these modern-day revolu phony revolutionaries that are just like Franklin was and the rest of these guys serving the interests of the global cartels are continuing that, trying to stimulate another bloody revolution. Alex Jones is just playing the role that his forefathers, who he talked about openly on his show, came over on the Mayflower, started when they came over here. He's just continuing that, folks. He's just a modern-day version of that. Don't you see? The American Revolution was followed by many other revolutions and or the establishment of Republican-style governments th throughout the rest Western world and South America. The success of the American Revolution had made it easy to rally people to fight. We witnessed during this era the French Revolution, the creation of the Batavian Republic in the Netherlands, the Helvetic Republic in Switzerland, the Cisalpine Republic in northern Italy, and uh, the Ligurian Republic in Genoa, and the Parthenopean Republic in southern Italy. Between 1810 and 1824, the Spanish colonies in South America took up arms and won their political independence. In 1825, the Decemberist Revolt broke out in Russia. A second revolution erupted in France in 1830. In that same year, a revolt in Holland brought about the sovereignty of Belgium. A Polish revolution in 1830 and 1831 was successfully stamped out by Russia. In 1848, a major wave of revolutionary activity swept Europe, spurred by an international collapse of credit caused in good part by the new inflatable paper money system bad harvests, and a cholera epidemic. In nearly all of those revolutions, we continue to see important revolutionary leadership positions held by Freemasons. During the first French Revolution, a key rebel leader was the Duke of Orleans, who was the Grand Master of French Masonry before his resignation at the height of the Revolution. Marquis de Lafayette, the man who had been initiated into the Masonic fraternity by George Washington, also played an important role in the French revolutionary cause. The Jacobin Club, which was the radical nucleus of the French revolutionary movement, was founded by prominent Freemasons. According to Sven Luton's article, The Annihilation of Freemasonry, quote, Herbert André Chenier, Camille de Moulins, and many other Godoans, modern French Republicans, uh, moderate French Republicans supporting Republican government over monarchy of the French Revolution were Freemasons. Freemasons were the primary leaders of the 1825 Decemberist Revolt in Russia. Some of the planning for that revolt took place within their lodges. In South America, according to Richard Dehan, writing in Collier's Encyclopedia, the order of Freemasonry played an important role in the spread of liberalism and the organization of political revolution in Latin America. Like French Freemasonry, the Latin American movement was also generally anti-clerical. Anti-clerical means anti-priest class. In Mexico and Colombia, Masons helped win independence from Spain, while in Brazil they worked against Portuguese domination. Mr. London agrees. In Latin America, too, the process of liberation from the Spanish yoke was the work of the Freemasons in large measure. Simon Bolivier was one of the most active of masonry sons, and so was San Martin, Mitre, Alvier, Severinto, Benito Juarez, and all hallowed names to Latin Americans. 
Regarding other revolutions, Mr. London adds that many of the leaders in the great year 1848, which saw so many uprisings against feudal rule in Europe, were members of the order. Among them was the great Hungarian hero of democracy, Louis Kossuth, who found a temporary refuge in America. The 1800s also witnessed the wars of Italian unification led by Giuseppe Garaldi, who was a 33rd degree mason and a grand master of Italy. The victorious Garibaldi placed Victor Emmanuel, another Freemason, on the throne. The Italian wars of unification left two important legacies, a united Italy and the modern mafia. The mafia was a loosely knit secret society founded in Sicily in the mid-1700s. This is key info here. At first, the Mafia was a resistance movement formed to oppose the foreign rulers who controlled Sicily at the time. The early mafiosi were popular heroes who specialized in criminal acts against the hated foreigners. The Mafia built an underground government in Sicily and held power by extortion. The Mafia assisted Gribaldi when he invaded Sicily in 1860 and declared himself dictator of the island. After the foreign rulers were ousted and Italy was unified, the Mafia became the violent criminal network we now know today. Freemasonry was clearly an important catalyst in the creation of modern Western-style government. The vast majority of Freemasons who participated in the revolutions were well-intended. The representative form of government they helped to create was certainly an improvement over some of the governments they had replaced. Regrettably, the lofty ideals of those Freemasons were in the process of a speedy betrayal by sources within the Brotherhood network itself. One consequence of the French Revolution was a severe disruption of the French economy. Food production had dropped severely, and the new regime was in deep political trouble because the majority of Frenchmen were still loyal to the monarchy. Under this cloud, the revolutionary government decided to solve the problems of political opposition. Hunger and distribution of wealth by reducing the human population of France. Rather than increase food production to meet demand, it was decided to reduce the demand to match the lessened amount of food. Throughout the French nation, a program of mass murder was launched as an official program of the Revolutionary Council. <coughs> this program was known as the Reign of Terror. People were put to death by all means available, including guillotine, mass drowning, bludgeoning, shooting, and starvation. Although not as many people were murdered as the council had planned, it is estimated that over 100,000 people died. We have noted that genocides, what was that called? The Reign of Terror. My goodness. No kidding there. Appropriate name for that. We have noted that genocides are committed by grouping people into superficial categories, usually based upon race, religious belief, or nationality. The victims are then targeted for slaughter, even though they may be guilty of no crimes against their murderers. The French revolutionaries took the process to an extreme. During the reign of terror, people were grouped simply according to their economic and vocational standards. Those who fell into the wrong categories were deemed members of an undesirable social class and were killed. This was certainly as superficial a distinction as one can make, yet grouping people in this fashion has been extremely successful in factionalizing human beings. The French Revolution dragged nearly all of the major powers of Europe into a war. Initially benefiting from this was William VI, the prince who had inherited the immense Hess Castle fortune. William rented out at a handsome fee, 8,000 soldiers to England to fight against the French during the first half of the 1790s when Napoleon Bonaparte later became Emperor of France. William seemed to gain even, uh, uh, William seemed to gain even more after Napoleon's troops occupied German regions of the West Rhine River, including some Hessian properties. Napoleon compensated William by awarding him a large section of Mainz and by conferring upon William the title of elector, a status higher than prince. The cordiality between Napoleon and Elector William did not last very long, however. William tried to play the old trick of courting both sides of the conflict in order to make a fortune by renting soldiers. Yeah, the old Rothschild trick there. They've been funding every sign of both wars since the American Civil War. William foolishly, foolishly leased mercenaries to the Prussian king for a quarter of a million pounds to fight Napoleon and then tried to claim neutrality. 
True to the warning of Machiavelli, this double dealing finally caught up and backfired on the House of Hesse. Hess Castle was soon annexed and made a part of Napoleon's Kingdom of Westphalia. It was not until after Napoleon's defeat at Westphalia, I'm sorry, at the Battle of, uh, of Leipzig in, in 1813, that William was able to regain Hess Castle. Hess Castle remained under the control of his dynasty until 1866 when it was taken over. Let me, let me be clear. It's a, it's a family name, Hess Castle. H-E-S-S-E dash K-A-S-S-E-L. So it's not castle as in like a royal castle. Castle. It's Hess Castle with a K. K-A-S-S-E-L. And Hess is spelled H-E-S-S-E. Just to clarify that in case there was any question. Hess Castle remained under the control of the dynasty until 1866 when it was taken over by Prussia. Although the Hessian royal family has remained influential in German society until well into the 20th century, it never regained exclusive role, rule over its territory. Hess merged in what has become modern Germany, a country that was unified in large part by the Prussian Hosleran dynasty. Despite the reversal suffered by Hess Castle, the upheavals in France proved to be a boon for one of William's financial agents. Guess who? Mayor Amschel de Rothschild, founder of one of the most influential banking houses of Europe. Mayor Amschel was an ambitious, hard-working merchant who began his career in the Jewish ghetto of Frankfurt am Main in Hesse. In 1765, two decades before the French Revolution, Rothschild managed to gain a hand, I'm sorry, managed to gain a hard-won audience with Prince William who was still at that time living in Hess Hanau. Mayor Amschel strove to ingratiate himself with the Hessian prince by selling him antique coins at extremely low prices. William, who always had an eye open to increasing his material fortunes in any way possible, was delighted to take advantage of Rothschild's generous bargains. As a reward, William granted Rothschild's request to be appointed a crown agent to the prince of Hess Hanau. <coughs> This appointment, made in 1769, was more honorary than substantial, but it gave Mayor Amschel a big boost in his community standing and aided his efforts to create a successful banking house. During the 20 years following his appointment, Mayor Amschel continued to keep in close contact with Prince William. Rothschild's goal was to become one of the prince's personal financial agents. Rothschild's perseverance finally paid off. In 1789, the year in which the French Revolution began, and four years after William inherited the wealth of Hess Castle, Mayer was given his first financial assignment on behalf of Prince William. This, in turn, led to the coveted position as a personal financial agent to the prince. Rothschild made a fortune from various activities while serving under William. The French Revolution and the wars it triggered created many shortages throughout Hess. Rothschild capitalized on this situation by sharply raising the prices of the cloth he was importing from England. Rothschild also struck a deal with another of William's chief financial agents, Carl Buterus. The deal enabled Rothschild to share in the profits from the leasing of Hessian mercenaries to England. Virginia Coles, writing in her excellent book, The Rothschilds, A Family of Fortune, described the arrangement. At this point, Mayer made a proposition to the enterprising Carl Buterans. Uh, or Buterus, it's like uterus with a B, Buterus. England was paying the Landgrave large sums of money for the hire of Hessian soldiers, and the Rothschilds were paying England large sums of money for the goods they were importing. Why not let the two-way movement cancel itself out and pocket the commissions both ways on the bills of exchange? Buterus agreed, and soon this extra string to the Rothschilds' bow was producing an impressive revenue. Out of those beginnings rose the House of Rothschild. Named after the red shield, Roth meaning red, and shield meaning shield, used as its emblem. The Rothschild family soon became synonymous with wealth, power, and banking. For generations, the Rothschild House was Europe's most powerful banking family and remains influential in the international banking community even today. 
Sharing the Rothschild house in Frankfurt during its early days was the Schiff family. The Schiffs also became a major banking family, and they have done business with the Rothschilds all the way up until our own time. Control of the Rothschilds house, as well as many other banking houses, passed from father to sons over the generations. The Rothschilds, the Schiffs, and other banking families were truly a part of hereditary paper aristocracy to which Brotherhood revolutionaries had given a great deal of power when they established the inflatable paper money system and its attendant central banks. Many historians writing about the Rothschild family focus on the fact that Mayor Emschel was Jewish. The Rothschilds have been important supporters of Jewish causes throughout the family's history. Less frequently mentioned is the fact that the Rothschilds were also associated with German Freemasonry. This association apparently began with Mayor Amschel, who accompanied William on several trips to the Masonic lodges. Whether or not Mayor actually became a member is uncertain. It is known that his son Solomon, founder of the Rothschild Bank in Vienna, had become a Freemason, according to Jacob Katz, writing in his book Jews and Freemasonry in Europe, 1723 to 1939, the Rothschilds were one of the rich and powerful Frankfurt families appearing on a Masonic membership list in 1811. The Scottish degrees used in the German lodges were Christian in nature. This created problems for Jewish men like Rothschild who may have wanted to participate. To solve the dilemma, efforts were made in, in Jewish communities to change certain rituals in order to make Freemasonry acceptable to Jews. Special Jewish lodges were created, such as the Michelzedek Lodges, named in honor of the Old Testament priest king, whose importance we discussed in earlier chapters. Those who belonged to the Melchizedek Lodges were said to be members of the Order of Melchizedek. This was an extremely interesting development for across the Atlantic Ocean. The name of Melchizedek was about to be resurrected on the American continent during what some people believe to have been a series of significant UFO episodes. Those episodes gave the world a new religion. That new religion was the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, better known as the Mormon Church. Da, 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 da. Yeah. Well, that's the end of chapter 29 there. And uh, the next chapter is chapter 30, Master Smith and the Angel. Boy, this is, uh, this is going to be some good stuff. Let me see how long this chapter is. Yeah, it's pretty long. Uh, we're going to leave it there tonight because uh, I have a feeling, you know, if there's, if, 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 if the news continues to just focus on all this Osama craziness and uh, we don't have a lot of news, I still want to be able to get up here and uh, do a show. So next time on the broadcast, we'll pick up Chapter 30, Master Smith and the Angel. And, uh, boy, good reading, good stuff there tonight. Man, oh, man, oh, man. Well, the plot just continues to thicken. And, I, you know, I, I really have enjoyed reading this book and still am continuing to, to enjoy reading this book because, uh, um, again, you know, uh, not a lot of this stuff is stuff that most of us didn't already know. And that's not the point. The point of the matter is, is that uh, this is a lot of stuff now that going through it and reading it, especially now with everything that's happening and all the new stuff we found out about the Council for National Policy and the Jesuit Order and the priest class stuff and, and really the phony patriot stuff. You really see now why this information has been left out of the bigger picture because, again, it fingers the people that uh, these guys are working for and the guys that they're controlled by. So it really has been um, a, a real good addition to, to me, at least I, I think personally for me and my knowledge, and uh, continues to do so. So glad you all could be with us here and uh, enjoyed reading with you tonight. GlobalRealityShow at gmail.com is my email address. Please uh, donate support to our work if you can. The chipping banner's there. Uh, we need all the support we can get right now, folks, I tell you. And uh, just send all your uh, healing energy and good, uh, good positive energy the way of my dad, Bar Reeves. He's... He's not doing too good right now, and, uh, you know, he's not that old of a guy either, you know. Mid-50s, it's just, I'm 34, my sister's 23, my brother's, you know, 27. It's just, you know, we're, we're kind of young to lose our dad. So 
any healing energies you might want to send our way would be greatly appreciated. But uh, donate and support our work if you can. The donate button's there. If you want to donate larger amounts to help us buy new equipment, cameras, and computers, um, just thanks to everybody out there who uh, who continues to donate and keep us alive, man. I love you guys so much. You guys have a great night. We'll see you tomorrow for the show. Take care. So here we go, Master Smith and the Angel. We have seen many instances in which religious agitation and revivalism were associated with the UFO phenomena. The Hebrew rebellions in Egypt under Moses, the Christian agitations under Jesus, the Islamic militancy under Muhammad, and the religious activism during the UFO played years of the Black Death. In the early 20th century, a particularly interesting bout of intense religious fervor overcome, uh, overtook some of the communities in British Wales. This incident is known as the Welsh Revival, 1904 to 1905, in which a preacher driven by inner voices electrified the countryside with his sermons. People were reporting all manner of unusual phenomenon during the revival years, including bright moving lights in the sky that we would today label UFOs. For example, we read the following personal eyewitness accounts gathered by the Society for Psychical Research and published in the findings in, in, in proceedings in 1905. Wasn't well, that interesting? So they published the findings of these eyewitness accounts in the in the uh, Society for Psychical Research. Well, that was the that was the group that was uh, out of Cambridge that was doing the same. They were involved in the, going back to the days of John D. And they were involved in uh, that was the group that discredited uh, Blavatsky took all of her work and then shipped it off to America and set up American theosophy that was a bastardized version of what Blavatsky had originally created. That's a fact. So much disinfo goes around the patriot movement and the truth movement about Blavatsky, it's ridiculous. All lies. First of all, my intention was drawn to it by a person in the crowd, and I looked and saw a block of fire as it was rising from the mountainside and it followed along the mountainside for about two to 300 yards before it gradually rose to heaven. Then a star, as it were, shot out to meet me, and they clapped together and formed a ball of fire. It also grew brighter as it rose higher, and then it seemed to sway about a lot. Then it seemed to form into something like the helm of a ship. The size of it at this time would be about the size of the moon, but very much brighter and lasted about a quarter of an hour. The star appeared like a ball of fire in the sky, glittering and sparkling as it went up. It seemed to be bubbling over. This continued for about 20 minutes. Firstly, there appeared in the heavens a very large and bright ball of fire. It was a much more brilliant luster than an ordinary star, very much the color of a piece of iron white heated. It had two brilliant arms which protruded towards the earth. Between these arms, there appeared a further light or lights resembling a cluster of stars, which seemed to be quivering with varying brightness. It lasted for 10 minutes or more. It is interesting that in some regions of Wales, the lights arrived at the very same time as the revival. The proceedings report, in reply to questions about his experiences, Mr. M. stated that he had never seen such lights before the revival, nor had he heard of others seeing them. The lights were seen high up in the sky where no houses or anything else could lead us to make any mistake. They were seen both on very dark nights and also when the moon and stars were visible. The lights were seen at least once near a chapel and also leaving an area where a prominent preacher lived, thereby hinting at a direct UFO involvement with some of the people who were responsible for the revival. 
We happened to reach Landfair at about 9.15 p.m. It was a rather dark and damp evening. It nearing the chapel, which can be seen from a distance, we saw balls of light, deep red, ascending from one side of the chapel, the side which is in a field. There was nothing in this field to cause this phenomenon, no houses, etc. After that, we walked to and from the main road for nearly two hours without seeing any light except from a distance in the direction of Landbetter. Of Landbetter. This time it appeared brilliant, ascending high into the sky from amongst the trees where lives the well-known Reverend C.E. The distance between us and the light which appeared this time was about a mile. Then about 11 o'clock when the service which Mrs. Jones conducted was brought to a close, two balls of light ascended from the same place and of a similar appearance to those we saw first. In a few minutes afterwards, Mrs. Jones was passing us home in her carriage, and in a few seconds after she passed on the main road and within a yard of us, there appeared a brilliant light twice tinged with blue. In two or three seconds after this disappeared on our right-hand side, within 150 or 200 yards, uh, yards there appeared twice, very huge balls of similar appearance as that which appeared on the road. It was so brilliant and powerful this time that we were dazed for a second or two, and then they, they, then they immediately there appeared a brilliant light ascending from the woods where the Reverend C.E. lives. It appeared twice this time. On the other side of the main road close by, there appeared ascending from a field high into the sky, three balls of light, deep red. Two of these appeared to split up whilst the middle one remained unchanged. Then we left for home, having been watching these last phenomena for a quarter of an hour. Included among the Welsh aerial phenomena were music and sound effects coming out of the sky. It seems that the sound effects were designed to more formally implant the revivalist message in people by making them believe that they were witnessing visitations from heaven. E.B. on Wednesday previous heard that about 4 o'clock what appeared to him to be a thunderclap followed by a lovely singing in the air. E.E. on Saturday evening between 7 and 8 while returning home from his work heard some strange music similar to the vibration caused by telegraph wires, only much louder. On an eminence, the hill being far away from trees and wires of any kind, it was more or less a still evening. It is interesting that these UFO phenomena were debunked in 1905 in an identical way that modern UFOs are debunked today, revealing that debunking is by no means a late 20th century phenomenon. Well, that's an interesting take that, that you know, the debunkers had been around forever. Priest-class bozos, most of them. Oh, well, that's just the devil. One investigator in his report of February 21st, 1905, dismissed all of the Welsh phenomenon as farm lanterns, marsh gas, the planet Venus, and fantasies of overwrought brains. They do the same thing today. That's unbelievable. That's 1905, and today, oh, it's Chinese lanterns and swamp gas and Venus. Yeah, that's what it is. They haven't even changed their fucking uh, playbook of debunking since 1905, guys. My God. Farm lanterns and marsh gas? How was that? I mean, I, I saw a UFO report recently. Oh, it was, it was Chinese lanterns. Yeah, Chinese lanterns. That's what it was. And swamp gas. They've been using swamp gas forever. They need to get some new material. God damn. Can't you guys come up with anything better than that? Such explanations were no more helpful in 1905 than they are today in shedding light on some genuinely remarkable phenomenon. Fucking swamp gas. Ah, uh, then they love they love swamp gas. Oh, swamp gas, swamp gas, yeah. Swamp gas causes everything. Crazy shit that is. You know, swamp gas is so powerful. Why don't we bottle that shit up and use it in our cars? I mean, that sounds like some killer shit. I'd like to huff some swamp gas. Maybe I'll see some UFOs. I mean, my God, it sounds like good shit. The Wells revival was not an isolated incident. It followed a similar occurrence in New York State almost a century earlier. The events in New York included a vision leading to the founding of the Mormon church by a teenage youth named Joseph Smith. His story is worth looking at. Joseph Smith described it as a beautiful, clear day in the spring of 1820. Master Joseph was 14 or 15 years of age, and his mind was in a state of confusion. In his hometown of Manchester, New York, intense quarreling had broken out between various Christian sects, all of which were vying for members. 
To sort out the controversies in his mind, Joseph climbed a lonely hill near his home, prayed aloud, and hoped that God would answer him. What happened next was probably more than he had bargained for. Immediately I was seized upon by some power which entirely overcame me and had such an astonishing influence over me as to bind my tongue so that I could not speak. Thick darkness gathered around me, and it seemed to me for a time as if I were doomed to sudden destruction. Just as Joseph was about to give into despair, he saw a pillar of light exactly over my head above the brightness of the sun, which descended gradually until it fell upon me. It no sooner appeared than I found myself delivered from the enemy, which held me bound. When the light rested upon me, I saw two person personages whose brightness and glory defy all description, standing above me in the air. One of them spoke unto me, calling me by name, and said, pointing to the other, This is my beloved son. Hear him. Joseph Smith, 216-17. So began a series of appearances by an angel whose reported dictates and pronouncements are the foundation of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, also known as the Mormon Church. This church is without a doubt an important institution. Its membership in 1985 totaled approximately 5.8 million people, and the church has extensive business and land holdings. Beginning with a teenage boy on a hill in New York State, the church has grown to influence the lives of many people. Joseph's vision on the hill was the first of several visits that he would receive from his angel friend. The second visit occurred three and a half years after the first. Joseph Smith had just gone to bed and was in the act of praying when I discovered a light appearing in my room, which continued to increase until the room was lighter than at noonday when immediately a personage appeared at my bedside, standing in the air, for his feet did not touch the floor. He had on a loose robe of most exquisite whiteness beyond anything earthly, earthly I had ever seen. Yeah, there's the etherical temp, temple robe again uh, that uh, William Henry and I talked about on the show we did. Nor do I believe that any earthly thing could, make, uh, could be made to appear so exceedingly white and brilliant. White beings. Wearing etherical gar garment robes. Hmm. The figure in Joseph's room had naked hands, wrists, feet, and ankles. It also had a bare head, neck, and exposed chest. The figure introduced itself as Moroni, the angel of a man who had lived centuries earlier. The resurrected Moroni imparted a message to Joseph consisting of quotes from final judgment prophecies in the Old Testament. Moroni stated that the prophecies were about to be fulfilled. Moroni also informed Joseph, Joseph about the existence of ancient metal plates which contained some of the history of the early North American continent. Joseph was told that he must later dig up the plates, have them translated, and present the translation to the world. After this message, the image of Moroni vanished in a unique way. I saw the light in the room began to gather immediately around the person of him who had been speaking to me, and it continued to do so until the room was again left dark, except just around him when instantly I saw, as it were, a conduit open right up into heaven, and he ascended until he entirely disappeared. So a fucking light opened up. They just, you know, beamed him up, Scotty. Just, you know, he just went right back up in the ship. I mean, it's obviously... Obviously, the story of an encounter with an extraterrestrial or, or some sort of, you know, again, uh, I think this is a, a, another example of another one of these. Uh, it seems that these custodians, to me, had a, a they would they they had an extinct a, a, a knowledge of who was who in the bloodlines, starting from going back to the very beginning of when the genetic manipulation took place, all the way into the days of. Joseph Smith, and I'm sure after that, and in, into the modern day. Because it seems that, that certain people within the bloodlines have these experiences with these custodial extraterrestrials that know they are of these bloodlines, and these are the ones that they put in charge of creating these new religions where this individual person is deified as a god, when in fact they're just... Um, 
you know, an extraterrestrial that's trying to enslave somebody. I mean, that's absolutely what it is. Joseph did not have long to ponder the curious phenomenon. The mysterious light and visitors soon re-entered his room. Of this second visit that night, Joseph relates, the angel commenced and again related the very same things which he had done at his first visit without the least variation, which having done, he informed me of great judgments which were coming upon the earth with great desolations by famine, sword, and pestilence, and that these grievous judgments would come on the earth in Joseph Smith's generation. Having related these things, he again ascended as he had done before. The apparition in Joseph's bedroom came and went repeatedly the full night. On the following night, on the following day, rather, while he was out in the field, the exhausted young smith abruptly lost his strength while trying to climb a fence, and he fell unconscious to the ground. Upon regaining awareness, Joseph observed above him the same angel repeating the same message. A new postscript had been added, however. The angel in just instructed Joseph Smith to, help, to tell his father of the visions. Some critics dispute the accuracy of Joseph Smith's stories, pointing out that Smith did not record his first vision on paper, paper until 19 years after it had happened. Under the circumstances of the time, this delay is understandable when we consider Joseph's youth and minimal education. To the degree Smith's accounts are accurate, they are worth looking at. Did he have a true religious vision as his followers believe, or was he, as others suggest, a victim of UFO tampering? Joseph's angel, Moroni, was different than the angels described by Ezekiel and John in the Bible. Smith's angel did not wear items that could be interpreted as a helmet and boots. Moroni was a figure in a true robe. However, Joseph appears to have been looking at a recorded image projected through the window into his room. The clue to this lies in Joseph's words that Moroni had repeated the second message without the least variation. Oh, so they shot a beam down and just, you know, sent a fucking hologram in there. That's probably what a lot of this stuff was. You know, they could make these gods appear to whoever they wanted to and use holographic technology and beam it into somebody's room and, you know, command them to set up this new religion with this hologram as the god. I mean, my goodness. <laughs> See, this is the thing, you know, I've talked about this many times, and I find this, this more and more, you know, we, we, our technology, as we progress with technology, the context for what these ancient things say becomes more apparent to us. And I think that's really been why they've been after the antiquities, because they know that now that we all have a reference point for technology, if we start getting our hands on some of what these ancient texts, these ancient tablets, Sumerian uh, clay cylinder seals and all this stuff say, we may actually glean a context for things that these folks in no way, shape, or form are ready for us to know about quite yet, even though in many cases we do know quite a bit more than they want us to do anyway because of <coughs> logical deduction and con connecting the dots and everything else. So it says it. Um, this suggests a recorded message, the manner in which Moroni Disappeared indicates a projected light image from a source in the sky outside the house. When Moroni returned from a third time that same night, Smith heard him rehearse or repeat over again the same things as before. If Smith's account is accurate and UFO related, there would be tremendous humor in it. Today, we can go to Disneyland and marvel at remarkable lifelike projected images of talking heads in the haunted house ride. A similar projection viewed by a young country bumpkin in the 19th century would no doubt be considered nothing less than a true vision from God. Certainly, young Smith's narrative resembles earlier custodial encounters. In many respects, a bright light descends from the sky, followed by the appearance of angels. Joseph's testimony that he felt seized and unable to move is identical to several modern UFO close encounters in which eyewitnesses report being immobilized, especially before an abduction. Other Mormon writings also tend to support the likelihood that Joseph Smith had a UFO encounter. The Mormon doctrines revealed, revealed by Smith state that there are many inhabited planets in the universe. This was quite a daring idea for an uneducated man of the 19th century. Smith added that God inhabits a human flesh and bones body and that God lives near a star called Kolob, 
In other words, God is a human-like extraterrestrial living on another planet. What we seem to clearly have in Joseph Smith's experience is another appearance of our custodial friends pretending that they are God and meddling in human affairs by implanting yet another apocalyptic religion on earth. Bingo, 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 bingo. Bingo, that's the key. Harsh criticism is often aimed at the Bible of Smith's religion, the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon is said to be a translation of the ancient metal plates that, the, that Smith had dug up at the command of his angel. The stories contained in the Book of Mormon are remarkable and, to many, unbelievable. The Book of Mormon is written in a style of prose resembling the Old Testament. It ties the history of ancient North America to the history described in the Old Testament. According to Mormon, people from Palestine were transported in saucer-like submarines to the Americas under the guidance of God in the year 600 B.C. God was sending them to the New World largely because of the Tower of Babel incident. Somewhere in the Americas, perhaps Mexico or Central America, the refugees built magnificent cities rivaling those of the Old World. They fought wars and were obedient to the same gods and angels that were worshipped in the Middle East. The Book of Mormon tells of regular visits by angels and of their deep involvement in the affairs of ancient America. The angels encourage their human servants to practice important virtues, the foremost being, of course, obedience. The Book of Mormon tells us that many other remarkable events took place in ancient America as time went by. In the first century A.D., Jesus Christ reportedly made an appearance in the Americas immediately following his crucifixion in the other side of the world. The Christ vision described in Mormon is complete with glorious rays of light in the sky from which Jesus emerged. Although many scholars like the Old Testament uh, take the Old Testament seriously as a, a historical record, little such deference is given the Book of Mormon. Mormon stories seem so outrageous, and the manner in which Joseph Smith repeatedly obtained and translated the plates appears so suspect that scant academic heed is paid to them at all. The question is, should the Book of Mormon be dismissed out of hand? In truth, the Book of Mormon may, may well be one of the most significant historical records to come out of the custodial religions. Aha, this is why they don't like people talking about it. Based upon all that we have already studied in this book, the history of ancient America as told in Mormon is precisely, precisely the type of history that we would expect. Earth is small. We would anticipate that an ancient astronaut, i.e. the custodial race, would rule human society in the same fashion everywhere on every continent. We would expect them to exhibit the same brutality and to promote identical religious fictions. The dates extrapolated from the Book of Mormon for the arrival of the Palestinians to America are especially interesting because they coincide with the dates that historians have assigned to the emergence of the ancient civilizations of Mexico and Central America. The Book of Mormon might therefore explain why those civilizations abruptly rose in North and Central America so long after sim similar civilizations had already come and gone on the opposite side of the world. This still leaves a puzzle unsolved. If Mormon is at least partially true, where are the ruins of the cities it names? Many magnificent American ruins have been found, of course, but not all of the key cities identified in the Book of Mormon Mormon offers a chilling answer. Some were utterly destroyed by God in a frightening cataclysm. Maybe that's what the rock wall is. Maybe it's one of these ancient cities that Mormonism described. Maybe that's why they want to bury it so bad. As elsewhere, it was very difficult for humans in ancient America to please their custodial masters. The Book of Mormon tells us that some ancient Americans did an especially poor job of it. As a result, a massive punishment was inflicted upon a large American region reportedly around the year of 34 A.D., co coinciding with the crucifixion of Jesus on the other side of the world. The Mormon account of this American cataclysm is extraordinary. It accurately describes a nuclear holocaust. 
in the 30 and fourth year, in the first month, on the fourth day of the month, there arose a great storm. Such a one has never been known in all the land. There was also a great and terrible tempest, a violent wind, and there was terrible thunder, insomuch that it did shake the whole earth as if it was about to divide asunder. And there were exceedingly sharp lightnings, such as never had been known in all the land. And the city of Zaramella did take fire. Zaramella. Let me type, uh, <coughs> give me just a second here. Zara Mella. Let's see what that is. Zara Mella is the name of a prominent land, a capital city, and a leader in the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon is revered by members of the Latter-day Saints. Um, some LDS speculate the name Zaramella is a compound biblical Hebrew name, meaning seed of compassion. Um, well, that's a very interesting uh, idea here of that. Some Mormon writers identify the Lamanites as the Mayans. So this had something to do with the, the Lamanites. Hmm. Trying to see where it says where they, um, oh, it's just fascinating stuff. Let's continue on here with the reading. I was just trying to get a context for you what that word means, but I'll do some research on it later. And the city of Moroni did sink into the depths of the sea, and inhabitants thereof were drowned. And the earth was carried up upon the city of Morana, Morana in the place in the city that became the great mountain, and there was a great and terrible distraction in the land southward. Uh, but the whole there was no more great and terrible destruction in the land northward. For behold, the whole face of the land was changed because of the tempest and the whirlwinds and the thunderings and the lightnings and the exceeding great quaking of the whole earth. As the highways were broken up and the level roads were spoiled and many smooth places became rough. And many great and notable cities were sunk and many burned and many were shaken till the buildings thereof had fallen into the earth. And the inhabitants, therefore, were slain, and the places were left desolate. And there were some cities which remained, but the damage thereof was exceedingly great, and there were many of them who were slain. And there were some who were carried away in the whirlwind, and whether they went, where they went, no man knoweth, save they know that they were carried away. And thus the face of the whole earth became deformed, and because of the tempests and the thunderings and the lightnings and the quaking of the earth, and behold, the rocks were rent in twain, they were broken up upon the face of the whole earth, insomuch as they were found in broken fragments and in seams and in cracks upon all the face of the land. And it came to pass that when the thunderings and the lightnings and the storm and the tempest and the quakings of the earth did cease, for behold, they did last for about the space of three hours. And it was said by some that the time was greater. Nevertheless, all these great and terrible things were done in about the space of three hours, and then behold, there was a darkness upon the face of the land. And it came to pass that there was a, dick, a thick darkness upon all the face of the land, and so much as the inhabitants thereof had not fallen. I can't read any more of this. This is just horrible. It's uh, Nephi 8, 5, 23, Book of Mormon. It's just so such old, antiquated language. It just wears me out reading it. It's just not, it just says the same thing over and over again. Yeah, the, the earth was nuked, and the, 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 the fucking custodians wiped everybody and killed everybody. They've done it throughout history. I mean, they could be doing this right now. This could be what all these things that we think the New World Order are doing. It could be them doing it all over again. I don't know. The rumblings, flashes of lightning, rapid incineration of cities all within three hours, followed by three days of thick, heavy darkness, combined to accurately depict a nuclear strike, followed by the inevitable thick, lingering cloud of soot and debris. The above passage is especially remarkable when we remember that it was first published over a century ago long before nuclear weapons were developed by man. It gives ad added credence to the Mormon church's claim that Joseph Smith had not invented the Book of Mormon, as some critics have charged. It is highly unlikely that any person in Smith's day could have accidentally imagined an event so closely mirroring a nuclear holocaust. Some Mormons stress that the spiritual teachings found in Mormon text are more important than the historical information 
Mormon spiritual beliefs are indeed significant because they are quite forthright about custodial intentions. The basic spiritual beliefs of the Mormon church can be summarized as follows. Humans are immortal spiritual beings occupying human bodies. The spirit is the true source of the intelligence and personality, not the body. As spiritual beings, we existed before birth and will continue to exist after death. The true goal of life is to improve spiritually, and everyone can eventually achieve a rehabilitated spiritual state that mirrors the state of a supreme being. Ethics are an important step to achieving such a state. Everyone is endowed with free will. These beliefs sound like the teachings of a maverick religion. We can at once understand why so many people are drawn to Mormonism or remain devoted adherents. Members are told important truths. When we further read into Mormon works, however, we find that the above truths are given many fatal twists, which actually prevent people from ever attaining their spiritual salvation. Mormon texts state that people are actually immortal spiritual spirit bodies which inhabit human bodies. Spirit bodies are made of matter and look just like human bodies. Joseph Smith said that spirit is a substance, that it is material, but that it is more pure, elastic, and refined matter than the body. A supreme being or God is said to be a similar material being who inhabits a perfect and immortal flesh and bones body. The ultimate goal of Mormonism is to achieve the same state as God and dwell in a perfect, immortal human body for the rest of eternity, right? Yeah, you just need to progress your soul so that eventually you'll, you'll inhabit in a perfect human body and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, right. See, that's totally priest class. Stuff. Yeah, just keep coming back and reincarnating and, and just keep having better morals each time you come back and reincarnate. Eventually, you'll be in a godlike body and you'll be immortal. Yeah, eventually, once we get the... Uh, transhumanist stuff going. I mean, that's oh, I mean, totally set up by the people who are trying to keep our souls enslaved in these material bodies, folks. The ultimate goal of Mormonism is to achieve the same state as God and dwell in a perfect immortal human, human body for the rest of eternity. Mormon teachings, which are alleged to have come from ancient plates and the custodial angels, therefore encourage humans to welcome the grim fate of endless entrapment in human bodies. The Book of Mormon expresses that objective in this way, exactly what I just said. It encourages humans to welcome the grim fate of endless entrapment in human bodies. The spirit and the body shall be reunited again in its perfect form. Their spirits united with their bodies never to be divided. Ancient Mesopotamian texts told us that mankind's custodial gods wanted to permanently join spiritual beings to human bodies so that the custodians would have a slave race. Maverick religions have argued that a spirit's enmeshment in a human body is the primary cause of suffering. To counteract this maverick teaching and to promote custodial aims, Mormonism falsely declares that a spiritual being can only achieve ultimate happiness and godliness when it has been permanently joined to matter. For man is spirit. The elements are eternal and spirit and element inseparably connected receive a fullness of joy, and when separated, man cannot cease and, for, and receive a fullness of joy. Only where true spiritual understanding has been lost can such a teaching take hold as it has on a widespread scale on earth. Some Mormons stress that the spiritual teachings found in Mormon texts are, important, are more important than the historical information. Mormon spiritual beliefs are indeed significant because they are quite forthright about custodial intentions. Yeah, they come right out and say it. The basic spiritual beliefs of the Mormon church can be summarized as follows. Humans are immortal spiritual beings occupying human bodies. The spirit is the true source of intelligence and personality, not the body. As spiritual beings, we existed before birth and will continue to exist after death. The true goal of life is to improve spirituality, and everyone can eventually achieve a rehabilitated spiritual state that mirrors the state of a supreme being. Sounds oddly close to Scientology, doesn't it? And we've seen Scientology connections in the Council for National Policy with Beverly LaHaye, Tim LaHaye's wife, Phyllis Schlafly. Uh, they stirred up a bunch of stuff in, in California several years ago. It's been more than several years ago now. It's been 
over a decade, I guess, when this happened. It's been a while. I don't exactly know what year Freighter H, I mean, L. Ron Hubbard died, but uh, it was somewhere in the time, I think, when he was still, it was, I don't know if he was still alive or, anyway, the internet was still was around whenever this happened. I know that for a fact. So I don't know exactly how long ago this was. But there was a campaign to get uh, by Phil Schlafly and uh, uh, Beverly the Hay and a bunch of these CMP types to get the pro-evolution uh, teachings taken out of the public schools. And when they took out the pro-evolution teachings in, in these California schools, they replaced it with Scientology teachings from L. Ron Hubbard. So all these, you know, all these custodial religions, all these religions, they're all interconnected. Back to the mystery religions that spawned the priest class. These beliefs sound like the teachings of a maverick religion. We can at once understand why so many people are drawn to Mormonism and remain devoted adherents. Members are told important truths. When we read further into Mormon works, however, we find that the above truths are given many fatal twists which actually prevent people from ever attaining their spiritual salvation. Mormon texts state that people are actually immortal spirit bodies which inhabit human bodies. Spirit bodies are made of matter and look just like human bodies. Joseph Smith said that spirit is a substance that it is material, but that it is more pure, elastic, and refined matter than the body. A supreme being or God is said to be a similar material being who inhabits a perfect and immortal flesh and bones body. The ultimate goal of Mormonism is to achieve the same state of God and dwell in a perfect immortal human body for the rest of eternity. Mormon teachings, which are alleged to have come from ancient plates and custodial angels, therefore encourage humans to welcome the grim fate of endless entrapment in human bodies. The Book of Mormon expresses that objective this way. The spirit and the body shall be reunited again in its perfect form, their spirits united with their bodies never to be divided. That's soul entrapment, soul enslavement right there, folks. Ancient Mesopotamian texts told us that mankind's custodial gods wanted to permanently join spiritual beings to human bodies so that the custodians would have a slave race. Maverick religions have argued that a spirit's enmeshment in a human body is the primary cause of suffering. To counteract this maverick teaching and to promote custodial aims, Mormonism falsely declares that a spiritual being can only achieve ultimate happiness and godliness when it has been permanently joined to matter. Again, false teaching. Only where true spiritual understanding has been lost can such a teaching take hold, as it has on a widespread scale on earth. Mormonism teaches that everyone lived with the Heavenly Father, God, before coming to earth as a part of God's grand plan. People are sent to earth in order to learn right from wrong and to demonstrate to God that they prefer doing good over evil. However, something is done to all spiritual beings who are sent to earth. They are induced with amnesia about their pre-birth existences, according to a pamphlet published by the Mormon Church. Though we might sometimes sense imitations of our pre-mortal existence, as through a glass darkly, it would be effectively blocked from our memory. That is a remarkable claim. For it suggests that the memory of pure spiritual existence is in some way deliberately blocked from human memories by the custodial society as a part of its ever to weld spiritual beings to human bodies. The custodial society does seem, does seem to have effective methods for occluding memory, as demonstrated in modern UFO abduction cases, where human victims are apparently caused to suffer almost complete amnesia regarding their abduction experiences. The forced amnesia described in Mormon, the Book of Mormon, had several purported purposes, one of which was, quote, to ensure that our choice of good or evil would reflect our earthly desires and will rather than the remembered influence 
of our all good heavenly father, meaning they, 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 they want to block out any positive influence. This is also an astonishing admission. <coughs> Excuse me. This is also an astonishing admission. It alleges that spiritual memory is dimmed so that people will base their actions on their concerns as material beings rather than upon their knowledge and remembrance of spiritual existence. This can only hamper the ability of individuals to attain a high level of ethics because true ethics must ultimately take into account a person's spiritual nature when confronted with an ethical dilemma. By reducing all questions of ethics to strictly earthly concerns, people are prevented from fully resolving those ethical questions that will start them on the road to full spiritual recovery. This restriction is precisely what the custodians wanted as revealed in the Old Testament. God did not want Adam and Eve to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil because it would lead to knowledge of how to regain spiritual immortality. The above passage further suggests that there exists a custodial intention to block human remembrance of a supreme being. The implication is that people not only have buried memories of prior spiritual existence, but they also hold hidden recollections of contact with a supreme being. If such memory exists, we can at once understand why the custodians would try to veil it. By blocking such memory, the custodial society further deepens spiritual ignorance and is better able to promote its religious pretenses and fictions. This is not to say that the custodial society would alone be guilty of causing spiritual deterioration and amnesia. Such deterioration would have probably begun long before the formation of the custodial civilization. Mormon writings would only suggest that custodians took advantage of such deterioration and hastened it to suit their own ends. We have noted the use of breeding war as a custodial tool for maintaining control over the human population. According to the Book of Mormon, this tool was used in the ancient American civilizations where God was held responsible for the outbreak of many wars. The Book of Mormon states that wars would continue to be bred over the generations as God's tool for maintaining control. In light of this, it is not surprising to discover that Mormonism is another branch of the Brotherhood Network, even though the Mormon Church was traditionally and has traditionally been opposed to other secret societies such as Freemasonry. Yeah, even though it was started as a front to practice Freemasonry, that's the bullshit of it. Mormon opposition to Freemasonry is based upon passages in the Book of Mormon which seem to suggest that God opposes secret societies. For example, we read in 2 Nephi 26, 22, 23, and there are also secret combinations, even as in times of old, according to the combinations of the devil, for he is the foundation of all these things. Well, don't forget that what they called Ea or Enki, when he set up the first secret society, the Brotherhood of the Snake, the Brotherhood of the Serpent, after they banished him to reincarnate in fragile human bodies all over again, and that's, that's what we know as messianic figures like Jesus and Quetzalcoatl and Buddha and all this stuff. One of the things that they did was they, they um, because he had set up the original secret society to teach mankind in secret who we are, what we are, where we came from, what our destiny is, what our true possibilities are, what we're, you know, what we can really do. The secrets of things that the custodians have kept from us, he wanted to teach us in secret. So what they did was, they put out this thing to the public that secret societies and things done, done in secret are bad so that that would become the widely held belief and the widely held um, moralistic attitude. And then called Ea, who was trying to set mankind free, they called him the devil and the prince of darkness. That's where, that's where the term the prince of darkness comes from. And they created this, this ingrained belief in people that anything that presented itself as Ea was was the devil. That's how they did it. So they could keep the, the secret societies to themselves. You see, you see where I'm going with this? They wanted the opinions of the secret societies to be, that's why they do all this stuff now. That's why you see these priest class bozos like, you know, Schnoblin and uh, Monteith and the rest of these guys. 
you know, who get up there and tell you, see, Freemasonry is satanic devil worship. They worship devil, the devil, and they drink blood, and you just don't find any evidence of that. But that's why they do it. Because they want the widely held belief that these secret societies are evil and, and this stuff, and they don't want average everyday people seeking this information out. So they, you know, they said E.I. is the devil, and he's the prince of darkness, and anything associated with him is, is the devil's work. So that they could have their own secret societies and do things in secret, and meanwhile hijack the knowledge that was supposed to be used for the betterment of mankind and the unenslavement of mankind. And then they turned that around and said secret societies are evil, um, and then they took all the knowledge and started their own secret societies and then you know, still told everybody they were bad and put out this lie about it. And that's it's maintained pretty much to the modern day, folks. They still do that. They want us to believe that all the secret societies and the secret information is all evil devil worship stuff so that we don't look into it for ourselves and find out what it is once and for our, all for ourselves. We just believe them, right? We just take their word for it. Since when have you, has taking their word on anything been the wise move? Many people object to interpreting the above passage as being directed against societies like Freemasonry. After all, did not Joseph Smith himself create a multi-leveled priesthood pattern after Freemasonry, complete with secret ceremonies and a ceremonial apron? The Mormon priesthood is divided into two sections. The priesthood of Aaron, named after Moses' brother, and the high priesthood, better known as the priesthood of Melchizedek, named after the biblical king Melchizedek. According to Alma 13.1.14, the Mormon high priesthood is precisely the same one over which the Melchizedek had reigned many centuries earlier. The Mormon priesthood today continues to follow the step-by-step -step initiation process of other brotherhood organizations. Its highest ceremonies are performed in secret, and initiates are required to take vows of silence. During such ceremonies, initiates often wear ceremonial aprons as various mysteries are revealed to them through the use of symbols and allegory. Joseph Smith claimed that he patterned the Mormon priesthood according to the dictates of an angel. He did not rely entirely on his extraterrestrial friend, however. Smith also became a Freemason for a short period of time in order to borrow from the craft, according to Thomas F. O'Day, writing in his book, The Mormons. Joseph went to masonry to borrow many elements of ceremony. These he reformed, explaining to his followers that the Masonic ritual was a corrupted form of an ancient priesthood ceremonial that was now being restored. Yeah, it was actually the other way around. It wasn't a corruption of an ancient priesthood ceremony, ceremony that was being restored. It was an ancient priesthood ceremony. It was just incorporating into something else, but to still have the same effect to lie to people about spiritual, not spiritual knowledge and give them corrupted information on true spiritual knowledge so that they don't understand what we are, that we are actually spirits in the material world trapped in these five-sense, three-dimensional bodies. Joseph Smith was made a Master Mason on March 16, 1842, at a lodge in Illinois. That same lodge was joined by other top Mormons, Perhaps the most famous Mormon Freemason was Brigham Young, the man who led the Mormon exodus across America to Utah and established the headquarters of the church in that state where it remains today. The above facts do not mean that Mormonism was a branch of Freemasonry. Well, it certainly was. It was an extension of it. It was a way to do it in secret. It was set up by the same people. Come on. Organizational ties between the Mormon church and Freemasonry were severed quite early on, Smith and the early Mormons went to Freemasonry to borrow, not to truly join. The Mormon church was but another faction at war with older brotherhood factions. The Mormons were told that their religion was the only true and living church upon the face of the whole earth, with which I, the Lord, am well pleased. This proclamation naturally con conflicts with every other custodial religion which declares the same thing, thereby setting in motion more senseless religions and more senseless religious disputes to keep people fighting and disunited. Some people are still fighting the Mormons now. Joseph Smith suffered for it when he was murdered by an angry mob in 1844. Throughout the church's embattled history, Mormons have found solace in the future judgment day promised by Smith's angel. Smith's writings clearly indicated that the judgment day was to arrive during his own generation. 
Perhaps the predicted great conflagration did arrive. The American Civil War broke out in, in 1861, and many of Smith's personal followers were still alive to witness that brutal conflict, which must have seemed like an Armageddon to many Americans. As always, the promised millennium of peace and spiritual salvation did not follow that Armageddon, so Mormons did what so many other apocalyptic religions have done. They reinterpreted their Judgment Day prophecy to keep it alive, even though it had clearly failed. One great project of the Mormon Church today is the maintenance of a vast genealogical record library, the world's largest. Genealogy is the study of a family lineage and ancestry. It tells who gave birth to whom, as well as the racial and social characteristics of a person's family tree. The Mormon genealogical vaults are housed in a mountain in the Rocky Mountains about 20 miles south of Salt Lake City. The vaults are protected by a 700-foot thick mountain granite and a 14-ton steel door. The library is clearly meant to survive almost anything. According to a Mormon pamphlet, ongoing record collection produces more than 60,000 rolls of microfilm each year containing data from deeds, marriage license, family Bibles, registers, cemetery lists, and other sources. This remarkable activity began during the first half of the 20th century. It is ostensibly carried out because Mormons believe that families go on forever. Mormons are taught that they need to trace family lines so that all those who lived and died in the past can be blessed in ceremonies performed in the present by modern Mormons. Yeah, baptisms of the dead. The Mormons, however, do not limit their genealogical research to just Mormon families. Their goal is to perform the necessary genealogical research so that all those who now or ever in the spirit world can be vicariously baptized. See, I have a big problem with that. Doing these baptism of the dead and baptizing you into, into Mormonism after you're dead, I have a problem with that. Since every human being who has ever lived fits the above category, we must conclude that the Mormon objective is a complete genealogical record of the entire human race. According to the Mormon church, that is precisely the goal of the project to the degree that it can be accomplished. The activity understandably concerns many people. Many individuals living today witness the racial madness of the German Nazis and might shudder at the devastating impact that the Mormon genealogical collection could have in the hands of racists. This unease is increased by early Mormon doctrines which had placed dark-skinned people in a greatly inferior position to whites. Arianism was an important element of early Mormon philosophy. That's why you see all these, you know, white supremacist guys running around that are Mormons in the Patriot Movement, the Truth Movement now. My goodness, Joel, Joel Skousen and all those clowns. Bo Grites and, I mean, it's just they're everywhere. In 2 Nephi 5.21.24, we read that the dark skin was created by God as a punishment for sin. Much to their credit, Mormons have recently dropped these racist beliefs and now admit black people to, to the priesthood. Mormons must nevertheless be alert to ensuring that their genealogical records are never permitted to fall into the hands of those who might desire them for racial purification purposes. Modern Mormon activities do not exhibit many humanitarian leanings. The church, well, yeah, I mean, they got big pentagrams on the doors of that fucking church up there. Literally, there's big, big pentagrams on the front door. How do you explain that? The church, for example, encourages strong family units. In 1982, I was gratified to see a television advertisement produced by the Mormon church that expresses the importance of not ign ignoring a child's accomplishments. This brings up a very important point. No individual organ or organization is purely good or purely bad. In our crazy universe, absolute good and absolute evil just do not appear to exist. In the worst of people, one will always find a tiny ember of good, e.g. the uh, psychopathic Adolf Hitler was always kind to children. And in the best of individuals, there was always at least one thing that should change. The majority of people who join a group or follow a leader do so for the right reasons. They have heard an element 
of truth or they seek the solution to a genuine problem. The real trick in judging a person or group is to determine whether more good is being done than bad and how the bad may be corrected without destroying whatever good there might be. The task is not usually an easy one. Mormon writings declare that God, i.e. Earth's custodial management, intends to eventually eliminate the spirit world entirely as a part of God's great utopian plan for mankind. In other words, nothing but the material universe is to ever exist as far as the people of Earth are ever concerned. This can be translated to mean total spiritual entrapment in physical matter. Amen, that's exactly what it's saying. All my research for years, is we've been talking about this for years on the show. Such intentions would require that philosophies of strict materialism be created and imposed upon the human race so that humans do not look beyond the material universe. Such philosophies would teach that there is no spiritual reality and that all life thought, and creation arise solely out of physical processes. Such ideas have become very fashionable, and they are sadly helping to push the human race into an ever-deepening spiritual sleep. Leading this trend for many years was a political philosophy which had gained its initial momentum in 19th century Germany. I am speaking, of course, of communism that ever-so-curious mix of apocalypticism, materialism, and Protestant work ethic, which was such a significant force in the 20th century. So that's the end of chapter 30 there in William Brown was the Gods of Eden. The next chapter is chapter 31, the Apocalypse of Marx, as in Karl Marx. Um, I like that segue there of segueing into, the, you know, the idea of, uh, well, I'm sure we'll talk about it when we get to the next chapter, but, you know, shutting people off to spiritual reality. I mean, it's a big part of, you know, that's been a big part of their master plan. That's what the creation of the priest class and the whole, the whole structure has been about since day one. So oh, chapter 32, funny money goes international for you here tonight. In his book, Tragedy and Hope, Dr. Quigley divides the history of capitalism into several stages. The third stage, which is described as the period from 1850 until 1931, is defined by Dr. Quigley as the stage of financial capitalism. Dr. Quigley states, This third stage of capitalism is of such overwhelming significance in the history of the 20th century, and its ramifications and influences have been so subterranean and even occult that we may be excused if we devote considerable attention to its organizations and methods. Essentially what it did was to take the old disorganized and localized methods of handling money and credit and organize them into an integrated system on an international basis, which worked with incredible and well-oiled faculty for many years. Dr. Quigley described the overall intent of the new integrated system. The powers of financial capitalism had another far-reaching aim, nothing less than to create a world system of financial control in private hands able to dominate the political system of each country and the economy of the world as a whole. This system was to be controlled in a feudalist fashion by the central banks of the world acting in concert by secret agreements arrived at in frequent private meetings and conferences. The apex of this system was to be the Bank for International Settlements in Basel, Switzerland, a private bank owned and controlled by the world central banks, which were themselves private corporations. Each central bank sought to manipulate foreign exchanges to influence the level of economic activity in the country and to influence cooperative politicians by subsequent economic rewards in the business world. In the English-speaking world, the newly organized central banks exerted significant political influence through an organization they supported known as the Round Table. The Round Table was a think tank designed to affect the foreign policy actions of governments. The Round Table was founded by an Englishman named Cecil Rhodes. 
Rhodes had created a vast diamond and gold mining operation in South Africa and in two African nations named after him. Northern and Southern Rhodesia, today Zambia and Zimbabwe, respectively. Rhodes, who was educated at Oxford, did the most of any Englishman to exploit the mineral resources of Africa and to make the Southern African continent a vital part of the British Empire. Rhodes was more than a man driven to make personal fortune. He was very concerned with the world and where it was headed, especially in regard to welfare, uh, warfare, rather. I don't know why I saw that as welfare. I saw it as actually warfare. So he was very concerned with the world and where it was headed, especially in regards to warfare. Although he lived almost a century ago, he envisioned a day when weapons of great destruction could destroy human civilization. His farsightedness inspired him to channel his considerable talents and personal fortune into building a world political system under which it would be impossible for a war of such magnitude to occur. Rhodes intended to create a one-world government led by Britain. The world government would be strong enough to stamp out any hostile actions by any group of people. Rhodes also wanted to unify people by making English the universal language. He sought to diminish nationalism and to increase awareness among people that were part of a larger human community. It was with these goals in the mind that Rhodes established the Round Table. In his last will, Rhodes also created the famous Rhodes Scholarship, a program still in operation today. The Rhodes Scholarship program is designed to promote feelings of universal citizenship based upon Anglo-Saxon traditions. Rhodes' heart was clearly on the right track. If successful, he would, have under, he would have undone many of the harmful effects caused by purported custodial actions and the corrupted Brotherhood Network. A universal language would have undone the damaging effects described in the Tower of Babel story of dividing people into different language groups. Promoting a sense of universal citizenship would help overcome the types of nationalism which help generate wars. Something went wrong, however. Rhodes committed the same error made by so many other humanitarians before him. He thought that he could accomplish his goals through the channels of the corrupted Brotherhood Network. Rhodes, therefore, ended up creating institutions which promptly fell into the hands of those who would effectively use those institutions to oppress the human race. Bingo. Bingo. The Roundtable not only failed to do what Rhodes had intended, but its members later helped create two of the 20th century's most heinous institutions, the concentration camp and the very thing that Rhodes had dedicated his life to preventing, the atomic bomb. Rhodes' idea for the Roundtable had begun in his early 20s. At the age of 24, while a student at Oxford, Rhodes wrote his second will, which described his plans by bequeathing his estate for the establishment, promotion, and development of a secret society. The true aim and object whereof shall be the extension of British rule throughout the world, and finally the foundation of so great a power as to hereafter render wars impossible and promote the best interests of humanity. Rhodes Secret Society, the Round Table, was finally born in 1891. It was patterned after Freemasonry with its inner and outer circles. Rhodes' inner circle was called the Circle of Initiates, proper name there, and the outer was the Association of Helpers. The organization's name, the Round Table, was an allusion to King Arthur and his legendary Round Table. By implication, all members of Rhodes' Round Table were knights. It was inevitable that Rhodes' success and political influence would bring him into contact with other movers and shakers of English society. Among them, of course, were the major financiers of Britain. One of Rhodes' chief supporters was the English banker, Lord Rothschild. Head of the powerful Rothschild branch in England, Lord Rothschild was listed as one of the proposed members for the Round Table Circle of Initiates. Another Rhodes associate was the influential English banker, Alfred Milner. After Rhodes died in 1902, the Roundtable gained increased support from the members of the international banking community. They saw in the Roundtable a way to exert their influence over governments in the British Commonwealth and elsewhere. 
in the United States, for example, according to Dr. Quigley, the chief backbone of this roundtable organization grew up along the already existing financial cooperation running from the Morgan Bank in New York to a group of international financiers led by the Lazard brothers. Lazard brothers? Sounds like Lizard brothers to me. From 1925 onward, major contributions to the roundtable came from wealthy individuals, foundations, and companies associated with the international banking fraternity. They included the Carnegie United Kingdom Trust, organizations associated with J.P. Morgan and the Rockefeller and Whitney families. After World War I, the roundtable underwent a period of expansion during which many subgroups were created. The man responsible for getting many of the subgroups started was Lionel Curtis. In England and in each British dominion, Curtis established a local chapter, in Quigley's words, a front group of the roundtable called the Royal Institute of International Affairs. In the United States, the roundtable front group was named the Council on Foreign Relations. Many Americans today are familiar with the New York-based Council on Foreign Relations. The CFR is usually thought of as a think tank from which come a great many political appointees at the federal level. Under the presidential administration of Ronald Reagan, for example, more than 70 administration members belong to the council, including a member of top, uh, number of top cabinet members. The CFR has dominated earlier presidential administrations as well, and it dominates the present administration. <laughs> well, what's great about that statement there <laughs> and reading it is, uh, you know, this book was written in 1989. So it's great to read that statement, and it dominates the present administration today. <laughs> I mean, that, you know, you could read reading this in 1989 or 2039, and that, that statement's probably still going to be valid, you know. <laughs> dominates the present administration. Yep, it sure does. Even in 2011, yep, it sure dominates our administration as well. Nothing's changed. The chairman of the CFR for many years has been banker David Rockefeller former chairman of the Chase Manhattan Bank, another Chase executive chaired the CFR before that. The warning of Thomas Jefferson has come true. The banking fraternity has exercised a strong influence on American politics, notably in foreign affairs, and the Council on Foreign Relations is one channel through which it has done so. Regrettably, that influence has helped to preserve inflation, debt, and warfare as the status quo. When Cecil Rhodes was alive, he gained considerable power in South Africa and served for a number of years as colonial governor there. He had a unique and effective way of delegating power. According to one of Rhodes' closest friends, Dr. Jameson, Rhodes gave a great deal of autonomy to his trusted men. Dr. Jameson once wrote, quote, Mr. Rhodes left the decision on what to do in a situation to the man on the spot, myself who might be supposed to be the best judge of the conditions. This is Mr. Rhodes' way. It is a pleasure to work with a man of his immense ability, and it doubles the pleasure when you find that in the execution of his plans, he leaves it all to you. Although no doubt in the last instance of the Transvaal business he had suffered for this system, still in the long run, the system pays. As long as you reach the end, he has in view, he is not careful to lay down the means of methods that you are to employ. He leaves a man to himself. And that is why he gets the best work they are capable of out of all of his men. This can be a, an effective style of leadership, except when the means used to achieve an end create their own problems. Some of the methods used by Rhodes men did more long-term harm than immediate good. In South Africa, for example, a struggle between the Dutch settlers, the Bears, or the Beers, rather, as in, the, you know, the Beers, Diamonds, which erupted into the bear the bears war the bears war during that conflict one of the british officers under rhodes or kitchener established concentration camps to hold captured bears uh the bears b o e f bears it's just so it's weird to say that so it looks just strange b o e r s the camps were decreased by kitchener uh, decreed by kitchener on december 22nd uh, 27th 1900 and over 117,000 beers, I can't say it right, <laughs> over 117,000 beers, that's a lot of beer, 
were eventually imprisoned within 46 camps. Conditions were so inhumane that an estimated 18,000 to 26,000 people died primarily from disease. It was tantamount to mass murder. Today, we associate concentration camps with Nazi Germany and communist Russia, but their 20th century usage actually began with the English under Lord Kitchener. Perhaps the greatest irony in the story of the Roundtable was the role that the organization had in creating the atomic bomb. After Rhodes' death, the Roundtable groups went on to establish other organizations. One of them was the Institute for Advanced Study, the IAS, located in Princeton, New Jersey. The IAS greatly assisted the scientists who were developing the first atomic bomb for the United States. Institute members included Robert Oppenheimer, who has been dubbed the father of the A-bomb, and Albert Einstein, to whom the Institute was like a home. As we have seen, the world was undergoing many important developments. As it entered the 20th century, central banking was being organized into an international network. Bankers had uh, bankers had gained great influence in British and American foreign affairs through such groups as the Roundtable and the Council on Foreign Relations. Meanwhile, the communist movement was gaining increasing momentum in Europe. This momentum bore fruit in 1917 when communist revolutionaries established their first dictatorship of the proletariat in Russia. Once again, the world was on the road to a biblical utopia. And uh, so there you go. That's the end of chapter 32 there. Let's see. Chapter 33 is the next one we've got. 33. Dun, 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 dun. The Worker's Paradise. See how long that chapter is here. Yeah, it's a pretty long chapter. Don't know if I can get into all that tonight, but we might do some of it. Um, trying to see here. See how much time we have. Oh, it's pronounced boar, like in boar, like boar war. Okay. Boar war. Gotcha. I thought it was bear or beer or something. All right. Well, I guess we're going to leave it there tonight. Uh, we'll pick up back uh, there tomorrow, hopefully, and uh, continue on with Chapter 34. Hopefully, there'll be more news and stuff t tomorrow. But uh, for tonight, that's all I got. Please support our work. Chapter 34, Robo Sapiens. The digression from spiritual knowledge to materialist ideology appears to follow a graduated path from one into the other. We can chart this process beginning at the top with how an accurate spiritual perspective might define spiritual, uh, spiritual and physical realities and proceed down to how a materialist perspective would define them. Everyone is a spiritual being. Material realities are entirely the spiritual existence. It is ultimately the product of spiritual processes and independent of all material. Uh, we've got some craziness going on here. Pages running together. Oh, okay, I see. Everyone is a spiritual being, but different... Uh, so it's got two brackets. Let me explain this. Okay, I see what's going on here. I was just confused with what was going on here. It's got two brackets. One's broken down into spiritual reality and one that's broken down into physical reality. So the first thing I read will be spiritual reality and the second thing I'll be will be physical reality. So here we go. And then those, there's like about 
uh, six of these. Everyone is a spiritual being, but different classes of spiritual beings exist which cannot be changed. That's spiritual reality. Physical reality. Spiritual beings are subject to some inevitable or unchangeable laws governing the workings of, physical, of the physical universe. Everyone is a spiritual being, but there are senior spiritual beings to whom all other spiritual beings are inferior. Physical reality. Material processes are primarily the result of activities of senior spiritual beings to whom all other beings are inferior. Spiritual reality. Everyone has a spiritual sign to them, but there is only one purely spiritual being, usually a one only God. The physical reality explanation, the material universe was created by a one only God. And there exist many inevitable laws of the universe that people can never hope to understand. Spiritual reality says that it exists, but it is dependent upon the that uh, dependent upon and arises out of the material universe. If there is a supreme being, it is probably either a material being or a scientific law. Physical reality says that material processes alone account for any spiritual phenomenon, spiritual abilities such as ESP, clairvoyance, etc. You get the idea. Modern Western culture appears to be situated somewhere around the lower middle of the above chart. Leading the trend towards the bottom is a practice known as scientific psychiatry. There are many fine people working in psychiatry, but the field as a whole has become increasingly politicized due to its use by governments in a variety of settings. And it has come to promote a strict materialist view. Modern psychiatry has sadly obliterated the last vestige of spiritual reality acknowledged even by people such as Karl Marx. To understand this development, let us briefly survey the history of scientific psychiatry. <coughs> Efforts to cure people of mental affliction are as old as history. It is to the ancient Greeks and Romans that modern psychiatry traces many of its origins. More than 2,000 years ago, the Greek physician Hippocrates had classified various forms of mental illness and rejected the popular notion that mental ills were caused by angry gods or demonic possession. In later Rome, physician Galen was one of the first to theorize a connection between the brain and mental functioning. After Galen, Western psychology reverted back to a belief in demons and witches for many centuries. Perhaps the most important breakthrough in psychiatry occurred in Austria. Between 1880 and 1882, Viennese physician Joseph Brewer discovered that he was able to cure a girl of severe hysteria by having her remember and relive under hypnosis a traumatic incident from her past. Her symptoms disappeared for good. Dr. Brewer had discovered that a person could actually be cured from mental ills simply through the act of remembering and confronting past incidents, which re may remain hidden from conscious memory without the assistance of a therapist. In some way, mind aberrating pain is relieved through this process. Dr. Brewer had stumbled onto something extraordinarily significant. Yet his discovery, though utilized to some extent in the psychoanalysis developed by Sigmund Freud, was never fully explored in psychiatry. Even Freud's psychoanalysis failed to take the next step, which was to develop precision methods for helping people accurately pinpoint aberrational incidents from the past and discharge the mental, physical, and emotional pain contained in those incidents. Freud strayed off into his sloppy free association met methods, which made the remembering process less precise. He also overemphasized sexual incidents. Brewer's vital breakthrough was dealt an even mightier blow by what was happening in neighboring Germany during his day. Scientific psychiatry was emerging. One of the earliest centers of scientific psychiatry was Leipzig, uh, or, or Leipzig, Germany. There was a man named William Wundt who established the world's first psychological laboratory in 1879. Until that time, universities usually placed the study of psychology in their philosophy departments because of a lingering belief that there exists a spiritual side to man. It was once con uh, contention, however, that psychology belonged in a biological laboratory. To want 
human beings were only biological organisms to which there were no spiritual realities attached. He therefore considered his approach scientific rather than philosophical. Once theory about the mind was that human thought is caused by external stimulation bringing about body identification with which other stimuli which with the body has received and recorded in the past. When this identification occurs, the body or brain mechanically creates an act of will which responds to new stimulus. There is no such thing as self-created thought or free will. To want in his followers, man was but a sophisticated robot-type organism. Once ideas were based upon experiments conducted in his laboratories and elsewhere. Some of those experiments revealed that one could produce the physiological manifestations of different emotions by applying electric stimulation to different parts of the brain. Experimenters erroneously concluded that the brain must therefore be the source of personality because it triggers the physical manifestations of emotion and thought. The fallacy in this reasoning is obvious. The person conducting the experiment is applying external stimulation. In other words, the brain centers are not self-triggering except in a very limited sense. The experiments proved that it takes something else, something external, to trigger those brain centers. What then triggers those centers when the experimenter is no longer applying his electrodes? There must be another external source, a missing element. That missing element appears to be the spiritual entity which produces its own energy output. Yes, the bioetherical energy field. Although one and others used the experiments to prove a pure bi biological basis to human thought, the results were, in fact, subtly pointing in the opposite direction. Erroneous or not, the stimulus response model of behavior developed by Leipzig quickly became the new wave in psychiatry and received considerable support from the German government. Wundt himself had remained the most influential figure in scientific psychiatry for 40 years. The Leipzig labs attracted many students from around the world, many of whom later became prominent names in psychiatry. For example, one Leipzig student from Russia was Ivan Petrovich Pavlov, who gained fame for his experiments with bells and salivating dogs. Dwayne P. Schultz, writing his book, A History of Modern Psychology, sums it up well. Though these students, the Leipzig Laboratory exercised an immense influence on the development of psychology. It served as the model for the many new laboratories that were developing in the latter part of the 19th century. The many students who flocked to Leipzig united as they were in point of view and common purpose and constituted a school of thought in psychology. By re redefining the nature of thought and behavior, Scientific psychiatry also redefined the nature of mental abnormality and its cure. Methods to bypass human free will and intellect, behavior modification, were explored and developed. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Meth it says that uh, because human beings were viewed as strictly biological electrical chemical organisms, all mental illnesses were said to be the result of physiological processes somehow going out of kilter. Experimenters theorized that mental illness could be cured by strictly physiological means, such as with drugs, shock treatment, or brain surgery. It was believed that such treatments could remedy the chemical or electrical imbalances and thereby cure the mental illness itself. Out of these theories arose ambulation, dollar drug industry, a, um, ambulation, I said ambulate, yeah, well, maybe if he didn't put, somebody, nobody obviously edited this book. <sighs> There's just so many mistakes in this, I, I find when I'm reading it. Out of these theories arose a multi-billion dollar drug industry, which pours out huge quantities of mood-altering drugs every year. These drugs are designed to relieve every mental ill from can't get to sleep at night to violent psychosis. In addition, many psychiatrists use special machines to send electrical shocks through a person's brain. Some may even resort to brain surgery. 
Yeah, full frontal lobotomies. Well, they got they got you know lithium for that now. That's a lobotomy and a pill. Don't ever take fucking lithium. My God. Now that we have had almost half a century to observe these cures in action, we can ask, have they benefited mankind? Is the world a saner place today than it was 50 years ago? Hell fuck no. People are more batshit crazy now and today than they ever have been. To answer these questions, we might do well to analyze the cure most often prescribed by psychiatrists. Psychotropic mind-affecting drugs. Psychotropic drugs are a mammoth industry. They comprise a large portion of the total prescription drug trade, which in 1978 amounted to an estimated $16.7 billion wholesale value in global sales by U.S. manufacturers alone. This figure does not even include sales by Swiss and other European manufacturers. An excellent book, The Tranquilizing of America, revealed of the most frequently prescribed psychotropic drug Valium from Roche Laboratories was prescribed over 57 million times in 1977 alone, refills included. According to an advertisement published by Roche in 1981, almost 8 million people, or about 5% of the adult U.S. population at that time, would use Valium in that year. Add to that the enormous figure of the tens of millions of prescriptions for other psychotropic medications, and we discover that an enormous quantity of mind and mood-altering drugs are now being consumed every year. In 1977, for example, the total number of U.S. prescriptions for 20 major psychotropic drugs amounted to over 150 million. That amounted to approximately 8.35 billion pills. Oh, I'm so glad I never got into pills. I bet some of y'all out there did, though. Don't lie. I bet some of y'all got into pills. I never got. I could never. I never got into pills. I mean, I've taken pills. I've taken stuff like that sometimes when I've actually been legitimately in pain. But uh, I think that's part of the, probably half the part, you know, or not half of it, but probably part of the problem with my uncle that killed himself today. Uh. It's the people when they live in, in, in those rural areas, man, it just, you know, there's no hope, there's no opportunity, there's nothing but, you know, bathtub Nazi crank and prescription pills and, you know, it's just a bad road, man. But again, all by design. The epidemic drug use is not an accident. Powerful psychotropic medications are energetically promoted to the medical community in glossy Madison Avenue advertisements, in such publications as the American Journal of Psychiatry, and through workshops and seminars sponsored by the drug companies. Justified criticism has been leveled against drug-oriented psychiatry because of the number of patients who actually deteriorate as a result of their psychiatric treatment. For example, a surprisingly large number of people who commit apparently senseless acts of violence, such as shooting sprees and other grisly headlining-grabbing acts, are people who were previously treated with psychotropic drugs. John Hinckley Jr., for example, was under the influence of Valium when he attempted to assassinate U.S. President Ronald Reagan in 1981. Such coincidences are usually explained as an indication that those people were already mentally deranged before the violent episodes, and at worst, that the drugs were simply not able to help them. <coughs> On the other hand, critics point out that such individuals were often not violent before their treatment, but became violent only afterwards. Did psychiatric treatments actually worsen their mental states to the point of their going completely psychotic? Of course they did. That's what they do. They're designed to make you sick. Let me say it again if I didn't say it uh, good enough for you that before last. Don't take their drugs. Don't go into their hospitals. Don't go to their fucking paid murderers and pimps and drug dealers, a.k.a. doctors. That prestigious title of doctor that, that we're all led to believe, you know, from all the TV shows they programmed us with for decades. You ever notice how they've been programming us with, this, with, with the idea that doctors are there for our best interest for decades? Think about it. Yeah, and MASH and uh, Trapper John, MD, and... And uh, 
oh man, there's you know, saying elsewhere and ER and uh, you know, butt hurt anons unit or whatever the fucking other shows. I mean, they've been doing this for decades. They always try to paint the, the, the this picture and program our, our idea of a doctor as this, you know, sort of, you know, benevolent man in a white coat that's there to help us and make us get better and not and keep us from dying. No. These guys are pimps and drug pushers and fucking murderers. And they're paid to medicate you to death. They get paid to medicate you to death. That's their job. That's what they do. And let me tell you something, you sick motherfuckers. At the end of the day, when the murderers are lined up, guess what? Your little Ivy League school going ass. Thought you thinking you were being Mr. Big Shits in Turdville going to law going to uh med school. And let me tell you something, you're gonna be hung up with the motherfucking murderers like everybody else is. You got me? That's not a threat, it's a promise. One of the great feathers in the cap of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration is its requirement that all drug manufacturers must list the side effects or adverse reactions that their drugs have been known to cause. Yeah, you know, today, you know, the side effects far outweigh the, the original symptom. Well, I'm, I kind of got an itchy throat. I think I need to take some, uh, you know, a, a, a sinus allergy pill here for my, uh, for my itchy throat. Let's see what the side effects here are. Let's see. Side effects may include... Uh, lack of will to live, uh, inability to operate a motor vehicle or carry a decent conversation with another human being ever again. Oh, wow, that's kind of bad. Um, uh, profuse bleeding from the rectum. Oh, well, that sounds horrible. Uh, pus and blood from the penis or vaginal area. I mean, this is, you know, it really... I'm, I, I'm not even joking here you, I, at all. It's not fucking funny. I'm not trying to be funny here. It's goddamn truth. Listen to the look at the look. Listen to these ads and look at the shit that they tell you. I heard one one day that said it was all this. It was on TV and it was this flowery commercial. You know, ba ba ba. Hey, let's live life. Oh, let's live life with, uh, you know, uh, fuck you up a con or whatever it was called. You know, and literally one of the things that they talked about was. Uh, side effects may include death. Straight the fuck up. Just straight up. Not, you know, not bleeding from the anus. Not, you know, well, can't get your dick hard. Straight up death. Side effects may include death. Straight the fuck up. I'm not kidding you. I'm not making it up. Side effects may include death. <laughs> you might take this and you might die. But you might not have an itchy asshole anymore if you take it. So what do you want to do? Do you want to have an itchy asshole? Or do you want to roll the the dice Vegas style, baby? Take the pill, and uh, you know, run the risk of death as a as a direct side effect. And it's unbelievable. It's the truth. Unfortunately, by the time an adverse reaction is visible to the doctor, the damage may already be done. Most adverse re reactions do not do vanish when the medication is discontinued. But some side effect can be permanent and cause lasting complications. This is especially worrisome when we discover that many adverse reactions are psychological. A person, in, a person opening a copy of the American Journal of Psychi Psychiatry and seeing the drug ads for the first time may react with shock at not only the slick sales pitches, but also the small print. Every advertised psychotropic medication has a long list of potential physical and physiological adverse reactions. Most of the listed side effects are in medical terms incomprehensible to the layman. However, many of them are quite understandable. Here is a sampling of some listed as potential adverse reactions to popular psychotropic medications that have been advertised and prescribed in the, in the 1980s. The drug the Sermontil, which is promoted as a drug for helping a person overcome symptoms of depression, lists among its possible side effects. Confusion states with hallucinations, disorientation, delusions, anxiety, restlessness, agitation, insomnia, nightmares, hypomania, exacerbation of psychosis, blah, blah, blah. Halidol, oh, that's, a, that's a wonderful one. Oh, God. 
Let me tell you something, fellas. Well, ladies, too, for that matter, but I'm just speaking to the fellas here because I'm a fella and I can only speak to the fellas, but ladies, I would take this as a rule, too. Fellas, if you meet a chick on Halladol, run! Don't give a fuck how hot she is. Run! I don't care if she licks your balls. Run! Halidol is advertised as a way of handling an acutely aggravated patient. It can cause insomnia, restlessness, anxiety, euphoria, agitation, drowsiness, depression, lethargy, headache, confusion, vertigo, grand mal seizures, an exacerbation of psychiatric symptoms, including hallucinations and catatonic-like behavioral states. Just what you want in your day. I mean, goddamn, just, you know, let's slip the bitch some roofies and be done with it. Fuck. Better than the fucking Halidol diet. Jesus. Thorazine, you know, that's another winner. Better pray to God you got some Thorazine in the bag, man. Otherwise, you're in serious fucking trouble. Thorazine, which is promoted as a medication for handling psychotic adults and children, belongs to a class of drugs which has been known to cause the following. Psychotic syndromes, catatonic-like states, cerebral edema, Convulsive seizures, abnormality of the cerebrospinal fluid proteins. Note, sudden death in patients taking this drug um, has been reported, but no casual relation has been established between that and uh, cardiac arrest or asphyxia. Yeah. So you may uh, have a heart attack or just choke to death if you take Thorazine. It's a side effect. So be aware. The last sentence in, in the above a quote is a remarkable bit of doublespeak. It states that giving someone this class of drug has coincided with their suddenly dying, but the manufacturer denies that there is any evidence that the drugs were responsible for the deaths. No doubt it was just an extraordinary coincidence that some people have had cardiac arrest or cough reflex failures at the time of taking the drug. Fate must indeed work in mysterious ways. Stelazine, another Smith Klein drug, lists many of the same adverse reactions as Thorazine and adds hypotension, sometimes fatal, cardiac arrest to its long list of medical adverse reactions. The drug is advertised as a classic antipsychotic. Norpramine, uh, which is made by da -da -da, Dow Pharmaceuticals, Dow being one of the most evil chemical companies on earth lists the same adverse reactions quoted earlier from the drug Sermontil, but adds heart block, mitocardial infraction, stroke, etc. to its list. Even the relatively mild drug Valium, so widely prescribed today, warns paradoxical reactions such as acute hyperexcited states, anxiety, hallucinations, increased muscle spasms, insomnia, rage, sleep disturbances, and stimulation have been reported. Should these occur, discontinue use. The above drugs are only a sample. Nearly every medication advertised in the American Journal of Psychiatry has had a long list containing identical or similar potential adverse reactions. The implications of this are significant. These drugs have been known to sometimes seriously worsen a person's mental state or cause mental problems far more severe than those the patient began with. As noted, physicians prescribe these drugs because the severe adverse reactions reportedly occur only in a minority of cases, and many side effects are reversible by discontinuing the drug. However, the road back from many adverse reactions can be a long one. The person suffering a psychotic break, whether from emotional stress or a drug, may take a long time to recover. In the meantime, he may do considerable damage to himself or to others. When we consider the enormous scale in which these drugs are prescribed, even a small percentage of patients suffering a severe psychological reaction will amount to a large number of individuals. This immediately explains the puzzle of why some mental patients seem to truly go off the deep end after treatment. Regrettably, few people will blame the drug, even in cases where the drug may be the cause. But we will instead blame the patient. He was teetering near the edge anyway, or 
Uh, look at what society's done to this poor, crazy individual. The great tragedy is that some children may be affected by this. Many schools and treatment centers are quick to give powerful psychotropics to problem children and adolescents. It is argued that the number of people who are helped by the drugs far exceed those who are worsened. Advocates cite statistics showing that drugs enable many patients to leave psychiatric institutions sooner and return to the community. Psychotropic drugs seem to enable some people to keep their psychological symptoms under control, enough for them to lead useful lives in society. You know what? That is that is true. Um, you know, there are... We can, we can talk all night about how bad this stuff is, um, and we're all aware of it. And there are people out there that are on these drugs that are aware that they're bad. And while I feel that no one should be on these drugs and that there are naturally, I, I just think the drugs are a cop-out. I think they're, I, I really do. But there are some people out there who, you know, are convinced and will tell you seven ways to Sunday that, you know, they can't operate without them and they believe that. And that's sad they believe that. And then they'll say, no, I don't believe it. It's true. If I don't have it, I would go crazy. Well, Anything can be worked through. Anything can be treated. We don't need these motherfuckers' chemicals to fix our brains. We can fix our brains on our own. And not only that, who's, who's to say, who's, who, who's to judge that maybe you're, you're supposed to be that way? You know, maybe some of us are supposed to be fucking nuts. As many psychiatrists acknowledge, psychotropic drugs rarely cure mental illness. They simply suppress the symptoms. In this respect, psychotropics are like cold medicines, which can make a person feel better and appear healthier, but they rarely cure the underlying illness itself. When a person is removed from the medication, the symptoms usually recur. The patient functions no better than he or she did before, may even be worse off from having suffered side effects from the drug. Many psychiatrists, therefore, do not speak of cure, but of maintenance. Psychiatry boosts a low cure rate, but a high maintenance rate. As long as factories churn out pills, drug maintenance can continue. Is this fair to the patient? In the long run, is society really being helped? The danger with maintenance-oriented psychiatry is that mental illness is a serious contagion. I got to get a drink real quick. Hold on. All right. Sorry about that. So I, I can go for long stretches at a time. Sometimes this is the problem is I don't, I don't stop and get a drink and then I, my throat's sore and I'm, uh, you know. So give me just a second here. All right. The danger with maintenance-oriented psychiatry is that mental illness is, a sin, is, in a sense, contagious. This fact is most obvious in the phenomenon of mob psychology. As well as in other circumstances, if people are not actually being cured of mental ills, but are only having their symptoms masked, and meanwhile, mental aberration spreads from other causes, it follows that mental illness will probably increase in any society relying upon drug therapy. Again, bingo, by design. That's what they want. They know that as well as, as, as Bramley does here in this writing. That's the plan. If psychotropes are also slamming thousands of people every year into a deeper psychological morass because of dangerous side effects, we can see that the drug-oriented psychiatry is pushing a society to ruin. Yet psychotropics constitute the main form of therapy in most psychiatric institutions today. The dangers of heavy psychotropic drugs are increased by another factor. A large problem factor facing today's psychological uh, psychiatric community is the, abnormal the abnormally high suicide rate of its practitioners. Psychiatrists in the United States have a suicide rate about six times that of the general population. 
The highest percentage of those self-inflicted deaths occur among practitioners working in mental hospitals. This high suicide rate is often viewed as an occupational hazard caused by frustration and by a psychiatrist's continuous contact with mental illness. Whatever the cause of it may be, this suicide statistic is a reason to be concerned for the welfare of mental patients. Suicides are usually preceded by a period of declining mental health. One rarely finds a genuinely stable and well-adjusted person committing suicide. One of the major duties of a psychiatrist is accurate diagnosis and proper treatment, yet one of the most common manifestations of mental illness is the vis visualization of one's own problems in other people. A psychiatrist in a pre-suicidal state therefore risks being the source of grievous misdiagnosis because he may diagnose a patient as having what the doctor is actually suffering from. Because wrong diagnosis and mistreatment can ruin a person's life, especially in a hospital setting where strong psychotropic shock therapy and psychosurgery are used, it is vital that the treating psychiatrists and technicians be genuinely sane, social, and well-adjusted. Sadly, a statistically large minority of them are not. The epidemic of use of psychotropic drugs creates yet another significant problem. Drug abuse is considered one of today's major social ills. Law enforcement agencies spend an enormous amount of time and money to combat it. The fight against drug abuse is based on the philosophy that people should not take illegal drugs to alter their moods or mental states. Modern psychiatry defeats this campaign. Drug-oriented psychiatry tells us feeling depressed, take a drug. Feeling too happy or manic, take a drug. Feeling unable to cope, take a drug. Feeling too able to cope, megalomaniacal, take a drug. Feeling confused and uncertain, take a drug. Feeling too certain or delusional, take a drug. Suck Satan's cock. Take a drug. Seeing things that aren't there, hallucinations. Suck Satan's cock. Take a drug. Not seeing things that are there. Suck Satan's cock. Take a drug. Maintenance-oriented psychiatry promotes the very attitude with which the illegal drug trade flourishes. Want to feel better mentally and emotionally? Take a drug. The great irony is that some of the very same conservative law and order judges and lawmakers who demand stiffer penalties against illegal drug pushers are among those who are the quickest to set up the legal machinery for committing people involuntarily to mental institutions where drugs as powerful as anything on the illegal market are routinely and openly used. The purpose of this discussion is not to impugn the general mental therapy field. As I mentioned earlier, there are many fine psychiatrists in practice today, and it should also be noted that many therapists and counselors who specialize in communication-oriented therapy talking without drugs, achieve excellent results and do much to help their clients. To understand the specific problems of scientific psychiatry, it is perhaps wise to remember that psychiatrists, but not most psychologists, are people with medical degrees. Doctors are trained in medical schools to cure physical problems by physical means, bombard an infection with antibiotics, or fix a broken leg with a cast. Where many doctors stray is their belief that a mental problem is the same as a broken leg or a viral infection, and so they bombard the mental illness with a drug or they shock it with electricity. Such an approach misses the mark because a broken mind must be healed in entirely different by an entirely different set of rules. This is well recognized by the fact that that most nations permit people to become therapists and counselors without a medical degree. Have philosophies of strict materialism brought about a flourishing psychiatric profession which is bringing about greater sanity to patients, practitioners, and the world as a whole? Sadly, the answer seems to be no. Psychiatry started on the right track when it discovered that the mind could be cured of its inorganic ills by confronting past hidden traumas. But it failed to develop that discovery beyond the crude and haphazard techniques used today in psychotherapy. 
Psychiatry was derailed when it began to mask mental problems with chemicals. And when it developed bizarre methods for bypassing individual free will in favor of stimulus response manipulation, or better known as behavior modification. It is perhaps time to move away from the strict materialist perspective to get off the drugs and to begin restoring a sense of respect for the free will and intellect of human beings. We may then be able to truly start well, back on the tonight, road to genuine mental, social, Chapter 35 and spiritual here, William recovery. William Bramley's The Gods of Eden, or the St. Germain race. Returns. Got a drink here, so should be good to go. The upheavals of early 20th century, of the early 20th century, convinced many people that the judgment day was at hand. Many Christians and mystics anticipated an imminent second coming of Christ. True to prophecy, it came. Heralding Jesus' second coming was the resurrected Count of St. Germain, the mysterious brotherhood agent of the 18th century whose activities we followed in chapter 26. After St. Germain's reported death, in 1784, he was made to seem physically immortal. In the early 1930s, a man named Guy Warren Ballard claimed that St. Germain had spoken to him on a mountain in California. That conversation gave birth to an interesting new branch of the Brotherhood that would not only sponsor the return of St. Germain, but also the reappearance of Jesus Christ. Guy Warren Ballard was a mining engineer. In 1930, he went on a business trip to Mount Shasta in Northern California. Ballard had become interested in mysticism for his trip, and he wanted to use his off-duty hours at Mount Shasta to unravel rumors about the existence of a secret branch of the Brotherhood called the Brotherhood at Mount Shasta. Yeah, they're, they're, uh, it's, just like the, uh, it's just like Shambhala, which is in the uh, Himalayas. It's Shambhala in the West. That's what's at Mount Shasta inside of the mountain and underground, allegedly. The Shasta Brotherhood was said to have a secret underground headquarters inside the famous California mountain. Yeah, absolutely. The legends which had caught Mr. Ballard's interest had been circulating before the turn of the century. Persistent rumors told of secret dwellers living inside Mount Shasta who practiced a profound mystical tradition. The secret dwellers were said to be descended from inhabitants of the ancient lost continent of Lemuria in the Pacific Ocean. Whatever the truth behind such legends may or may not be, it is unquestioned that Mount Shasta has long been a focus of mystical activity. Associated with that mystical activity has been a significant UFO phenomenon. For example, in the May 1931 issue of the Rosicrucian Digest, Published in the year following Mr. Ballard's trip to Shasta and a decade and a half before UFOs were popularized in the media, we read the following description of a flying boat in an article about the Shasta mystics. Many testify to having seen the strange boat or boats which sail the Pacific Ocean and then rise at its shores and sail through the air to drop again in the vicinity of Shasta. This same boat was seen several times by the officials employed at the cable station located near Vancouver, and the boat had been sighted as far north as the Aleutian Islands. According to the same article, the boat has neither sails nor smokestacks. Against this background, Mr. Ballard's experience on Mount Shasta takes on added significance. Mr. Ballard writes that he had hiked up the side of the mountain and paused by a spring. As he bent down to fill a cup with water, he felt an electrical current passing through his body from head to foot. Looking around, he saw behind him a bearded man who looked to be in his 20s or 30s. The stranger later introduced himself as the Count of St. Germain. As a result of this meeting, Mr. Ballard began a full-time career spreading the teachings of the new St. Germain. Ballard established the I Am Foundation, an organization with secret initiations and step-by-step -step teachings. Mr. Ballard claims that he had been introduced to members of the highest levels of the Brotherhood under which the I.M. was founded. 
The tales Mr. Ballard tells of his experiences with St. Germain are so extraordinary that many people have derided them as fancy. Uh, fantasy, rather. Some, surprising when we strip away the interpretations with bo which both Mr. Ballard and his critics give to his experiences, we find that his stories present a picture not only consistent with the rest of the history as we have been viewing, but as but they add remarkable new claims to with rather startling implications for our own time. The initial meetings between Ballard and St. Germain took place between August and October 1930. During the earliest of those meetings, St. Germain had Ballard drink a liquid which caused a strong physical reaction and made Ballard go out of his body. Yeah, fucking ayahuasca, DMT. Hello? What do you think he gave him? This same out-of-body phenomenon is often reported by people, people taking strong drugs. Well, DMT is the only one that specifically does that. That's what it does. It's the closest thing to experiencing death you can experience while you're while still being alive. And that's a full DMT experience. What I, uh, uh, one of which I have yet to have, but I hope to have one eventually. But, you know, I've done just about every, well, no, I'm not just about. I have done every other psychedelic pretty much other than that. Um, after imbibing this fluid on several occasions, Ballard said that he was able to go out of body Without the drink, this testimony is consistent with other evidence indicating that once a person learns to go out of body, it can become easy to do for a time. Ballard alleges that while he was in some of his out-of-body states, St. Germain, who was also out of body, took him to some remarkable places. One locale was a mountain in the Teton Range of Wyoming, a mountain Mr. Ballard calls the Royal Teton. According to Ballard, there was a sealed tunnel entrance near the top of a mountain that led to elevators. The elevators took their occupants to a location 2,000 feet down into an underground complex of huge halls, storage spaces, and mines. This is the 1930s? So they've had these underground bases for a lot longer than, than we think we've had the technology to be able to do it. You understand that? Listen to this. In one of the large underground rooms, Mr. Mallard claims that he saw an all-seeing eye symbol on the wall. Well, pff, you know, you, you, you're just going to hallucinate that, that, that detail, and it'd be that accurate? Give me a break. There was also a large machine, which Mr. Mallard described as a disc of gold at least 12 feet in diameter filling it so that the points touched the circumference and blazed a seven-point star composed entirely of yellow diamonds, a solid mass of brilliant golden light. Around the main disc were seven small discs, which Ballard gave symbolic meaning to Mr. Ballard quickly and revealed, however, that this large machine was not a mere symbol. As I learned later, at certain times for special purposes, Great cosmic beings pour through these disks. They're powerful currents of force. Great cosmic beings was the term used by Ballard to denote leaders at the highest echelons of the Brotherhood. In his writings, Mr. Ballard claims that some of the Brotherhood's great cosmic beings are of extraterrestrial origin. Ballard was told that the currents of force emitted by the machine were directly uh, directed to the humanity of Earth. The purpose, the radiation effects, the seven ganglomic centers, the nerve centers outside the brain and spinal cord, <coughs> within every human body on our planet, as well as all animal and plant life. This is an astonishing claim. For it would mean that powerful electronics were being used by the Brotherhood's great cosmic beings to affect the human nervous system on a widespread scale. Well, that would mean also, ladies and gentlemen, that um, because that's what heart can do. Doctor, look into the work of Dr. Nick Begic. Nick, Nick Begic, he's talked about that. It's absolutely proven you can affect human nervous systems with electromagnetic pulses with something on the scale of heart. So did this guy witness an already existing heart facility? Uh, again, in a time when, you know, 
were told we didn't have technology to do such things. That would also explain that, you know, the guy that was dressed like a woman in drag talking on a, on a, on a phone during the Charlie Chaplin, uh, uh, outside the Charlie Chaplin film, wouldn't it? Uh, that's unbelievable. It says that um, according to I Am Foundation magazine, the purpose of the radiation was behavior modification designed to consume and purify the, fortis of, the vortices of force produced by the discordant and vicious activities of mankind. The idea of behavior modification through electronic radiation is by no means an absurd one. In recent years, the Soviet Union has been deploying and using electronic tranquilizing machines to behaviorally affect large populations. Such devices are also being proposed for classroom use in the United States. We will discuss those devices in an upcoming chapter. Although the alleged purpose of the Royal Teton radiation mach machine was to reduce discordant human activity, such radiation will usually have the opposite long-term effect because the emanations are actually irritants to the central nervous system, even if they do cause a superficial sedation. It's perhaps ironic that within less than a decade after Ballard wrote of his experience, the world exploded into one of the bloodiest conflicts, World War II. Either the machine of the great cosmic beings did not work, or it did. In his first books, Mr. Ballard claims to have visited four secret underground locations altogether, two of them while out of his body and two by regular human means. Interestingly, each location corresponded to a region in which there existed earlier in history a major civilization worshiping the custodial gods. Imagine that. See, you start to understand the origins of these underground bases? They weren't just put there by our military. They weren't just put there in modern times. These were already existing structures, and they at later added on to them. You know, what's under Denver, and what's in the deserts, all these different places. In fact, I believe that's what, um, I believe they did that here in Dallas as well. Because... Um, when they were digging the sewer systems for uh, the city of Dallas, when Dallas was first being built, they discovered underneath Dallas this this long, long, long networking of a uh, series of tunnels that were laser etched into the solid rock under under the ground and stretched for miles, miles and miles and miles and miles. Well, in the 1980s, they were planning on putting what eventually became CERN. At that time, they called it the Superconducting Super Collider. Was set to be right here in North Texas, in the Dallas area where I live. And uh, Clinton got in office in 92, and they killed the program, and that was it. And everybody just blamed it on Clinton and went about their business. And uh, a lot of people lost jobs and job opportunities. People moved from, moved from all over to work there. But something happened because they got a good ways done with this thing. They had those big you know, nuclear drillers that go underground and bore through solid rock. And uh, I believe they, I believe they hit something. They found something. They ran into something. Because I mean, dude, think about it. They were going to put what is now CERN right here in Dallas, smack dab on the motherfucking thirty-third degree parallel, folks. And they found something there. And I know that this, this town is very, very, very special to, uh, to the elite. It's a power center. That's why they did Kennedy here. A similar underground location in South America went hand-in-hand -hand with the Incan civilization on that continent. A trip by boat and automobile resulted in a stopover at a reputed underground location on the Arabian Peninsula, which matched the ancient Mesopotamian and Egyptian civilizations. The fourth location in the mountains above the city of Darjeeling, India, corresponded to the ancient Aryan civilizations of the Indian supercontinent. The underground locations were reportedly quite expansive, and served a number of functions. In addition to holding electronic gadgetry, the caves were reportedly filled with enormous quantities of precious metals and gems. And uh, a lot of people believe this is where th 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 that's why they want. That's why they've tried to conquer Afghanistan all these times. You know, every invading army since you know what till the Hun has failed and lost in, in Afghanistan. Do you ever see that movie, The Objective? If you haven't seen the movie The Objective, you should download that and watch that. 
these guys go out, you know, these troops go out to Afghanistan. They're looking for something. And, you know, the story, you know, the story is that there's Vermonas and stuff out there. And they talked about, you know, we, that, that story five or six months ago about there being trillion, trillion dollar in resources in Afghanistan alone. I mean, it very well could be that that's where the main uh, hub of, you know, the Ascended Masters is operating from. And they're trying to go in there and wipe them out and put their people in, much as the same way that they, that Alice Bailey talks about that they did. She talks about that in her book, Initiation, Human, and Solar, uh, doing that in the Himalayas at Shambhala. <coughs> it says that um, the, the caves were filled with enormous quantities of precious metals and gems. This is interesting because we know that most of the ancient civilizations worshiping the custodial gods, quote-unquote gods, regularly made substantial offerings of gold, silver, gems, and other precious minerals to these gods. See, that's been another thing. No, I've always said we have just as much proof that, you know, UFOs or alien craft come from inside of the earth or under the oceans and out of portals, you know, from, from inside of the earth as we do that they come from outer space, you know. We just assume that these craft are all coming from outer space, but I don't, I don't, I don't think that's the whole story. So what, what he's implying here, what Bramley is implying here is that the reason there was this huge, you know, cache of gold and silver and gems there in these underground caves is because, this, you know, this is stuff that had been collected by them from all the places they'd gone around the world and convinced the locals that they were the god. And they went back underground into their, um, and it was a very, well, could be that, that that's where the real power structure is, or these, you know, Masters who live deep underground in the earth and who have for thousands of years, and it could be that they, you know, that that they are the progeny of the people who came here from other star systems. I'm just saying that it very well could be that these gods that we associate with coming from outer space could actually have not been from outer space, but from inner space inside of the earth. Mr. Ballard alleged that the treasures he viewed came from some of those civilizations. In these containers, gold is stored from the lost continents of Mu and Atlantis, the ancient civilizations of the Gobi and Sahara deserts, Egypt, Chaldea, Babylonia, Greece, Rome, and two others. It has generally been assumed by historians that the ancient offerings went to the priest class. If, however, we take the existence of the custodial god seriously, it is more likely that the gods really did carry the stuff away. Mr. Ballard's testimony would indicate that a great many of the precious stones and metals were stored by the gods in an inaccessible underground location on Earth, perhaps to help finance custodial activities and to keep the corrupted brotherhood functioning. Maybe that's what the rock wall is. Uh, I know Ashiana Dean was asked, the ch famous channeler, was asked a question about the mysterious rock wall in Rockwall, Texas, and that's what she said it was, or the, the entity that she allegedly channeled that said that's what it was a storehouse for ancient technology after the fall of Atlantis. Precious metals and stones were expensive largely because of artificial scarcity. Also, I would, I'd like to add, uh, you know, if that, if, that, if, that, if that is indeed true, that that was a storehouse for things, and they were indeed storing gold and, and metals there, that could be it, couldn't it? Rock wall very well could be that. I, I just, you know, now that I think about it, wow, I want to stop there for a minute. Um, Mr. Ballard's testimony would indicate that a great many of the precious stones and metals were stored by the gods in inaccessible underground locations on Earth, perhaps to help finance custodial activities and keep the corrupted brotherhood functioning. Well, my God, Rockwall is not only the smallest county in Texas, it's also the richest, the wealthiest. Like I discovered, they built all those multi-million dollar homes right on the edge of where the wall is. Oh, my God, it all makes sense now. They, oh, it all makes sense to me now. Oh, my God. Precious metals and stones were expensive largely because of artificial scarcity. When Cecil Rhodes developed his near monopoly on diamond mining in southern Africa, he was able to maintain the high price of diamonds by creating a very rigid channel through which his diamonds were sold. 
This is still true. The diamond trade today, according to Mr. Ballard, the ascended masters of the Brotherhood intended to keep precious metals and gems scarce. If all this gold were to be released into the outer activity of the world, it would compel sudden readjustment in every phase of human experience. At present, it would not be a part of wisdom. St. Germain reportedly stated that huge quantities of gold and treasure would be released into the outer world when mankind has transcended its unbridled selfishness. The implication is that these precious gems and minerals exist in sufficient quantities on Earth to cause a dramatic drop in their value if they should all be released into the public domain. A further implication is that they are hoarded and made scarce to preserve the wealth of the Brotherhood. If the treasures do indeed exist, and there were treasure hunters that, w that said that, there was, that they had gone looking for these big, gigantic treasure chests that were built of the size of giants in some of the underground enclosures in the Rock Wall in Rockwall, Texas. Unbelievable. If the treasures do indeed exist and the Brotherhood is a sizable hidden economic power on Earth, according to Mr. Ballard, this hidden economic might does exist and has been used to influence human activities. During his tour of the Teton location, St. Germain reportedly told Ballard, no one in this world ever accumulated a great amount of wealth without the assistance and radiation of some ascended master. There are occasions in which individuals can be used as a focus of great wealth for a specific purpose, and at such times, greatly added power is radiated to them. For through it, they can receive personal assistance, such an experience is a test and opportunity for their growth. It is certainly true that wealth has traditionally been concentrated into the hands of a small minority. It is also true that many members of that minority throughout history have been affiliated with the Mystical Brotherhood Network. The problem with this state of affairs would not be the narrow control of wealth. It would be that this control has so often been used to breed war and spiritual decay. During his trips to the alleged underground locations, Ballard was also shown some radio-type gadgets. One such gadget could reportedly tune in on conversations taking place in various parts of the world including the offices of the Bank of England. As we recall, the Bank of England was one of the earliest institutions founded on the inflatable paper money system. That system was largely the creation of mystics and revolutionaries affiliated with the Brotherhood Network. The Bank of England has continued to be a principal center of that system up until today. This alleged eavesdropping capability of Mr. Ballard's Ascended Masters is therefore remarkable because it would indicate a direct monitoring of a principal central bank in the international paper money system by top echelons of the Brotherhood. This becomes even more interesting in the next chapter when we consider the assistance that the Bank of England's director, Montag Norman, gave to Adolf Hitler and the German Nazi movement during the very time that this electronic snooping was reportedly occurring. Earlier in this book, we noted the large-scale destruction of irreplaceable religious and historical records in the Eastern and Western Hemispheres by zealous Christians. Historians have been able to piece together much of human history anyway, but it is that history. Is that history complete? According to Mr. Ballard, it is not. Mankind lost additional records to Brotherhood leaders who had deliberately removed and hidden the writings. Ballard claims that he saw some of these ancient historical works inside the underground mountain complex north of Darjeeling, India. He added that the records would not be released to the human race until the Ascended Masters so ordered. These records are not brought forth into the use of the outer world of the present time because of lack of spiritual growth and understanding of the people. The race has a restlessness and a critical feeling that is very destructive activity, and this is a very destructive activity. The Ascended Masters of the Great White Brotherhood have always foreseen such destructive impulses and have withdrawn all important records of every civilization and preserved them, then left the less important to be destroyed by the vicious impulse of the Vandals. If true, the above quote is a stunning admission. 
Many mankind's lack of spiritual growth has been caused by the very organizations to which these alleged ascended masters belong. It was the brotherhood that turned spiritual knowledge into incomprehensible symbols, unfathomable mysteries, superstitious rites, savage apocalypt apocalypticisms, and all of the other ills which ensue therefrom. In such circumstances, it is not surprising that human beings would experience a restlessness and critical feeling, and the solution of withholding knowledge would certainly not correct those human deficiencies. <clears throat> Such a solution can only deepen the problem. The claim that important records must be hidden to prevent their destruction is spurious. In Ballard's day, book printing was a well-established art. Any important records could be easily duplicated and mass-produced with the originals safely stored away. If indeed such records, hidden, uh, hidden records existed, we must conclude that the only purpose for hiding them was to keep mankind ignorant about the past. Bingo. Bingo. There you go. That's their whole agenda. They want to distract you with the minutia of the agenda so you don't ever find out what the real agenda is. You see how that's happened throughout the years in the conspiracy research culture? The I Am movement created by Mr. Mallard preached a Judgment Day philosophy and strong anti-communism. Despite attacks from the press and the U.S. government, the I Am movement attracted a large following during the late 1930s and early 1940s. The I Am taught that communism was the final evil in the world and that it would soon be destroyed by the ascended masters. Interestingly, no mention was made of Nazism, which was rapidly growing in Germany at the time. The ascended masters and their followers were clearly political creatures. According to Mr. Mallard, members of the Brotherhood were deeply involved in espionage and police organizations in the 1930s. Brotherhood members reportedly served in the American Secret Service, and Mr. Ballard claims that he had met agents of the French Secret Service who were members of the Brotherhood and who called themselves Brothers of the Light. As if the reappearance of St. Germain in 1930 was not enough, the IM movement hosted another, more, most, uh, another most distinguished speaker, Jesus Christ himself. Jesus was a featured guest in New York on October 24th, 1937, and in Oakland, California on February 18th, 1939. Whether this Jesus was actually a person claiming to be Christ or simply was simply Mr. or Mrs. Ballard acting as mediums to channel the spirit voice of Jesus, I have not been able to discover. Whichever it may have been, may I respectively submit that this was a bona fide um, second coming of Jesus as the custodial religions will probably ever deliver. This second coming in the 1930s was sponsored by the same Brotherhood Network, which had sponsored and betrayed Jesus centuries before, and which has kept alive apocalyptic teachings predicting Jesus' return ever since. Naturally, this newest second coming did not result in thousands of years of peace and spiritual salvation. It really helped set the stage for World War II. The I Am movement died down rather quickly after its peak in the 1940s. It is quite small today. It never gained the following or influence that so many other Brotherhood branches had attained. To most people, today's I Am Foundation is a little more than a curiosity run primarily by retired people. Indeed, the I am is not important to us for what it is now. It is significant for what it was in the 1930s and 40s. Was Ballard's I am foundation the concoction of blatant spiritual quacks offering a home-brewed spiritual elixir to people seeking a ray of hope in a world gone awry? Or did Mr. Ballard really meet someone that afternoon in 1930 on Mount Shasta? Was the IEM simply a bit of mystical razzle-dazzle designed to make money for the Ballard family, as critics have maintained, or did Mr. Ballard's reported experiences offer a rare glimpse into some of the activities of the Brotherhood in the 20th century? It is a pity that Mr. Ballard is not here today to make his confession. We're going to continue on here tonight. Chapter 36, 
from William Bramley's The Gods of Eden, Universe of Stone. People will not die for business, but only for ideals. Adolf Hitler in Mein Kampf. St. Germain and Jesus were not the only messiahs to appear in the 1930s, bearing promises of an imminent utopia. Another messiah was gaining a large following in Germany. His coming was said to be the beginning of the millennium. Using one of the Brotherhood's most important symbols, the swastika, the German messiah's name was Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler, of course, was the strutting man with the toothbrush mustache who became absolute dictator of Germany and instigated World War II. Hitler and his entourage would look comical to us today were not the consequences of their lunacy so tragic. During his young adulthood, before rising to power, Hitler lived in Vienna. One of Hitler's friends during that period was Walter Johannes Stein. During World War II, Dr. Stein became an advisor to England's Prime Minister, Sir Winston Churchill. Much of what Dr. Stein had to say about Hitler's early life found its way into a book entitled Spear of Destiny by Trevor Ravenscroft. Spear of Destiny reports that Hitler had become a devotee of mysticism during his poverty-stricken days in Vienna between 1909 and 1913. When Hitler was in his early 20s, Hitler was convinced that he had achieved higher levels of consciousness by means of drugs and had made a penetrating study of medieval occultism and ritual magic, discussing with Stein the whole span of the political, historical, and philosophical reading through which he formulated what was later to become Nazi Weltenhag, a spiritual concept of human history. In his autobiography, Mein Kampf, Hitler affirmed the importance of this period in shaping his ideas. Hitler did not develop his ideology in a vacuum. One of the most influential mentors was a Viennese bookstore owner named Ernest Pretschke. Pretschke was described by Dr. Stein as a malevolent-looking man with a somewhat toad-like appearance. Pretschke was a devotee of the Germanic mysticism that was preaching the coming of an Aryan super race. Hitler frequented Pretschke's store and pawned books there when he needed money. During those visits, Pretschke indoctrinated Hitler in Germanic mysticism and successfully encouraged Hitler to use the hallucinogenic drug peyote as a tool for achieving mystical enlightenment. As it turns out, Pretschke was associated with a man named Guido von Liszt. Von Liszt was a founding member and a leading figure in an occult lodge which used a swastika instead of a cross in its rituals. Before he was disgraced and forced to flee from Vienna, Von Liszt had gained a large audience for his Germanic mystical writings, and Hitler became a member of that audience through Pretschke. Back in his Viennese flop, flophouse room, young Hitler avidly poured through pamphlets and books expounding on the mystical destiny of Germany and of the coming Aryan super race. According to some of these tracts, Aryans were created by an extraterrestrial super race of giants. Hitler became an ardent believer in those ideas as he hawked his watercolors on the street to support his meager existence and to pay for his drug-induced enlightenments. The notion that Hitler was a druggie in his youth seeking mystical enlightenment through chemicals should not come as a surprise. Drugs were a major factor in shaping the persona of Adolf Hitler, Hitler remained a user of powerful narcotics his entire life. According to the diaries of Hitler's personal physician, Dr. Theodore Morell, which surfaced in the U.S. National Archives, the German dictator was reportedly injected with various painkillers, sedatives, strychnine, cocaine, a morphine derivative, and other drugs during the entire four years of World War II. The mystical philosophy so eagerly adopted by the young Hitler was the same one which had already deeply affected the Kaiser and other German leaders. In fact, Houston Stuart Chamberlain, the mystic who had so influenced the Kaiser, years later declared Hitler to be the prophesied German Messiah. On September 25, 1925, the Nazi newspaper Volkscher Babenbacher celebrated Chamberlain's 70th birthday and declared his work, Foundations of the 20th Century, to be, quote, the gospel of the Nazi movement. As we recall, the Kaiser considered the same book to have been sent by God. Hitler's road to politics began as a German soldier during World War I. When that war broke out, Hitler enlisted. 
He remained very concerned about the mystical destiny of Germany and continued to ponder the Aryan question while fighting in the fields. This made him very unpopular with his fellow soldiers who were more concerned with the food, leave women, and an end to the war, which nearly all of them detested. Hitler, on the other hand, flourished in the war-torn environment and distinguished himself as a soldier. He won the highest award of a soldier of his rank, corporal, and uh, he won the Iron Cross first class. About two months after winning the Iron Cross, Hitler was blinded by mustard gas during a battle. He was taken to the Pacewalk Military Hospital in northern Germany, where he was mistakenly diagnosed as suffering from psychopathic hysteria. Hitler was consequently placed under the care of a psychiatrist, Dr. Edmund Forrester. What exactly was done to Hitler while under Dr. Forrester's care is uncertain because years later, in 1933, Hitler's secret police, the Gestapo, rounded up all psychiatric records related to Hitler's treatment and destroyed them. Dr. Forrester allegedly committed suicide in that same year. Yeah, imagine that. The mystery of what was done to Hitler at Pacewalk is deepened by Hitler's own statements. According to Hitler, he had experienced a vision from another world while at the hospital. In that vision, Hitler was told that he would need to restore his sight so that he could lead Germany back to glory. Hitler's latent anti-Semitism, which had already been planted by his mystical readings in Vienna, emerged at Pacewalk. What did happen at that hospital? <clears throat> in a shrewd piece of detective work published in the journal History of Childhood Quarterly, psycho-historian Dr. Rudolf Binion suggests that Hitler's visions may have been deliberately induced by the psychiatrist. Oh, imagine that. Edmund Forrester, as a means of helping Hitler recover from his blindness, Hitler's mystical beliefs were well known, and they would certainly have come out in his psychiatric interviews. Dr. Binion cites a book completed in 1939 entitled Der Oschenzog, The Eyewitness, written by a Jewish doctor named Ernest Weiss, who had fled Germany in 1933. In the book, the author tells a thinly fictionalized story of a man, A.H., Adolf Hitler, who was taken to Pacewalk Hospital for psychiatric care. A.H. claims that he had been hit by mustard gas. At Pacewalk, the psychiatrist in charge deliberately induces visionary ideas into the mind of the hysterical A.H. in order to effect a cure. The miracle cure is successful in years later in the summer of 1933. The psychiatrist attempts to send the records of the treatments abroad to keep them out of the hands of the Gestapo. In the article, Dr. Binion points out that Hitler's psychiatrist, Edmund Forrester, had been abroad in Paris that summer, and it is Dr. Binion's guess that Forrester may have revealed the facts of Hitler's treatment to someone at that time, resulting in the book Der Oschenzog. Forrester may also have been the person who revealed that two other very high-ranking high Nazis, Bernhard Rust and Hermann Goering, both had histories of severe mental problems. Rust was a certified psychopath, and Goering was a former morphine addict. After Hitler's discharge from Pace Walk in November of 1918, he traveled back to Munich, and he remained in the Army, and in April of 1919, he was assigned to espionage duties. A communist revolution had just occurred in southern Germany, and a Soviet republic had been declared there after the regional government collapsed. Hitler was one of the soldier spies selected to remain behind in Munich and circulate among the pro-communist soldiers to learn the identities of their leaders. When a German reservoir force from Berlin moved in and crushed the rebellion, Hitler walked down the ranks of captured soldiers and singled out the ringleaders. The German soldiers who were identified by Hitler were taken away for immediate execution without trial. Hitler watched as many of his victims were put before the wall and shot. Hitler's stellar performance in Munich earned him a promotion. He was assigned to the highly secret political department of the Army District Command. Hitler's new unit was an intelligence operation that engaged in acts of domestic terrorism. The Reichstag, right? The unit refused to accept, accept Germany's defeat in World War I, and so it assassinated some of the German leaders who had negotiated Germany's surrender. A prominent leader of the District Command was Captain Ernst Rome. Rome was a professional soldier who had served as liaison between the district command and the German industrialists who were directing, directly funding the district command to help it fight communism. Captain Rome and many other members of the district command were members of a mystical organization known as the Thule Society or the Thule Society. 
the Thule believed in the Aryan super race, and it preached the coming of a German messiah who would lead Germany to glory and a new Aryan civilization. In Spear of Destiny, we learn from Dr. Stein that the Thule group was financed by some of the very same industrialists who supported the district command. The Thule was also directly supported by the German high command. Many assassinations perpetrated by the district command may have been inspired by the Thule Society. According to Dr. Stein, that it was a society of assassins. It held secret courts and condemned people to death. It is likely that many victims murdered by the district command had been condemned earlier in the secret courts of the Thule. Many prominent Germans supported this violence and were documented members of the Thule. For example, the police president of Munich, Franz Gertner was a reported member of the innermost circle of the Thule, and he later became Minister of Justice of the Third Reich. After joining the district command, corporate, Corporal Adolf Hitler became a good friend of Ernst Rome. It was Rome who took Hitler to see Dietrich Eckhart, a morphine addict who headed the German Thule Society, and Rome had a purpose for arranging this meeting. He felt that Hitler had strong leadership potential and that Hitler was the man that the society was looking for. Eckhart agreed and Hitler's career as the new German messiah was launched. The vehicle used by Hitler to gain political power was a small socialist organization known as the German Workers' Party. In September 1919, Hitler was sent by the district command to attend a meeting of the party. Hitler was subsequently invited by the party to join it, and within a year, he became the party's leader. At a 1920 party rally held in Munich in a Munich beer hall, Hitler announced that the German Workers' Party was to be renamed the National Socialist Deutsche Antibiete Party, or the Nazi Party for short. In Mein Kampf, Hitler stated that he had made an agonizing decision to quit the di district command in order to participate in the German Workers' Party. Many historians strongly doubt that Hitler had left the district command and believe instead that the German Workers' Party was the vehicle used by the district command to covertly further its own political aims. There is good evidence to support this conclusion. Ernst Röhm, Hitler's mentor in the district command, was already joined and started shaping the German Workers' Party before Hitler became a member. Röhm greatly assisted Hitler in transforming the German Workers' Party into Hitler's political tool. Rome grew with the fledgling Nazi party and later became a leader of the Nazi SA organization, better known as the Brown Shirts. Through a leader, Dietrich Eckhart, who was also closely affiliated with the district command leaders, became the editor-in-chief of the new Nazi newspaper. And Hitler by, had by no means abandoned his district command friends. They were all there in turning the German Workers' Party into the Nazi party. Although the Thule Society was probably the most important mystical organization behind the formation of Nazism, it was not the only one. Another was the Vril Society, which had been named after a book by Lord Bulward Lytton, an English Rosicrucian. Lytton's book told the story of an Aryan super race coming to Earth. One member of the German Vril was Professor Karl Hoff, uh, Haushofer a former employee of German military intelligence. Haushofer had been a mentor to Hitler, as well as to Hitler's propaganda specialist, Rudolf Hess. Another real member uh, was the second most powerful man in Nazi Germany, Heinrich Himmler. Heinrich Himmler became head of the dreaded SS and Gestapo. He incorporated the Vril Society into the Nazi occult bureau, and yet another mystical group was also the Edelweiss Society, which preached the coming of a Nordic messiah. Nazi financial director Hermann Goering had become an active member of the Edelweiss Society in 1921 while living and working in Sweden. Goering believed Hitler to be the Nordic Messiah. Nazism was clearly more than a political movement. It was a powerful new brotherhood faction steeped in brotherhood beliefs and symbols. The emblem chosen to represent the Nazi party was the swastika an important brotherhood symbol since antiquity. Hitler was proclaimed not only a political messiah, but also a religious messiah whose coming signaled the fulfillment of the apocalyptic philosophies espoused by German mystical groups. Hitler's coming was to bring about the thousand-year Reich, a millennium in which mankind would be purified and reach its highest state of existence. 
Nazism was a custodial religious philosophy as much as it was a political ideology. In a speech he gave at the Nazis' 1934 Nuremberg rally, Hitler said about the party, quote, its total image, however, uh, will be like a holy, or, a holy order. Its total image, however, will be like a total, will be like a holy order. So, I mean, he envisioned the Nazi party as a, as, you know, sort of a, a, you know, like the Jesuits or anything else, a holy order, the Templars. The brutal Nazi party as a holy order? The idea seems laughable in hindsight until we note that this would not be the first time in history that a holy order was responsible for massive atrocities. The Dominicans who ran the Catholic Inquisition during the Middle Ages were another example. World War II lasted from 1939 until 1945. It took a terrible toll on human life. Much of that toll is the result of the Nazis' most horrific accomplishment. A massive German concentration camp system in which 11 million people died, um, 6 million of the victims were Jews. By that time in history, concentration camps had become quite the fashion, beginning with the British in Africa, continuing with the Bolsheviks in Russia, and the American internment of Japanese Americans in World War II and singing to their lowest levels of barbar bar barbarity in Nazi Germany. Most people know the Nazi concentration camps for their gas chambers, grisly human experiments, and the deliberate starvation of inmates. The camps were a part of the Nazi so-called final solution. The final solution was not just to an attempt to racially purify the human race by physically exterminating all Jews and other undesirables. It was an effort to kill them in accordance with a grand economic plan. As in Russia, the Nazi concentration camps were designed to be a vital part of the national economy. More than 300 camps were constructed in Germany alone. Many of them were located near large factories specially designed to be run, ran on slave labor provided by the camps. The infamous Auschwitz camp, for example, was constructed next to an enormous industrial plant for processing and refining oil and rubber. The intent of the final solution was to destroy... Here, there we go. All right, give me just a second here. There we go. I knew something was wonky was going on. Something was weird going on with my microphone. Sorry about that. Looks like we got it fixed here. Weird stuff. Hadn't used this stuff in a couple of weeks, so you know how that is. Oh, all right. Let me see where I left off here. Um. The intent of the Nazis' final solution was to destroy non-human Aryans, which the Nazis thought of as human mutations. Um, and this goes on to talk about, now I'm not going to get into the uh, stuff like lampshades and all that stuff that's been proven hoaxes, and I'm not going to, you know, uh, I mean, you know, I don't know. I know he wasn't trying to make it that kind of book, but it just, I don't know. It just bugs me when I see all these, you know, uh, I'm not one of those people that doesn't believe that the, the, the Holocaust never happened, but certainly the numbers were inflated and there was some chicanery stuff going on there. It's a, that, that, that really is true. Uh, but regardless of all that, people still did die. But, you know, I don't know. He just, he seems to be towing the line here, the official story on that. And that, you know, um, it's important to note that, uh, you know, the same people that we're talking about here, you had Jews killing Jews, you know, Ashkenazis, Sephard, killing Sephardics. But my, my, my point is, is that, you know, that, that, the whole, that whole setup, that whole lie is coming from these same custodians that, that he's talking about here. So, you know, for the sake of that, why not just come out with that? You know what I mean? It's kind of, I don't know. Anyway, let's continue on. Um, 
The Nazi concentration camp system reduced human beings quite literally to the level of livestock. Yeah, that's the whole that's their that, that's the whole modus operandi. Yeah, livestock. That's what they that's that's what they reduced uh, all of us to. I mean, it hasn't stopped. You know, the concentration camp is now the suburbs. I mean, this is the truth. We're there now. Most of the concentration camp factories were operated by the giant German chemical combine IG Farben. In fact, one of Farben's subsidiaries manufactured the poison gas used in concentration camp gas chambers. A remarkable book, The Crime and Punishment of IG Farben by Joseph Borkin, documents how the Farben companies, in cooperation with the Nazi SS, ran the concentration camps and adjacent factories as a business enterprise. Mr. Borkin's book reproduces, reproduces a settlement of accounts made between IG Farman and the SS for the work of concentration camp inmates. The receipt is a neatly handwritten slave labor rates placed in a very businesslike fashion. When the war ended, all 24 top executives of IG Farman were also taught with a special emphasis on the occult meanings of the swastika. Hitler dreamed that the SS would build the foundation of the new Aryan utopia. Those that were it, it admitted members of the SS were charged with crimes against humanity at the Nuremberg trials. The German sub, 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 uh, subsidiaries of ITT and General Electric, um, as had been the true earlier, as had been true earlier, the district command. This direct funding enabled the SS to act outside the purse strings of the larger National Party. It also permitted the industrialists to have a more direct influence into SS activities. Nazism and all of its atrocities could never have happened without the support of the German banking fraternity. Banking, industry, and government were as tightly interwoven in Nazi Germany as they are in nearly every nation today. In Germany, many bankers held management positions in other companies, not the least of which was IG Farben. For example, Max and Paul War Warburg who ran major banks in Germany and the United States and also were Jews. Let me make sure I make sure and let you know that Paul Warburg is a Jew. I remember one time I had Jim Mars on and uh, some cock smoker on RBN uh, was calling me a shill because every time I said uh, Paul Warburg's name, I didn't point out that he's a Jew. I mean, you don't know Paul Warburg's a Jew. There's not much I can do for you, bud. You know, give me a fucking break. In Germany, many bankers held management positions in other companies, not the least of which was IG Farben. For example, Max and Paul Warburg, who ran major banks in Germany and the United States, and who incidentally had been instrumental in establishing the Federal Reserve System in the United States, were IG Farben directors. H.A. Metz of IG Farben was a director of the Bank of Manhattan, which was a Warburg bank in the United States that later became part of the Chase Manhattan Bank managed by the Rockefeller family. One director of the American IG Farben was C.E. Mitchell, who was also a director of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and National City Bank. Most significantly, of uh, Hermann Schmitz, president of IG Farben in Germany, had served on the boards of the Deutsche Bank and the Bank of International Settlements. As we recall, the Bank for International Settlements was the apex of the international central banking community and the interlocking inflatable paper money systems. Schmitz was one of the few IG Farben executives sentenced to a prison term in Nuremberg. He received a 10-year sentence. Perhaps the most surprising support for Hitler in the international banking fraternity came from the director of the Bank of England, Montague Norman. England, of course, was an enemy of Nazi Germany during World War II. According to Dr. Quigley's book, Tragedy and Hope, Mr. Norman was the commander-in-chief of the world system. Uh, commander-in-chief of the world system of banking control during his governorship of the Bank of England from 1920 until 1944, said Dr. Quigley. Many wealthy and influential persons like Montague Norman and Henry Detering, owner of Shell Oil, directed public attention to the danger of Bolshevism while maintaining a neutral or favorable attitude towards Nazism. Montague Norman apparently felt more than 
Mere neutrality towards Nazism, however, according to a Chicago newspaper story dated November 3rd, 1938. The Bank of England continued to support Hitler even after the Nazi director embarked on his program of conquest. After Hitler invaded Czechoslovakia in violation of the Non-Aggression Act Pact between then Prime Minister Chamberlain of England and Hitler, the Bank of England gave Nazi Germany six million pounds of Czech gold reserves held by the bank. In the same way, the small clique of German petty princes had made a fortune from, war, from the war in the 18th century by renting soldiers to warring nations, a small clique of banks and multinational corporations made large profits from providing goods and services to both sides of the fighting in World War II. After giving early support to Hitler, the Bank of England naturally provided loans to Britain to fight Hitler. At the same time that the German subsidiaries of ITT and General Electric were giving money to the SS and providing needs to uh, needed services to Nazi Germany, other branches in America and elsewhere were aiding Germany's enemies. As IG Farben fueled Hitler's war machine in Germany, one of its old cartel partners, Standard Oil, fueled the Allied effort against Germany. While the Ford Motor Company provided materials for the American army to fight Germany, Ford plants in Germany were turning out military vehicles for the Nazis. No matter who won the war, those banks and companies would profit and find favor with whoever emerged victorious. The overwhelming role that various bankers and industrialists played in propping up Hitler and in building the Nazi war machine has caused some historians to view those bankers and industrialists as the true powers behind the Nazism. They were indeed highly significant, but were they actually the ultimate sources that gave us Nazism? As we have already noted, Nazism arose out of the mystical brotherhood network. Some researchers have erroneously concluded that radical brotherhood organizations have been the tools of political, military, and economic leaders rather than vice versa. This mistake is usually made because few historians have dared consider that the brotherhood network has been senior in power and influence to human elites. Once that influence is acknowledged, one must then ask, who is the power behind the brotherhood? We have, of course, already answered that question in a manner of uh, unacceptable to a great many people, uh, members of an extraterrestrial race, i.e. the custodial society. Once we begin to take such an extraordinary possibility seriously, we must return our gaze to the pages of history for confirmation. In this case, to Nazi Germany, when we do so, we discover something quite remarkable. The Nazis themselves claimed that an extraterrestrial society was the source of their ideology and the power behind their organization. Throughout history, brother organizations have been pledging ultimate loyalty to assorted gods, angels, cosmic beings, ascended masters from other planets, and similar non-terrestrials, nearly all of which appear to be custodians disguised by veils of myth. The Thule Society and Nazi mysticism itself also claimed that its true leadership came from extraterrestrial sources. The Nazis referred to their hidden extraterrestrial masters as underground supermen. Hitler believed in the supermen and claimed that he had once met one of them, as did other members of the Thule leadership. The Nazis said that their supermen lived beneath the Earth's surface and were the creators of the Aryan race. Aryans therefore constituted the world's only pure race, and all other people were viewed as genetic mutations. The Nazis planned to repurify humanity by murdering everyone who was not Aryan. Top Nazi leaders believed that the underground Superman would return to the surface of the earth to rule it as soon as the Nazis began their racial purification program and established the Thousand Year Reich. These Nazi beliefs are very similar to other custodial religions, which teach people to prepare for the future return of supernatural or superhuman beings who will reign over a utopian earth. As in other custodial religions, the coming of the Nazi supermen would coincide with a great final divine judgment or the divine judgment that Hitler had declared in court during his early Nazi days. 
it would be seen it would seem then that the Nazi supermen were not extraterrestrials at all but were earthly in origin because they allegedly hailed from beneath our planet's surface. Yes, inner earth dwellers. That's what we're talking about here. However, Hitler and his mystical compatriots had a curiously inverted view of the universe. To their way of thinking, the universe consists of infinite rock, which is broken by numerous hollow areas. In other words, the universe is alike an infinite piece of Swiss cheese, solid with many holes in it. The concave surfaces of the hollow areas are the surfaces of the planets, including Earth. Humans are therefore not living on the outer surface of a round ball. They are being pushed by gravity against the inner surface of a hollow area. According to the Nazis, the sun hangs suspended in the middle of the, of the hollow area. The sky is made of blue gas, and the stars are tiny objects, perhaps ice crystals, which hang suspended in a similar fashion to the sun. In this infinite Swiss cheese universe of stone, there are many fissures and cracks that allow travel between the hollow areas. In an adjoining hollow area, according to Nazism, lives the race of Aryan supermen. Hitler's underground supermen were therefore true extraterrestrials, but in a curiously inverted fashion. Lest it be assumed that the Nazi Swiss cheese model of the universe was one of Hitler's big lies. There is evidence that the Nazi leadership took the idea quite seriously. For example, an attempt was made to locate the British fleet during World War II with infrared rays pointing towards the sky. The Nazis believed that the rays would hit the opposite side of the concave Earth. If for no other reason, we can be glad that the Nazis lost the war, that's so we were spared their astronomy lessons. It is unfortunate that the Nazi defeat and reported deaths of Adolf Hitler and Heinrich Himmler did not end Nazi influence in the world. After World War II, Nazis participated in many important spheres. It is unfortunate that the Nazi activity. defeat and reported deaths of Adolf Hitler and Heinrich Himmler did not end Nazi influence in the world. After World War II, Nazis participated in, his, in many important spheres of activity. The American Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA, accepted the offer of Reinhard Gellin, the chief of Russian intelligence operations in the Nazi Secret Service, to help build the American intelligence network in Europe after the war. Gellin's organization was staffed by many former SS members. The Gellin organization became a significant element of the CIA in Western Europe, and it also provided the foundation for the intelligence apparatus of modern West Germany. The CIA also extracted information about Nazi psychiatric techniques from Nuremberg war crime trial records for use in the CIA's infamous mind control experiments decades later. Interpol, the private international police organization which is supposed to combat international criminals and drug traffickers, was headed by former Nazi SS officers several times up until 1972. This is not surprising when we consider that Interpol was controlled by the Nazis during World War II. Prince Bernhard of the House of Orange in the Netherlands had been a member of the SS before the war, followed by a stint as an employee of IG Farben. He then married into the House of Orange and assumed his position as chairman of Shell Oil. Prince Bernhard founded the international Bilderberg meetings, which are still held every year. Yeah, 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 for some reason, Alex Jones always leaves that out. He doesn't want you to know Bernhard was Knights of Malta because that you know pins down people like Pat Buchanan and these other clowns he associates with. The Bilderberg meetings are meant to be informal get-togethers of the world's top bankers, industrialists, political figures, and other prominent people for the purpose of discussing world conditions and reaching an occasional informal consensus. Prince Bernhard personally chaired these meetings until 1976 when a corruption scandal forced him to resign. Imagine that. To younger people today, World War II is an episode from the distant past, much as World War I is ancient history to people in their 30s and 40s. The conflict most young people understand now is the former Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union. World War II did much to set the stage for that confrontation. During World War II, Russia was an ally of the United States, Great Britain and France in the war against Nazi Germany. Russian troops fought against the Germans in many of the Balkan nations which bordered Russia. In the ensuing instability, Communist movements gained considerable power in those Balkan countries, and Russian troops remained there after the Germans were defeated. The Allies were not about to prolong the war by turning against the Soviet Union, and so the Communist Eastern Bloc was born. 
The Nazi experience is an extraordinarily important one because it happened within the lifetime of a great many people living today. Incredibly, Nazi groups have been revived in America, Germany, and other nations. It's hard to imagine that anyone would join a movement of such proven madness, yet it is happening. The German Nazi experience revealed to us that the world is still being pushed into war, ignorance, and repeated genocides in the same manner that it has been for thousands of years by a mystical network of organizations pledging ultimate loyal, lo loyalty to an extraterrestrial race. And it's just very hard to argue with that anymore with the evidence, isn't it, folks? The Nazi experience revealed, again, a key channel through which Brotherhood Network influence has been exerted, namely through a community of national intelligence organizations who activities, whose activities are kept secret by law and whose activities are often outside of the law. Nazism was but another brutal faction set up in opposition to so many other factions which arose out of the Brotherhood Network. This helped guarantee more war, more suffering, and the continued imprisonment of mankind on a small planet behind walls of ignorance. In Nazism, we saw all the elements that we have looked at in this book come together. The Brotherhood Network, apolo uh, apoc apocalypticism, paper money banking elite, genocide, an extraterrestrial race, worship as gods and owners of Earth. Nazism should have happened 2,000 years ago but it occurred only decades ago. All of the history we have looked at in this book may still be happening today, and I would say that uh, absolutely 100%, my research says it is. Never has stopped. These closing observations require us to look once again at the UFO phenomenon itself. If we uh, hypothesize that human society is still being manipulated by a custodial, custodial society in the same manner that it was thousands of years ago, then we must determine that UFOs continue to behave now as they did in the distant past. Two questions we might pose to make this determination are this. Are UFOs still spreading the same corrupted brotherhood mysticism today as they did earlier in history? All the, are they still implanting the false idea that they are God? If we are to believe the testimony of recent UFO abductees, the answer to both queries is yes. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of Chapter 36. So let's, uh, let's continue on here tonight. Chapter 37, Modern Ezekiel's. UFO abduction cases tend to follow a distinct pattern. A human being is involuntarily taken aboard a UFO, is given a comprehensive physical examination, and is then released. An abductee's memory of the event is usually buried because of apparent mental tampering by the alien captors. Some researchers compare these abduction cases to human biologists who tranquilize wild animals, inspect them, and then release their creatures back into nature. Many recent UFO abduction cases have another reoccurring characteristic of great significance. Dr. Thomas E. Bullard of Indiana University, whose words appear in the MUFON UFO Journal dated February 1988, had this to say after conducting his own studies into the abduction phenomenon. The commonest sequel to the examination of a human abductee by UFO occupants is a conference, a more or less formal period of conversation between the witness and his captors. Warnings that certain human behaviors are dangerous and prophecies of coming events are also common. The prophecies usually predict coming disasters and even apocalyptic changes on Earth, events the aliens or an enlightened witness may mitigate. The documented cases reviewed by Dr. Bullard provide fascinating evidence that custodians continue to spread the same apocalyptic message today that they have been implanting for thousands of years. Conversely, these modern cases add weight to the historical evidence that many ancient apocalyptic messages, such as those found in the Bible, did indeed come from the same extraterrestrial sources. Dr. Bullard's findings suggest that custodians are still being highly manipulative by, in effect, saying, quote, you humans are all behaving badly, although we are not going to tell you that uh, we might be the ones you are, who are stirring you up. 
and there will be catastrophe. Fear not, however, for we angelic souls will save you. Look to us and to our appointed messengers for your salvation. It is straight out of Machiavelli. UFO occupants still come right out today and imply that they are God. One abduction episode in which this occurred involved a woman named Betty Ann Andreessen, whose well-documented and exhaustively researched experience was the subject of an intriguing book entitled The Andreessen Affair by Raymond Fowler. Mrs. Andreessen's abduction occurred on January 25, 1967. Later, while under hypnosis, Mrs. Andreessen recalled that she had been kidnapped out of her home and was taken aboard an apparent alien aircraft and flown to an unknown location where she was led through what seemed to be a number of unusual red and green underground passages within some sort of city. Well, see, that would lead me to believe that she was taken into inner Earth, and I think there's starting to become more evidence that these extraterrestrials are coming from inside of the Earth, not from outer space. Mrs. Andreessen then had an experience which makes her story unbelievable to many people, but to us it is the experience which may give her story the most credence. According to Mrs. Andreessen, her abductors took her to a special room. There she underwent what her investigators described as the most painful and emotional segment of her total experience. In the room, Mrs. Andreessen saw a large bird about 15 feet in height. The bird resembled an eagle, but it had a longer neck. It was, in fact, a replica of a phoenix, and it had the illusion of being alive. As Mrs. Andreessen stood and watched it, the phoenix began to undergo a transformation. Mrs. Andreessen felt an intense heat so powerful that she cried out in pain during her hypnosis session while recounting the incident. The strange alien room abruptly cooled off. Where the great bird had stood, there now burned a small fire. The fire died down to a pile of gray ash with a few red embers. As the pile continued to cool, Betty saw something in the ashes. Now it looks like a worm, she recalled under hypnosis, a big fat worm. It just looks like a big fat worm, a big gray worm just lying there. What Mrs. Andreessen had witnessed was a reenactment of the legend of the phoenix, clearly staged for her benefit. The phoenix, as we recall, is a brotherhood symbol which has been used to promote apocalypticism and justify endless human suffering. Although Mrs. Andreessen's vision of the phoenix constituted only a small portion of her total abduction experience, the investigators concluded, quote, it is only too obvious that the aliens had brought Betty to the bird as the focal point of her whole experience. It seemed to be the purpose for her travel though, through the red and green spaces. Mrs. Andreessen testified under hypnosis that after being implanted with this mystical vision, the following conversation ensued between her and her captors. They called my name and repeated it again in a louder voice. I said, no, I don't understand what this, all, this is all about. Why am I even here? And they, whatever it was, said that I have chosen you. For what have you chosen me, Betty asked. I have chosen you to show the world. Are you God, Betty asked. Are you the Lord God? I shall show you as your time goes by. At the time of her abduction, Mrs. Andreessen was already a Christian. As a result of her experience, she began to include UFOs in her own Christian apocalyptic belief system. Researcher Raymond Fowler probed those beliefs. Raymond Fowler said, have the UFOs anything to do with what we call the second coming of Christ? And Betty said, they definitely do. When is this going to occur? It is not for them to tell you, Raymond Fowler. Uh, do they know? They know the master is getting ready and very close. If real, Betty Andreessen's experience was a remarkable one. It would indicate that she was but one in a very long line of reluctant prophets, forcibly implanted with an apocalyptic religious message by members of the custodial society. Like the Ezekiels who preceded her in history, Betty Andreessen's testimony suggests that she suffered considerable mental tampering at the hands of her abductors. This tampering may account for some of the unusual perceptual phenomenon she experienced during her abduction episode. Unlike past Ezekiels, however, Mrs. Andreessen's vision will probably not be added to the Bible 
nor will it cause her to rally an army and embark on a campaign of religious conquest. Her courageous testimony will simply offer the world additional evidence that the 20th century has not seen a change in the methods by which a custodial race appears to maintain a hold on the human race. Does Mrs. Andreessen's experience mean that human society will be required to undergo yet another end-of-the-world episode? The political, social, and economic structure of the world certainly makes it all possible. The Brotherhood Network is alive and active, as are the many institutions it created. They may well bring to our world yet another senseless final battle. Man, oh, man, oh, man. Good stuff there. I uh, couldn't agree more with a lot of stuff in that, Jeb. That's, that, that is indeed what they're doing. And that's, you know, um, the, the, the CMP research and stuff that I've done and I'm working on these films has just it has shown me that more and more. And this book really confirmed that. But there, there's just no question that that's who these guys are working for. That's why you've heard on Alex Jones' show for years, you know, don't talk about extraterrestrials, don't look into that stuff, you know, concentrate on the bankers and stuff. They're trying to get you to not really find out who they're working for, how deep this is, and who really is in control. You know, I mean, you can go all the way up, up to the priest class up top, but you've got a whole other level of control that's controlling them and pulling those strings, and those may or may not necessarily be here right on this earth. Imperative, imperative information uh, that everybody understands. I continue to, to enjoy reading this book and feel like I'm uh, learning more and more and more loose ends are being tied up, and it's really bringing a lot of the information I already had, uh, making it sharper, you know, putting a nice edge on it. That's the end of Chapter 37. The next chapter that we'll get into tomorrow is going to be Chapter 38. That's entitled The New Eden. So that's going to be a very uh, interesting chapter in light of the, the things we've just talked about with the Nazis and then now with uh, abductions and these the, the 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 custodians. Unbelievable stuff, man! And and you really you really start to see the the uh, fingerprints and the footprints of these quote unquote custodians in just about everything and everywhere you look in everyday life now. Um, once you become aware of it, I've noticed that more. It's strange, you know. I got to tell you, man, for, from, from my experience, there is no, there, you can never be too awake. I mean, write that one down, put it on the board, whatever you want to do. But what I mean is, you know, you don't just wake up to all this stuff and then that's it, you're done. You know, it, it never stops. And you can always be more awake to this stuff than you are right now. You know, and again, it doesn't require you to, to join a club or a group or a gang or trying to fit into some social construct. You can still be you and live in your own little weird little world, but you can still find out what's really going on and gain a newer understanding and a greater understanding of it every day and constantly have your mind blown and learn more um, and still be an individual. That's, I think, what is, is really going to be the, the nexus point of changing things. When people realize that they can be an, a true individual without a group, and that we can all do that and spread throughout the world, and we can have peace through that. That's that. That's the real secret. I think that's going to be the real linchpin when we as a whole, as a people throughout the world, finally figure that out. Let's get into Chapter 38 tonight, The New Eden by William Bramley in his book, The Gods of Eden, here for you. <coughs> All right, here we go. The New Eden, Chapter 38. A new Eden is being built today, or perhaps it is merely a new face being put on the old Eden. Today's Eden is characterized by sterile architecture and stylistic homogeneity. Inhabitants of modern Eden are offered many ways to cope with the stresses of living in Eden. Among them are drugs that promise to change or control nearly every negative human attribute and every positive one, too. The new Edenites are taught philosophies which promise a materialist utopia within a spiritual wasteland. Despite all of these advances, Edenites still commit suicide at a very surprisingly high rate. Tragically, a great many suicide victims are young people. What are some of those victims telling us? Perhaps it is that today's Eden is still Eden. 
a gilded cage, a pampered prison. Many young people sense it and rebel by changing clothings or hairstyle, but they find that what they are still trapped in is not really understanding how or why. Like Adam and Eve, many individuals, no matter how successful or pampered they have been in life, find that they want to escape. Today's Eden continues to be strongly influenced by the Brotherhood Network and its outgrowths. Any discussion of the Brotherhood in today's world is, however, a delicate matter. We are no longer talking about people and groups that reside comfortably in the past, but we must now confront people and organizations that are very much a part of today's world. Please allow me to therefore reiterate two very important points. The vast majority of people who join movements and organizations do so for the right reasons, including those who join brotherhood branches and custodial religions. They have heard a bit about of, a bit of truth, and they have seen a solution to a genuine problem. They work in those organizations to disseminate that truth, truth or to solve that problem. As has been true throughout all of history, almost none of them, including most of their top leaders, are knowingly engaged in Machiavellian activity. That's a good point. We have to understand that about a lot of these groups. They know only that they have been given a just cause to pursue against some other human group, unaware that somewhere else, in similar organizations, other people have been given a just cause to pursue against them. The corruption within the Brotherhood Network and the violence emanating from it are as upsetting to them as they are to everyone else. Number two, my purpose is correction, not condemnation. There are no saints on earth and probably nowhere else for that matter. Yes, there are a great many very fine people who deserve to be helped, but there is probably no being on earth who has not at some point in some way contributed to what we have discussed here in this book. To engage in blame, punishment, or recrimination at this stage of the game can only make affairs worse. I hope to encourage the idea that no matter what we have done in the past, it is the present and future that truly count. My purpose in writing this book is only to ask that we take a moment's pause to step back and look at what we may be all caught up in. Perhaps each of us can then carefully determine what we need to do or stop doing to bring about the changes required to set things straight without disrupting our lives or cherished institutions. What is needed now from everyone is cooperation, not recrimination. As we survey the modern organizations and religions which arose out of brotherhood networks, we discover something rather ironic. As the world continues its intellectual flirtation with materialism, brotherhood organizations and custodial religions are among the few sources which keep alive any idea that man might be a spiritual being. As a result, many brotherhood organizations and custodial religions attract some very fine people with whom the spiritual spark has not died. It is difficult to find a Jesuit father, an American Freemason, a Presbyterian minister, or a Jewish rabbi who is not a very decent person. The overwhelming majority of them emphasize the truly benign and uplifting aspects of their theologies. It is equally difficult to not feel good as at a Catholic Mass on Christmas Eve or to be stimulated by a conversation with an articulate Rosicrucian about the meaning of life. It is equally impossible not to appreciate the smile of a young child basking in the warmth of a successful family unit held together by the Hebrew religion or to savor the aesthetics of the exceptional Hindu artwork. Children and elderly people are helped every day through the kind work of Freemasons, Oddfellows, and Shriners. Fascinating political discussions can be had with an avowed Marxist, and one can learn some of the most astonishing facts from a dyed-in-the-wool right-winger. Nevertheless, most of the institutions that arose out of the Brotherhood Network continue to cause serious problems today. In this book, we look closely at the inflatable paper money system. In the United States today, over 75% of the money supply is created by commercial banks. When you deposit a dollar in a commercial bank, that dollar becomes the banks to lend out. 
and the bank creates an additional dollar, which becomes the dollar in your bank account. That dollar in your bank account, however, is not a guaranteed dollar. It is simply a debt owned by the bank to you. That debt, however, quickly turns into money because you can spend it right away, and the bank still has your original dollar. In this way, the bank has created money out of nothing. Banks make most of their profit by being allowed to create money in this fashion. The interest banks charge on loans merely pays some of the administrative expenses, and more importantly, it compensates for the inflation that the banks inevitably cause by creating money in the manner that they do. Yeah, I saw a news article today said they're, you know, going to print more dollars. Well, that's just what we need, more cheap money, right? There are, of course, legally mandated limits to how many dollars a bank can create. Yeah, they don't give a fuck about that. Come on, Bramley. A commercial bank must maintain a minimum base of cash for every dollar deposited, but it is only a small percentage. As long as people use their checking accounts and do not demand too much actual cash, a bank will be safe. A bank can go broke, however, if enough of its loans default or if too many depositors demand actual cash and thereby wipe out a bank's small asset base. The result of this whole system is massive debt at every level of society today. The banks are in debt to the depositors, and the depositors' money is loaned out and creates indebtedness to the banks. Making this system even more akin to something out of a maniac's delirium is the fact that the banks, like other lenders, often have the right to seize physical property if its paper money is not repaid. At the national and international levels, we read today of third world nations staggering under huge debts. Most of those debts are illusionary in the sense that the bulk of the loans came from banks which generate or channel created out of nothing money. Some of those banks, such as some represented by the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, have the right to dictate economic policies and demand austerity measures within the indebted nations to get the loans repaid. In Brazil, for example, the IMF imposed austerity measures in the early 1980s. The measures included large-scale wage cuts for Brazilian workers, higher prices on all goods, devaluation of the currency, and increased exports, all to pay back a debt founded mainly on illusion. The result was a tremendous drop in the well-being of the Brazilian people and riots. The destruction of Brazilian rainforests that we are witnessing today is being caused in large part by Brazil's need to repay loans based on illusionary money. Studies prepared by the World Bank blame population growth for depletion of the rainforest, but conveniently leave out the major role that the World Bank itself has played in causing Brazilians, Brazil's indebtedness. Another example is the Dominican Republic, which had a $3 billion debt as of the mid-1980s. The country would like to spend its scarce income on better housing for its people. In 1985, however, the nation was faced with having to expend more money to repay its loans than it could earn in foreign currency. The IMF nevertheless demanded strict austerity measures, including large price increases on basic goods, thereby triggering riots. The IMF also mandated a devaluation of the Dominican currency. This increased exports but made imports much more expensive. Who were the real losers in all of this? The Dominican people. In the United States, under the recent presidential administration of Ronald Reagan, the American national debt was doubled. Most of the loan money, of course, traces back to the created out of nothing money of large banks. Nevertheless, interest on this money must now be paid. To pay it, federal social services were cut under Reagan, thereby hurting the standard of living for many Americans. What? was much of this extra loan money used for? Military needs. On a smaller scale, the inflatable paper money system causes farmers to lose farms. Most farmers do not lose their way of life because they fail to work hard or because they do not produce something of great value. They lose because they cannot meet the demands of the paper money system. This allows large agribusiness to step in and buy up the farmland, resulting in the concentration of food production in an ever-dwindling number of hands. As we can see, the modern monetary system has had the effect of destroying many benefits that mass production and advances in science and technology would have offered the human race. By now, the need for all-consuming toil for physical existence should be largely ended, but the inflatable paper money system has helped to preserve that need by creating massive debt chronic inflation, and general economic instability. 
The vast majority of people in all nations today must still continue to spend the major portion of their prime waking hours working to meet their financial needs. The custodial goal expressed in the biblical Adam and Eve story of making people toil from birth until death is still being fulfilled. Another significant byproduct of the modern money system is taxation. Most Americans believe that the U.S. government creates its own money. If that is true, then why would the government need to tax anyone? Why does not the government simply allocate to itself the money it needs to operate? That would obviously be far more sensible than erecting enormous tax-collecting bureaucracies, which can drive people to despair and greatly diminish productivity. The answer is that the U.S. government does not create money. The Federal Reserve and the commercial banks do, and they are not public entities. To obtain some of the money these banking elite entities create, the government must either tax or borrow, and it does both, and the citizens pay. Taxation, especially in nations with graduated income tax schemes, makes it harder for people to save money and thereby contributes to the need for most people to spend the majority of their lives toiling for physical existence. Despite the welcome political reforms now transforming Russia and the Eastern Bloc, communism remains a power in other nations where it has inspired fearful oppressions in recent decades, as the people of Ethiopia and Capitua have learned in their great sorrow. On September 12, 1974, the monarchy of Ethiopia was overthrown in a military coup. Six months later, the monarchy was entirely abolished by the revolutionary government, and Ethiopia was made a Marxist state complete with collective farms and government-owned industry. The new Marxist rules soon found themselves opposed by an independence movement in the Ethiopian provinces of Eteria and Tigray. The independence movement was and still is kept alive to a large extent by another Marxist group, the Popular Liberation Front. The resulting battles between the Marxist regime and the Marxist liberation have brought about a great loss of life. The Ethiopian famines we hear so much about today have been caused primarily by the Ethiopian government's attempt to squelch the Eterian liberation movement by hindering relief shipments to drought regions. This amounts to an act of genocide. People have died horrible deaths as they have found themselves caught between two equally brutal factions. Behind all of this, we find once again evidence of the Brotherhood Network. The emblem of the Marxist regime prominently features the Brotherhood symbol, of an all-seeing eye. On April 17, 1975, the original Kampuchea, formerly Cambodia, fell to a communist revolutionary forces. A virtual news blackout followed. The stories that leaked out were horrifying beyond description. After the election of the communist leader Pol Pot as premier in April 1976, the country suffered what some experts believe to have been the worst genocide since World War II. At least one million and as many as three million Capituans died out of a population of 7.5 million. That represents a substantial portion. This genocide was part of a grand economic plan formulated by highly educated leaders who boasted advanced degrees in economics and social science from universities in France. Those leaders decided that their nation should have an agrarian economy. Immediately, the capital... Phnom Penh was forcibly evacuated, and its residents were compelled to enter the countryside where rural production cooperatives awaited them. Private property was abolished. Citizens who were perceived as standing in the way of the new utopia by virtue of their occupations and or education, and those people who objected to being forced into slavery, were murdered. Children were often recruited to carry out the murders, thereby helping to breed in the young generations of Kampuchuans a higher than normal incidence of psychopathology. This grand scheme under Pol Pot was a virtual carbon copy of the brutal programs launched earlier in history by the Revolutionary Council of 18th Century France. By the regime of Joseph Stalin in Russia and by the Cultural Revolutions of Mao Zedong in China, the Pol Pot regime collapsed in January 1979 when it was invaded by the communist North Vietnamese. By 1990, Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge reemerged. They were part of a coalition seeking to retake power by military force. The coalition was, supposed, uh, was supported by the United States, and according to several eyewitnesses, the CIA provided weapons and continued to reach still brutal Khmer Rouge troops. Prior to dismantling 
the dismantling of the Soviet Union, many communist movements in the in the world were supported by the Soviet KGB and other Eastern Bloc secret services as a part of their mission to foment wars of liberation around the world. Increasingly, Western intelligence services had also assisted in the establishment of the communist regimes, just as the German military had done so in 1917. The United States initially backed Fidel Castro in Cuba and Ho Chi Minh in Vietnam, both of whom afterwards established the com communist regime regimes in their respective nations. Both nations still remain communist as of this writing. The United States has also had also initially backed Pol Pot and helped him to achieve power in Kampuchea, or Kampuchea. Kampuchea, is that how you say that? Kampuchea. 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 Okay, I can get it right now. The communist world, both past and present, was very much a product of Western activity. Oh, and this is going to get interesting right here. It's going to, we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, sovereign military order of Malta. Let's see, I ain't nice that, uh, nice to see that uh, Bram is going to get into that. So, behind today's political factionalism, we continue to find evidence of direct Brotherhood network involvement. The sovereign military order of Malta. The SMOM, for example, was strongly anti-communist and instilled anti-communism in, in its inheritance as a spiritual goal. There's nothing wrong with it until it becomes another justification to breed more violence, oppression, and strife. One of SMOM's Knights in America, the late William Casey, headed the American CIA from January 28, 1981 until January 29, 1987. During his tenure as CIA chief, Casey did much to increase CIA covert operations, especially in Central America. There, CIA-backed Contra rebels and right-wing death squads committed horrible atrocities against civilians in the name of fighting communism. Other sovereign military order of Malta Knights in national intelligence organizations have included James Buckley of Radio Free Europe, Radio, Radio Liberty. Yeah, James Buckley. Um, huh. William F. Buckley. Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, that was a, a Nazi ISMOM front that now has been taken over by none other than Dr. Stan Monteith. What's the name of his broadcast? Radio Liberty. He's a bloodline. He's of this same exact lineage, folks. You know, you'll never hear him deny that. John McCone, former director of the CIA under President John Kennedy, and Alexandre de Marinchez, chief of the French intelligence under President Giscard d'Estaing, who was also a sovereign military order of Malta Knight. The American CIA is also influenced by Mormonism, Freemasonry, and other lesser-known Brotherhood organizations. Mormons are often sought by CIA, CIA recruiters due to the overseas experience many Mormons receive in their missionary work. And a few have reached very high positions within the American intelligence community. Some Masonic groups provide special scholarships for young members to attend the Foreign Services School in Washington, D.C., that school provides the nation with many of its State Department personnel, diplomats, and spies. All of these brotherhood influences have combined to create an ideological hotbed in American foreign policy. The result has been the maintenance of the United States as an effective political faction for keeping conflict alive around the world. Lone assassins continue to be significant today. Earlier in the book, we looked at the origin of the lone assassin phenomenon as a political tool. The substantial conspiracy evidence surrounding modern-day assassinations indicates that such killings continue to be accrued political weapons. The primary difference today is that some lone assassins appear to be a cover for a second hidden assassin, and a pretense is made that the lone assassin really did the act alone. In all other important respects, modern loan assassins are nearly identical to those programmed by the Brotherhood's Ismaili organization centuries ago in the Middle East. To illustrate, let us review some of the evidence behind recent assassinations. A great deal has already been written about the November 22, 1963 assassination of U.S. President John F. Kennedy, so I will only sum summarize the events here. President Kennedy was killed by a rifle fire while riding in the motorcade in Dallas, Texas, almost immediately after the shooting, suspicions of a conspiracy arose. The alleged lone assassin, Lee Harvey Oswald, publicly proclaimed that he was only a patsy. The ballistics and physical evidence strongly suggested that Kennedy was hit by bullets fired from in the front of him, not from behind where Oswald was positioned. 
Oswald never had a chance to elaborate on his claim that he was a patsy or go to trial because two days after his arrest, he was murdered while in police custody by nightclub owner Jack Ruby. Jack Rubenstein, a man with known mafia connections, Ruby went to prison and died there less than four years later. An official government panel was convened to investigate the JFK assassination known as the Warren Commission. After its chairman, U.S. Supreme Court Justice Earl Warren, the panel concluded that Oswald had acted entirely alone. Years later, U.S. House of Representatives panel spent 26 months reinvestigating the murders of John F. Kennedy and black civil rights leader Martin Luther King Jr., who was slain in 1968 by an alleged lone assassin as well. The House panel concluded that lone assassins did not act alone and that conspiracies lay behind the Kennedy and King killings. The panel felt that further police investigation was warranted. Despite rumors and evidence of CIA and mafia involvements in the Kennedy shootings, no convictions or any co-conspirators have ever occurred. John Kennedy's younger brother, Robert F. Kennedy, was assassinated almost five years later on June 5, 1968, inside the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles, California. RFK was running for president at the time he was shot, and he was almost certain to win the Democratic nomination. He had just finished delivering a speech to enthused campaign workers and began to walk through the back pantry area surrounded by a throng of well-wishers and reporters. It was in the pantry area that the convicted assassin, Sirhan Sirhan, opened fire at close range with a 22 caliber pistol. A number of people were hit, and Kennedy fell to the floor with head and body wounds. Sirhan was immediately apprehended. Kennedy died the next day, and Sirhan went on to be convicted as the sole assassin. Despite the conviction, a great deal of controversy remained. In an extraordinary feat of investigative journalism, researcher Theodore Karach compiled a large body of evidence indicating that a second hidden gunman, not Sirhan Sirhan, had fired the shot with which killed Kennedy. Somebody called into my show one time when I had uh, Anthony J. Hilder on the show and accused him of being the second gunman. <laughs> Isn't that wild? I don't know if that's true or not. I haven't seen any evidence that supports that. But somebody, literally, I had him on my show one time, but somebody called in and accused him of being the second gunman because allegedly he was there. He admitted that on my show that he was there when Kennedy was, when Robert Kennedy was killed. That kind of weird. I also heard that, uh, oh, what's his name? Oh, uh, who's the, the Vatican assassin clown? Eric John Phelps, yeah. I heard him talk about. I don't think I, I wouldn't say he's a clown. He's an Israeli diamond salesman and a and, and, and a white supremacist. But he, oh, uh, he has a, had some accurate info on some topics. But yeah, you need to know that's what he is. I don't really support his work or his you know that guy at all. Although he supports my work and he puts his my movies up on his website, so uh, you know maybe that'll reach some more people. But yeah, I don't know about that. But anyway, and also heard Phelps claim that. Uh, Anthony J. Hilder, Anthony J. Hilder was a um, Knight of Malta as well. I don't know if that's true, but it does seem kind of odd that he would that he would be a if he was a Knights of Malta and he was there when Robert Kennedy was assassinated. And you look at the connection to the Knights of Malta, to other people that were involved in the Kennedy assassination, such as the Hunt brothers and all the people in Dallas that had connection to that, and the CIA people that he fired, like uh, Dulles and all those guys, they were all Knights of Malta. That's kind of a weird coincidence, I have to say. The RFK second gun case rests on a great deal of fascinating ballistics evidence and eyewitness testimony. For example, the Los Angeles coroner performed an analysis of the gunpowder burns on Kennedy's head and clothing. The burns revealed that the muzzle of a gun was not more than one to three inches from Kennedy's head when it fired the fatal bullets, i.e. the muzzle was at point-blank range. All eyewitnesses, however, reported that Sirhan's weapon was never close than tw closer than 12 inches a significant difference as far as powder burns are concerned. The second gun suggests that the fatal bullet may have been fired from the gun of a uniformed security guard who was holding Kennedy by the right arm when the shooting started. <coughs> the guard admitted pulling out his gun during the melee, but denied firing it. An eyewitness on the scene, however, did, not, did testify to seeing the guard fire. There is no record that the police ever examined the guard's pistol. A bizarre diary reportedly written by Sirhan and discovered in his apartment after the shooting seems to lend weight to the conspiracy theory. In that diary, Sirhan wrote several times of the need for Robert Kennedy to die in connection with Sirhan receiving large sums of money. One entry mentioned $100,000. The most interesting diary entry is, the, is that one in which Sirhan, who seemed to relish the thought, 
of receiving large checks made payable to him appears to repeat an instruction that he has never heard a promise that he would receive money for Kennedy's death, which needed to happen by June 5th, 1968, the date of the California primary. Sir, Sirhan's diary contained the following words. Robert F. Kennedy must be assassinated. Robert F. Kennedy must be assassinated before 5th of June, 68. Robert F. Kennedy must be assassinated. I have never heard. Please pay to the order of, 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 of. The LAPD considered the diary interest to be nothing more than the rannies of a mentally deranged lone assassin. That's, or somebody under mind control. My God, look at that. <coughs> That's somebody under massive hypnotism. Uh, that was another strange thing when I had Anthony J. Hilder on my show. He was using NLP on, on the, the entire show. And I guess thought that me or my audience wouldn't pick up on it, but he absolutely was. If that truly was Sir Hans writing, his references to money would certainly provide an additional motive for him to take shots at Kennedy, whom he greatly disliked anyway. The question is, who offered Sir Hans the apparent money, and does Sir Hans believe that he will still receive it when he is finally released from prison? To this day, Sir Hans maintains that he acted entirely alone, and the FBI and Los Angeles Police Department are, agreed to, are content to agree with him. If a security guard fired the shot which killed RFA, RFK, it is possible that he did it accidentally. The guard may have drawn his gun from his holster in, in an effort to defend Kennedy without even realizing it. The police, however, never even considered this possibility, despite the powerful evidence that Sirhan's gun did not fire the fatal bullet. The LAPD was instead very one-minded in its lone assassin theory, and as pointed out by a Los Angeles Times article, badly mishandled some of the key physical evidence. <coughs> Rumors again abounded of a possible mafia and or CIA involvement in the Robert Kennedy shooting, but no co-conspirators were ever arrested in the case. In, in the early afternoon of March 30th, 1981, President Ronald Reagan finished giving a speech at the Washington Hilton Hotel. Surrounded by his entourage and Secret Service agents, Reagan walked out to the driveway where a limousine awaited him. As in the Robert Kennedy sh uh, shooting, an apparently crazed young man emerged from the crowd firing a pistol. Reagan was pushed into the limousine by a Secret Service agent, rushed to the hospital, underwent surgery to remove a single bullet, which had struck him in the left rib cage and pierced his left lung. It is fortunate that the wound was not fatal. The lone assassin, John Hinckley Jr., went on to be convicted of the crime. According to a newspaper columnist, the FBI did all it could to prove that Hinckley had been the sole assassin on the scene. Some people, however, have expressed doubts about the FBI's conclusion. At a press conference held a month after his recovery, Mr. Reagan answered questions indicating that he did not feel the impact of the bullet that struck him until he was all the way inside of the limousine. That's odd, isn't it? What were your first thoughts when you realized you had been hit? Yeah, the whole thing was set up by the same people that set up Kennedy and RFK. Anyway, Poppy Bush's fingerprints were all over there. Had that bullet been just about a half inch, a little bit more uh, to the right, We'd have had Poppy Bush as president a lot sooner than we did. And the New World Order would have been advanced a lot more quicker than it was. Even though, you know, they advanced it still with Reagan as a puppet in chief. But, you know, they were trying to put the real power player in, 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 in into the head of things conveniently there with the death of Reagan. What were your first thoughts when you realized you had been hit? Uh, well, uh, actually, I, uh, I can't recall too clearly. I. Uh... Knew I'd been hurt, but I thought that I had uh, been hurt by the Secret Service man landing on me in the car, and it was, I must say, it was the most paralyzing pain. I've described it as if someone had hit you with a hammer. By that sensation, it seemed to me, uh, came after I was in the car. And so I thought that maybe his gun or something that the Secret Service had, had come down on me had broken a rib, but when I sat up in the seat, the pain wouldn't go away. I suddenly found I was coughing up blood. We have decided that maybe I'd broken a rib or punctured a lung. So possibly the Secret Service agent was ordered that if, you know, the assassin didn't get him to go ahead and finish him off there. A lot of people have, uh, you know, speculated that it was the driver that reached around in, in the back and shot Kennedy. Uh, you know, I don't, I, I don't believe that, but a lot of people do. In a later interview, Mr. Reagan's wife, Nancy, confirmed the president's impression. 
Had Mr. Reagan simply suffered a delayed reaction to a bullet fired from Hinckley's gun, or had he, had he actually been shot, perhaps accidentally, inside the car by a Secret Service agent, as the above testimony would suggest? According to the FBI, the bullet that wounded Mr. Reagan had ricocheted off the inside limousine door just as Mr. Reagan was being pushed into the vehicle. If the FBI explanation is true, why did the bullet not explode upon impact with a door since it was an exploding bullet? Perhaps the bullet was a dud. It is possible that two coincidences did occur at the Reagan shooting, a dud bullet followed by a delayed pain reaction. Another explanation, which, was, which does not require a coincidence, is that Reagan was shot, perhaps accidentally, by the Secret Service agent inside the car. This would explain both the failure of the exploding bullet to explode. It, it did not hit an intervening metal door in Mr. Reagan's own recollection. The FBI did not pursue the second gun angle in the Reagan shooting. This is troubling because the convicted assassin, John Hinckley Jr., claimed that there was a conspiracy involved in the shooting. In its October 21st, 1981 issue, the New York Times reported, a Justice Department source late tonight confirmed a report that John W. Hinckley Jr. had written in papers confiscated from his cell in July that he was a part of a conspiracy when he shot President Reagan and three other men in March, uh, March 30th of that year. Hinckley's allegation should have set in motion an intensive conspiracy investigation. After all, John Hinckley Jr. was not just a random individual out of the American melting pot. He was the son of a wealthy personal friend and political supporter of then-Vice President George Bush, who, of course, would have become president if Reagan had died. This is not to say that a conspiracy necessarily existed, only that such circumstances typically bigger, trigger a much more intensive investigation. Well, come on. Bramley, do your homework, bud. Poppy Bush we're talking about here. Where there's smoke, there's fucking fire. You see the ops that guy's been behind through the years. It should have been a fucking investigation minute one. The New York Times states that the FBI seized Hinckley's papers, followed up on the leads, and concluded that Hinckley's conspiracy claim was untrue. The judge hearing the case ordered attorneys and witnesses not to divulge the contents of Hinckley's papers to the public. The prison guards who had seized and read the papers gave their testimony to, in secret to the judge. At Hinckley's trial, neither defense nor prosecuting attorneys ever raised the issue of a conspiracy nor the second gun possibility. It said the entire trial centered around Mr. Hinckley's very visible mental problems. Perhaps the three shootings just discussed really were committed by lone assassins, with two of the shootings involving the accidental discharge of a firearm by a security agent an assassination in the, in the Philippines proved, however, that such scenarios may sometimes be the cover for a murder committed by an intelligence organization. Well, this is a long chapter. I tried my best to get through all of it tonight. It's a long chapter, man. We started on a new one here tonight, but I'm going to have to go and uh, stop it there for tonight. Otherwise, we'll, we'll be going on into the morning, but... Uh, Good stuff there out of uh, Bramley tonight. I'm glad we got into a little bit of the SMOM, a little bit of uh, the assassination stuff. We'll pick up uh, where we left off here tomorrow night on the broadcast. I want to thank everybody for being with us tonight. And, uh, again, thanks to our uh, donator who got us uh, over the top of the last minute. Appreciate that so much. Love you guys. Uh, we do still need support, though, because that takes us at zero for uh, any kind of support right now, folks. Uh, after paying the bills, and it's been tough, and uh, we just need whatever we can get in right now. So thank you so much to everybody out there. My name is Josh Reeves. I love each and every one of you. We'll see you next time for the broadcast. You guys have a great one. Take care.
right, chapter 39, Escape from Eden tonight. It is natural for people to wonder how they might be able to improve the world around them. A widespread misconception is that to be effective, a person must be either rich, a politician, or a saint. The truth is one can successfully take responsibility for oneself and for one's fellow humans from exactly where one is without greatly disrupting one's life or livelihood. One may begin doing this gradually by first improving one's own life, then by giving help to family and friends where it is wanted, then by joining or starting groups with laudable social goals, and finally by pursuing a sense of direct personal responsibility for the human race. It is important that more people begin this process, as history has clearly shown us if you do not create your own surroundings, Someone else is going to create them for you, and you may not like what you get. That's absolutely true. Major constructive changes to our world actually do not require much to bring about. As a specific example, the inflatable paper money system, which continues to create indebtedness and instability at every level, can easily be replaced with a stable monetary system by merely ending bank-created money and setting up a system whereby money is issued by national governments in proportion to their gross national products and dispersed without engendering uh, debt. Banks could continue to participate in the system by being the conduit for the release and circulation of the money, but banks could no longer create money on their own. Governments would no longer need to tax anyone or borrow. They could simply allocate to themselves the money they needed to operate within limits imposed by their gross national products. Under this plan, all debts owned to banks could be instantly forgiven. Banks could be paid by the government for their services in dispersing and circulating the money and by consumers for consumer services. The custodial society itself presents us with an extraordinary challenge. As we have seen, to reduce the human ability to meet the challenge by occluding the subject of UFOs and spiritual phenomena with false reports, dubious evidence, obfuscating explanations, and hoaxes, is to do grave potential damage to the future prospects of the human race. At this time, scrupulous honesty from all sides is needed. If Earth is indeed owned by an oppressive extraterrestrial society, then there must exist somewhere communication lines between human beings and the custodial society. I am not talking about alleged telepathic communication. I am speaking of face-to-face -face contact between humans and custodians. Part of the solution would be to find those communication channels and use them to begin negotiating an end to the pain and suffering on Earth. This proposal may sound utterly wild as it would mean trying to start a process of diplomacy with an extraterrestrial society which most governments do not even admit the existence of in order to win the freedom of the human race a race which most people would deny, is even imprisoned. On the other hand, some people might argue that such negotiations would be as futile as San Quentin prisoners trying to negotiate their freedom with a warden or Nazi concentration camp inmates trying to bargain with their, SSS, with their SS guards. The custodial society would need to be assured that the human race desires no revenge or political upheaval. Mankind seeks only an opportunity to work out its promised salvation, and the human race would share its successes with the custodial society. The goal would be to let bygones be bygones and to get on with the future. In the meantime, the problem of human warfare can be addressed directly. It should be clear that there is no true security during any state of war, hot or cold. People speak of nuclear disarmament, but why bother making a small reduction in nuclear arsenals when chemical and biological weapons are produced in greater number? Fortunately, many people understand that true national security is achieved only through friendship and peace. Ask any American if they feel threatened militarily by Canada or any of the most paranoid Canadian the same question about America. Both nations feel a sense of security not because they are pointing hair-trigger weaponry at one another, but because they enjoy a basic state of friendship. In Europe, one does not find the nation of Belgium bankrupting its treasury to arm itself against the Dutch peril 
or the Dutch arming itself to the teeth against the French threat. Reliance on weapons, espionage, propaganda, and other tools of war to achieve national security will inevitably fail. Sooner or later, someone is going to build a better bomb or find a way to get around yours. They will recruit a better spy or will tell a more convincing lie. No one's security should have to rely on such shenanigans. There are many people today throughout the world who are striving to create security through friendship. These people have not been able to overcome several major hurdles. World leaders have their ears bent by intelligence agencies which promote a chronic climate of fear and danger through secret briefings, alarming reports, and grim scenarios. As long as artificial philosophical differences exist between national leaders, those leaders will not be able to think and communicate rationally with one another. If national leaders are convinced that a great utopia will arise if they maintain their side of the struggle, there will never be peace. Peace will only arrive if our leaders are willing to drop their great apocalyptic struggles and join the rest of humanity in a single pact of friendship. The first thing that people can do to bring about human freedom is to become aware of all of the small freedoms that they have expanded upon them. In our world, there's a great deal of emphasis on broad and gigantic social and political spiritual freedoms. But many people find it difficult to exercise even the smallest freedoms, such as simply expressing a fact or opinion in a social circle. Yeah, you know, people are still afraid to go up and tell people, you know, about this stuff and talk about it with them. And you just shouldn't be anymore. You know, you just shouldn't be. Get up in their comfortable little world. Make them sweat a little bit. Make them feel uncomfortable. Look like, you know, the kook at the table just one day. Try it. You'd be surprised how great you feel when you do it, when you shake them up a little bit, get in their comfortable little world and say, hey, just because you got your nose, you know, tuned into the boob tube any night doesn't make this information any less real. You know, look into this book, look into this or that, look at this website, go Google search this, look something up, and see for yourself. We don't have any time left to just let people be idiots anymore. We got to get in there and shake them up. I just, you know, I, and, and I'm that way now, man. I just won't even fuck it. You know, I won't even get in arguments with people about this anymore. I just go, you know what, dude? You just go on about your business. I'm going to go on about mine. You go on and have a nice life and go ahead and stick your head in the sand like a goddamn ostrich and have fun with that. Because I just don't have time to argue with these idiots anymore. You either see it or you don't. If you don't see it, you're dead already and fuck you. You know, you, you weren't going to help anyway. You're going to be another one of these bottom feeders, people that suck off the system and live off the system. So, of course, you don't want to wake up to anything that might be wrong about that system because, you know, you're sucking off the teat of it. Because you went to college and you think that you're smarter than everybody else. And, then, and that if you would have, if this stuff was real, you would have heard about it in college. It's a twit. The irony is that broad sweeping freedoms really exist so that people may enjoy all of the small freedoms that make existence worthwhile. One can be enjoying can be uh, can begin enjoying those small freedoms simply by exercising them. And that's that's something I've talked about here on my show a lot through the years. You know, we sit around and you know a lot of people not 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 so much what we do here on this show, but you know a lot of type of uh, truth radio and you know that's a page radio type type stuff. They sit around all day and bitch and piss and moan about what freedoms they don't have. The ones they do, they're not exercising. And, and a lot of these things we self-impose on ourselves. You know, like well, certain words you're not supposed to say. You know, like nigger. You're not supposed to say the word nigger ever. Even if you're referencing the word. I got people get mad at me because I was using it and referencing the word somebody else was using it. Just saying, you're not supposed to say it. Even if you're just using the word as an example of this is a word, it exists in the language. Even if you're not using it uh, as an epithet against someone, but strictly even saying the word is now considered absolutely positively wrong. How did we get to that? That's self-imposed. So we have to begin to, 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 to try and get a better hold on what chains are being imposed by the, by the elite, by the New World Order, by the Illuminati, by the uh, custodians, and what chains on our mind are being held there by us, by ourselves? 
because we're buying into some bullshit morality or some bullshit version of what we're taught to believe is the right thing to do or not do, you see. As more and more people begin to simply exercise the freedoms that they do have, freedoms for all will expand. It therefore follows that sacrificing smaller freedoms in the name of achieving broader freedoms will actually cause all freedoms to be lost. Yes, we've seen that. Perhaps the greatest hope lies in the fact that all spiritual beings, whether they animate human bodies, custodial bodies, or none at all, appear to be very similar in basic emotional makeup. There seems to be a core of good and decency within every individual, including within the most malevolent despots that can ultimately be reached, although reaching it in some people can be admittedly be a difficult undertaking. With persistence, intelligence, and compassion, it may yet be possible to bring a resolution to all that we have looked at in this book in a manner that will leave everyone happy. There are plenty of additional problems to be solved in our world. Now it is your turn to dream up solutions. Once you have thought them up, communicate them and act on them. What you think, what you perceive, and how you view the world around you is extremely important because you have an inherently unique perspective not shared by anyone else, which is exactly why I started doing my show. It's almost been four years now. That's pretty amazing. You know, I mean, uh, give it up for me, give it up for you, all our supporters out there. You know, th th this is what I'm supposed to be doing, you know. I, I When I discovered that, I could not stop doing it. That's how it is when you discover what you're supposed to be doing. This is what I'm supposed to be doing is, is, is you know, that exact thing right there. Not trying to, you know, pose around and strut around like a peacock and act like I'm the keeper of all the knowledge and I know everything there is to know. You, you, the person that comes, strolls up to you like that, you need to run away from immediately anyway. But it is because I have a unique perspe uh, perspective not shared by anybody else, and I felt it needed to get out there. Say what you have to say, discover what you want to discover, and pursue those humanitarian goals within you. It could help us all. That's the, uh, that's the end of Chapter 39, and uh, Chapter 40 is a little longer. I don't, I'm not going to get into it. I'm just going to read the first paragraph of Chapter 40 tonight. <coughs> and then tomorrow's show will pick up on the rest of Chapter 40 here. But Chapter 40 is entire, entitled The Nature of a Supreme Being. I'd like to read just the beginning of this for you if I could. Before bidding you adieu, there is one last subject for me to touch on. It is a topic which has been lurking in the background of this entire book, but one which I have successfully avoided thus far. It is the subject of a supreme being. Does a supreme being of some kind exist? If it does, what is its relationship to life on earth and to the things that we have discussed in this book? I will try to tackle these questions, but be forewarned that this chapter is the most speculative and philosophical in the book. My discussion will be a simplified one, and it is not intended to be definitive. I advise the reader to consult other sources for more information. If this is not to your liking, then please feel free to proceed to the next and final chapter. So he, he so so again, bear that in mind. Keep that in mind. There, it's going to sort of saying what you know. Um, and and that's what that's the way it is with everybody. You know, you got to look into everything for yourself. You, there is not one single person on the face of the planet that has the ability to be able to tell you everything that it is possible for you to know about this information. I've tried my damnedest, you know. <laughs> I've tried my damnedest to get up here and, do, and, 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 every, and I do that, and I've always done that. That's what I always will continue to do is to just get up here and, and blurt out as much of this stuff as I can for you on the microphone and on the archive so we can have it for, for posterity so it'll be there. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we all change the world in our own little way. Nobody's expecting you to, to single-handedly change the world. 
Nobody single-handedly expecting me to change the world or anybody else, but we all change the world in our own little ways. And you know, I mean, I uh, I've had an effect on people. I, I, I'm, I, you know, I I don't take enough time sometimes. It's one of my big faults, and I could probably get a lot, be a lot more successful if I did this. But I'm just I'm humble to a fault because I'm just one of those people that doesn't think that that, that anything I, I do is ever you know as good as it could be. I'm not a control free perfectionist, but I'm just you know. I just always feel like everything I do could be better, but you know, uh, people have, and I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm just not real big on giving myself props. But a lot of you made me feel really good over the past, you know, month or so with the stuff I've been going through, and kind words, and you know, telling me how much that I, that I mean to you and how much my work means to you, and 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 that means the the, the world to me because you know, people have told me I've changed your life. You know, multiple people, hey man, you've changed my life. I'm not the same person I was where I met you. Thank you. You know, people I know personally, people listeners, stuff like that. And that's, you know, in that, in my own little specific way right there, I changed the world. By first changing the world for myself, which in turn allowed me to change the world for somebody else. Because I changed the world for me first. I changed my world. I changed the way I looked at it. I changed the way I operated in it. I changed the way I thought about it. And so those changes first in myself, then uh, subsequently allowed uh, the, the fruits of that. Um, you know, to for me to, you know, inspire somebody else to look or, you know, give them a piece of information or change the way they look at something, you know, or whatever else. And and that's that's what we all have to do. That's how the world changes. Not by bloody revolutions and by staged things that the elite want to happen so they can control it. But revolutions happen by everybody just doing something that affects something else. And we all affect each other. That's the great thing about music and about words and and, and film and everything else is that if you really do something with conviction and really put your heart and your soul into it, and everything that you believe into it, that's going to resonate. That's going to come across. It doesn't matter if you have, you know, a low budget to create a movie like I have or something, you know, or a big budget. What matters is, is that, you know, the intent behind it. And that's going to resonate with people. You know, when, they, when people see that you are really doing something from a real place, it resonates with them. It makes them want to do it too. So to me, that's one of the big solutions. That's what we have to continue to push for. And, uh, you know, I hope that, there, that you out there will uh, continue to support me in my quest to do that. And thank you to, to those that uh, that do. My website is theglobalreality.com. It's www.theglobalreality.com. My email address is globalrealityshow at gmail.com. And at the website, theglobalreality.com, the chipping banner is there for the bills for the month. Please chip in on the banner if you can help us out there or use the donate button. Uh, if you want to uh, donate larger amounts, you know, uh, multiple hundreds of dollars or even $1,000 or more or whatever, always use the donate button for that, not the, uh, not the chip in banner so we can just keep that, you know, empty for the bills and stuff that we need every month. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Uh, glad you all could be with us tonight. My name is Josh Reeves. I love each and every one of you. We'll see you next time for the broadcast. You guys have a great night. Take care. It is unfortunate that the term scientific method has become almost synonymous with materialism. The two should not be equated. The scientific method is simply an attempt to understand and explore an area of knowledge in an intelligent and pragmatic fashion. It strives to find cause and effect relationships and to develop consistent axioms and techniques that will lead to predictable results. This, this is the type of methodology which needs to be and can be applied to the realm of the spirit. But it has not been done to any large degree. The great universities and foundations are too busy with their man is brain studies to do more than superficial studies into the mounting evidence of spiritual existence. The major religions already have their word of God writings, and so they rarely undertake scientific studies into this area either. Some people deny the existence of a supreme being altogether. It is difficult to blame them considering the level to which spiritual knowledge has deteriorated. However, the overwhelming evidence of individual spiritual existence and the many characteristics which all spiritual beings seem to share in common 
would suggest that a supreme being of some kind probably exists as a common source of all spiritual existence. If a spiritual being exists, it is likely that most people would not recognize it if they encountered it. Many individuals expect a supreme being to be a giant man in a flowing beard who rants, raves, and kills people. Others think that a supreme being is a bright light that exudes love and warmth. Still others perceive it as some completely unfathomable mystery that no one can ever hope to comprehend except through strained mystical contortions. A supreme being is probably none of these things. While researching this book, I encountered many ideas of what a supreme being might be. Perhaps the best way to tackle the issue is first to try and determine what an individual spiritual being is. A spiritual being appears to be something that is not a part of the physical universe, and yet it possesses both external awareness and self-awareness. The Samkhya definitions on pages 103 and 104 of this book appear to be fairly accurate, and I refer the reader to those pages. The mounting scientific evidence of spiritual immortality in near-death episodes and in documented past life memories indicates that spiritual beings are best defined as timeless and indestructible units of awareness. <coughs> Every spiritual being or unit of awareness seems to be completely unique and independent. Each appears to possess its own distinct viewpoint, which cannot entirely be duplicated by any other unit of awareness. This uniqueness and individuality of viewpoint appear to be the very essence and purpose of spiritual existence. We may see some evidence of this in the fact that when individuals are crushed into sameness, that is being the same as everybody else, they become unhappier and worse off. Their perceptions deteriorate and they are less creative. When true uniqueness and individuality are restored to people, they regain their vitality and creativity. It appears that every unit of awareness is capable of infinite creation because creation by a spiritual being is accomplished by the act of thought or imagination. If you imagine that there is a white cat on top of this book, you have created a white cat even if it only exists for you. Such creations, when shared and agreed to by others, eventually give rise to universes that can be shared and experienced by all others. This seems to be how spiritual beings create universes of their own and in cooperation with others, and why there exists evidence in modern physics that our universe appears to be ultimately based on thought. For any universe or reality to exist, an infinity must first exist in which a universe or reality may be placed. All reality, including this material universe, arise out of infinity and not vice versa. This has been demonstrated by some remarkable mathematics being done at various universities. Every unit of awareness is the source of its own infinity because thought and imagination have no bounds. Any amount of space, time, or matter may be imagined by any spiritual being and ultimately agreed to and shared by other spiritual beings. Where did all these countless units of awareness come from? Did there exist at one time only a single unit of awareness from which all other, others originated? The many similarities between all spiritual beings make it appear so. That original unit of awareness, which what is normally called a supreme being, we might also call the primary being. It appears that Spiritual beings are actually the units of awareness of a primary or supreme being, yet each unit is possessed of its own self-awareness, personality, free will, independent thought, and infinite creativity. This would mean that a supreme being had created or had given birth to an uncountable number of unique and individual units of awareness through which that supreme being could experience the uncountable infinities, universes, and realities which all those spiritual beings could freely and independently create. A supreme being might therefore be very crudely likened to a person sitting in a television control booth who puts out trillions of video cameras. Each camera, or a spiritual being, 
feeds a picture into its own individual monitor screen in the control booth to be viewed by the operator, the supreme being. Each camera is situated a little differently, and so each has its own different viewpoint and perspective. Each camera is also capable of creating its own special effects or universes. And they kind of play into that a bit in the, in the uh, I think it was the third Matrix film they came out with, when Neo goes and meets the Grand Architect. I, I got to tell you, man, watching it in the theater, there was a stream of piss running down my leg that ran down the uh, uh, the aisle in front of me in the in the theater. Uh, people were like, you know, didn't know what it was because I was literally like wetting myself when you know Neo walks in the room and there's the guy sitting in the chair in front of a bank of television monitors like he's describing here and you know they call him the grand architect you know like the masons referred to the grand architect of the universe i just went oh my god they really are throwing this in our face if the above theory is accurate we might ask how a supreme being could have been so foolish why would it create awareness units that were self-aware after all it is the quality of self-awareness or the awareness of being aware that allows spiritual beings to be completely independent and engage in the silliness which has caused them to suffer the sorry plight that they now appear to be enduring on earth and probably elsewhere. Why did a supreme being not simply throw out an enormous number of awareness units that were only externally aware and had no consciousness of their own existences? Better yet, why did a supreme being not do the sensible thing and simply retain its own single undivided viewpoint? Self-awareness is apparently the quality which gives spiritual beings the capacity for thought and imagination. And hence, to be a source of infinity and creation, without self-awareness, a spiritual being could not create on its own. Self-awareness appears to act as the mirror against which a spiritual being can be the source of an infinity. And within that infinity can create realities and universes. Theoretically, of course, a supreme being was already capable of creating an infinity and of creating anything within it. A supreme being could only be the source of one infinity, its own. If a supreme being wanted to experience another infinity, it had to first create another unique self-aware unit of awareness like itself. So it apparently did just that. But it did not satisfy itself with just one more unit of awareness. It appears to have put out an uncountable number of them so that it could enjoy an almost infinite number of infinities and realities. This suggests that the potential scope of a supreme being extends far beyond the boundaries of this one small universe. It encompasses trillions of potential infinities and universes. Aha, you might interject. By definition, only one infinity can exist. It is redundant for something already capable of infinite creation to expand itself. Infinity multiplied by uncountable trillions is still infinity. As noted, infinity appears to be solely the product of viewpoint. Only units of awareness are capable of viewpoint, and therefore uh, there would exist as many infinities as there are units of awareness units of awareness being spiritual beings. Infinity does not arise out of the mechanical universe or from any of its laws. Rather, the mechanical universe and its laws all appear to arise out of infinity. What went wrong? How did so many spiritual beings, each capable of infinite creation, wind up with a dull thud on Earth thinking that they are nothing more than meat and electricity? There are apparently many factors that cause this, including those that, just, that were discussed in this book, and I will leave it to someone else to describe other, perhaps more significant, long-range causes. I will only add that spiritual entities can become hopelessly caught up in the labyrinths of their own intricate creations. Although the universe appears to operate on very simple building blocks, uh, once these blocks are put into place and other arbitraries are introduced, a universe can become extremely complex and solid-looking. Like the universe we share now, when that happens, spiritual beings may become fixated in those universes like cameras anchored in a dense rainforest. The cameras are unable to perceive beyond the foliage immediately in front of them, 
after staring at the foliage for a long enough time, the cameras may begin to, uh, to believe that they, too, are nothing but foliage, and they forget that they are cameras. Salvation would come by restoring to those cameras their true self-identities and by giving them the ability to come and go from the rainforest at will. If we look at individual spiritual beings on Earth, we see that they are very small in relation to the universe. This is the situation that apparently occurs when spiritual beings become enmeshed in bodies or other physical objects. In that state, spiritual beings have lost their power to change perspective in relation to the physical universe. Perspective is apparently what determines the size of a spiritual being. Have you ever stood on top of a skyscraper and looked down? Your first reaction might be to think, gee, those people sure are small. They're the size of ants. Those people look so small and really are so small because uh, of your change in perspective. A spiritual being in an untapped trapped state can apparently change perspective in the same way in relation to the entire physical universe. The universe can appear no, lo no larger than a cup, of, a cup of coffee or an atom the size of a mountain. This is apparently how a spiritual being becomes bigger or smaller. Changing perspective in this fashion is not an act of mere thinking, however. It is a matter of actually shifting direct spiritual perception in as real and tangible a fashion as the person who hops on an elevator to the top of a skyscraper. Spiritual beings on Earth are largely confined to the single perspective dictated by the physical bodies that they animate. Mental perspectives can still change, but not the direct perspective of the spiritual entity in relation to the universe itself. The foregoing discussion has some rather clear implications in regard to the rest of this book. The act of repressing a spiritual being, entrapping it in matter, or otherwise seeking to reduce its vision, creativity, or self-awareness as a spiritual being is the act of trying to reduce a supreme being. If one reduces a supreme being's unit of awareness, even just one unit out of many trillions, one has still reduced a supreme being by that much. Since only other units of awareness can engage in such repression, it follows that a bizarre psychosis has arisen. It is, it is as though uh, it is it is as though extensions of the same ultimate body are trying to repress other extensions. The left hand is trying to reduce and trap the right hand. That appears to be one type of psychosis that can arise when beings possessed of free will become entrapped. Some mystical religions teach that one's ultimate spiritual aim should be to permanently merge with or rejoin a spiritual being. This appears to be a false goal. If spiritual beings were created to act as unique and independent viewpoints, it would be contrary to the purpose of creation to permanently merge with other awareness units or with a supreme being. It may not even be possible to do so. The true goal of any salvation program should be to fully recover one's unique spiritual self-awareness and perspective. The above discussion suggests that many popular ideas about God may be inaccurate. For example, some people with near-death experiences report that going through a tunnel and meeting a being of light which instills in the near-death victims feelings of love and all-knowing. I met a man who belonged to a Hindu set which attempts to contact and merge with this being of light in its meditations. The man wrote a paper describing his personal experiences. His descriptions of spiritually traveling down a tunnel and meeting a being of light are very similar to the statements of near-death victims. Yeah, it's D and T release is what you're seeing there. It's what, what's causing it, physiologically. While I, I acknowledge the importance and probable reality of many such experiences, I question the beliefs, uh, some of the beliefs which may have arisen from them. The feelings of love and all-knowing conveyed 
by that being can be instilled by drugs, electronic emanations, and other artificial means. Interestingly, some UFO abductees have reported such emotions during their alleged examinations aboard UFOs. Right, that's because they don't act that they, they figured out a way to harness our spiritual bodies. When people talk about being abducted by UFOs and they and they and they have marks on their bodies, that, that's not because your physical body left a ship and you went up in a ship and, and, and didn't no no no. If anything done to the spiritual body reflects itself, any damage done to the spiritual body reflects itself on the physical body. And many people believe, including myself, um, that these extraterrestrials have the ability and the technology to be able to basically abduct your spiritual self or your etherical body. And then that's what they, they do tests on, and that's really what they're interested in. And that makes a lot of sense because it does seem that that is the most, the, the, the most intriguing thing that beings from other places seem to be um, interested in, our souls themselves, not really our meat suits, you know. In some of these UFO cases, the surrounding evidence strongly suggests that the feelings were caused by an electronic device used as a sedative. Whatever the near-death being of light may be, I will not even try to guess, it is most assuredly not a supreme being. It may even be an object that contributes to post-death spiritual amnesia. People should not be counseled to merge with or go to the being of light during meditation or at death. They should stay away from it if they can. In saying this, I do not mean to deny the otherwise positive and profound feelings experienced by some Hindus and near-death victims as a result of temporarily re-experiencing their spiritual immortality. What are we then to think of the idea of a supreme being sitting in judgment on beings of the earth? It is hard to imagine that a supreme being would condemn its own units of awareness, no matter how small and entrapped they have become, and no matter how insanely uh, and destructively some of them behave as a result. Would a supreme being, seeing how bad everything has gotten, perhaps, end its experiment and vanish all other awareness units except itself? If such a thing were possible, I dare say it would not be done. Creating an almost infinite number of spiritual beings would actually have been a brilliant move on the part of a supreme being to expand itself immeasurably. The solution to what went wrong would be to preserve the awareness units and encourage them to achieve their salvation. Spiritual salvation would probably not happen through the waving of a magical godly wand. However, because spiritual beings possess free and independent will, salvation appears to be something that spiritual beings must take responsibility for themselves. It is up to every individual to seek out his or her salvation in an intelligent fashion. Salvation appears to be something that can be achieved as pragmatically as any other goal in life, provided that a rational understanding of how to attain it is developed. Many theologies teach that a supreme being is opposed by an enemy. Perhaps there is an element of truth to this, even if that truth has been distorted. We do observe that at every level of existence, there exists a condition or a game in which survival is challenged. At a personal level, an individual's survival is constantly opposed by aging, disease, and other factors. The survival of a family unit is often tested by financial problems, hostile relatives, and outside sexual temptations. Organizations and nations usually have competitors and enemies. In the animal kingdom, the survival drama is most vividly played out in hunter-prey relationships. All physical objects face inevitable deterioration. Spiritual beings themselves appear to face survival challenges by being trapped in matter. Since this survival game seems to exist at every level of existence, it is possible that it also exists in regard to a supreme being a game in which a supreme being's own survival is tested by the diminishment of its awareness units and perhaps by the ultimate diminishment of the supreme being itself. For such a game to exist, a supreme being would have to either negotiate with one or more of its own awareness units to be the supreme being's opponent, or a supreme being would have to create in one or more of its awareness units 
an apprehension that a supreme being posed a threat to the continued existence of all other spiritual beings. A spiritual being's opponent would not be any different or inherently more evil than any other spiritual being. Um, or any more than a neighbor who sits down opposite to play another in a game of Monopoly is either more innately more evil just because he or she plays a different role. An opponent would simply be one who became a different marker on a game board and played as well as possible. If such a game had indeed existed, then we can certainly hope that it may end soon by a supreme being conveying thanks to the opponent for a game well played, promising that indefinite survival of its awareness units and asking that the game be stopped. It seems time to put many old games to rest so that everyone may start moving into a phase of fundamentally improved existence. And uh, that's the end of chapter 40. And there's I mean, another chapter here to the uh, researcher, chapter, chapter 41 to the researcher. Was, uh, and uh, we will, of course, actually, read that. It, it starts with a quote. For you on tomorrow. And I actually so had planned on, I come across this quote a while back and had planned on putting this in uh, the Secret Right Volume 2. Because to me, I think it sums up. Um, it's sort of a, a thought that I, I think people who may be new to some, especially some of the stuff we're going to have in, in, in Secret Right Volume 2, um, I think it's something people need to bear in mind. Um, you know, because I got to tell you, you know, the, the acceptance and the way that people, because I, I mean, I was, I was the first guy that came out in a large way and had a significant platform that talked about the Council for National Policy. Everybody that's come after me has wrote on the coattails of all the years of research I've done on it. It's a fact. Period in the story. There's just no way around it. You, you I, I, I'm the first. First, that went to bat on the issue, and I brought it to the to to the public in a, in a large way. And uh, other people, thank goodness, have, have have also talked about it as well, which has been uh, and finally figured out and done their own research on it. But uh, it is custom. It is the customary fate of new truths to begin as heresies. Thomas Huxley. It is the customary fate of new truths to begin as heresies. And that, that you know, that was kind of how this the CMP information was treated when I first started bringing it out. You know, and all the stuff I've done exposing Alex Jones, I mean, <laughs> you know, it, they begin as heresies and become actually accepted truths. And uh, that's exactly pretty much sums up, you know, my work on, in, in that end of things. So let's let, let's get going here. Chapter 41 to the researcher. Thank you for staying with me. I realize that many of the ideas I expressed have probably been challenging for you to deal with as they were for me. If nothing else, I hope you found some of the information in support of my ideas interesting. I've always enjoyed new perspectives, and I believe that it is important to be willing to express them. Every perspective has something to contribute, but no perspective can contribute anything unless it is communicated. An important fact to keep in mind is that knowledge is, to a degree, a historical phenomenon in itself. Nearly every civilization at any given moment in history has possessed a broadly accepted body of historical, social, and scientific teachings to explain nearly everything. The irony, of course, is that many of those teachings are different today than they were back in the 1300s. More than likely, scholars working 500 years in the future will be as amused by some of our 20th century teachings as we are by some of the established teachings of the 14th century. It is therefore helpful to step back from one's own time and to understand that knowledge has never been an absolute. Despite assertions to the contrary, rather, knowledge has been an ever-changing commodity as it is enhanced and refined over time. The completion of this book marks the completion of my research, except for the possibility of one revision to correct any errors which I may discover or which are pointed out to me. I plan to do no more work in this area. This book demanded enormous financial, emotional, and social sacrifices that were enough to last me a lifetime. I hope to pass the torch, to re the torch of research to others. Despite its length, this book is but an outline. It only begins to present all of the information and evidence available on the subjects discussed. There exists an enormous body of data that I never had the time, money, or inclination to pursue, yet it is all highly relevant. I was also limited to the English language, so I barely utilized any non-English books or sources. 
every chapter in this book could easily become a book in itself. My biggest problem was not one scant of one of scant and insufficient evidence. It was of being deluged with too much. Yeah, that's believe me, that's been one of the biggest problems of trying to make films. You know, it's not. Um, I mean, it's very easy to make a fucking five hour, you know, or ten hour, uh, you know, eighteen disc magnum opus. That's easy. But is somebody really going to want to sit down? When, when somebody is, 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 especially somebody who has a short attention span, as most of us do in this day and age, uh, you know, a lot of people who need this type of info, you know, people who, when you're just preaching to the choir, the choir who's used to getting preached to about those topics have no problem sitting through a five or six or a 10 hour movie, right? Because they're, they're already used to the information. But a, a, a new person who is, co is coming into the information, they don't have time to sit down and, and watch your four hour movie on the Council for National Policy or your, you know, your eight hour, 10 hour, 13 hour magnum opus on 9 11. You know, they just don't have time for it. And so for me as a filmmaker, I find it, um, I, I, I just find it, 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 it better to not, I mean, because the thing about it is, I think your impetus, some people's impetus is to try and, Think that you have to put everything in the film, and I just—I'm not—I've never been like that. I don't. My thing is, I—I I still want to leave there to. I want there still to be some surprises. I want to give you the foreground. I want to give you, you know, what I think are the best bits, the best tidbits of info, and then leave the rest to you because you know, I don't. Heaven forbid, you know, far be from me to take away that aha mo moment from you that I've had in my own research and, and that you have because that's a very, very amazing thing, you know. And if you tell people everything, you know, and you don't leave anything for them to go research on your on their own, then guess what? They're not going to go research it on their own. But if you give them enough information and enough, uh, uh, you know, enough tidbits and enough of the story to get them, you know, hopping mad about it or on fire to find out more, then you're more likely to have somebody that's going to go out and do their own research and, and, and start their own platform. And, uh, you know, maybe want to dig deep and find some of this stuff. So that, that that's the whole thing is, and, you know, I see, I see guys try to make these movies four, five, six hours long. I just think that's a mistake. I think it's asking way too much of any one person to ask them to watch a movie that you made that's five or six, seven hours long. I just think that's ridiculous, you know. Um, it's, you know, people are, you got to get an hour and a half, two hours, two and a half hours, maybe three, but past that man it's just it's overkill if you ask me and so I, I understand that as a researcher man it's it's not a lack of of info it's having too much with it and trying to get it down into a concise digestible manner that is going to be able to reach a lot of people because you know again people who are already awake they'd have no problem watching an eight-hour documentary on you know or tassarian and his origins and oracles you know again 50 dvds or something somebody's already awake has no problem watching it you're gonna have a hard time getting somebody who's used to playing world of warcraft to watch your eight hour documentary on the esoteric stuff it's just not gonna happen i discovered that i could easily spend another eight to ten years accumulating it all and build a multi-volume encyclopedia from it but that was not my purpose when i began to realize the enormity of the project i deliberately wound it down so that i would have some hope of presenting a one volume book on the subject I am trusting that others will add to what I have done by publishing writings of their own. I ran across many theories that I did not use. As radical as the ideas expressed in this book may seem, they are, in fact, somewhat conservative compared to the other theories in current circulation. Yeah, I don't doubt that. I tended to accept historical facts, dates, and personages as they are commonly accepted by historians. This may have been a mistake in some cases, but it is the approach I, cho I chose to take. A person researching the topics covered in this book will encounter many revisionist theories that attempt to overturn commonly accepted historical facts. For example, I ran into the George Washington is Adam Weishaupt theory, which speculates that George Washington had been secretly removed from the U.S. presidency and that Adam Weishaupt of B Bavarian Illuminati fame, who actually looked a bit like George Washington, had taken Washington's place after Weishaupt's disappearance from Bavaria. Another theory doing the rounds is that the television transmissions of U.S. astronauts on the moon were actually filmed in a studio. Yet another is that the Earth is hollow and that UFOs originate from a civilization in the world below. 
Perhaps one, two, or all three of these theories are correct, but because I did not find enough information to conclusively validate them in my own mind, I did not adopt them. People researching the role of secret societies in the world history will soon or later encounter the writings of Nesta H. N uh, Nesta H. Webster. Mrs. Webster's works were published during the first two decades of the 20th century, and they bear such titles as The French Revolution. World Revolution, The Socialist Network, Surrender of an Empire, and Secret Societies and Subversive Movements. The main thrust of her books is that the secret societies, especially the Knights Templar Freemasons, have been responsible for instigating most of the major revolutions of the past 200 years. Her works have provided later researchers with a great deal of ammunition upon which to build conspiracy theories of history. It is unquestioned that Mrs. Weber was very successful in bringing forth a great deal of valuable information that probably would not have otherwise reached us today. All of her books reveal exhaustive work. Mrs. Webster might have gone down as the top researcher in her field, and her contribution to mankind might have been enormous had her own personal perspective not been clouded. Mrs. Webster made a fatal mistake by concluding that the world's apparent Machiavellian source was a so-called Jewish conspiracy. In her book, Secret Societies and Subversive Movements, she devoted an entire chapter to, quote, the real Jewish peril, in which she blames the Jews for the Christian world's subversion. This anti-Semitic slant is so strong, as is an anti-German slant, that the value of her research is lost because a researcher cannot readily trust all the information she presents. You know, that's, a, that's a common thing. That's, that, that's when you know somebody's an operator. Which is like Eric John Phelps, same thing with him. This is a shame, but it is also a good lesson to any researcher. It reveals that an anchored bias can utterly ruin any benefits that might otherwise accrue from this type of research. It also indicates the need to remain flexible in the face of changing history and evidence. Had Mrs. Webster lived longer and seen what happened to the Jews during World War II, her outlook may have been different. There were many avenues of, of investigation that I never had time to pursue, but which could bring forth some fruit, although I make no guarantees. I present them here in no particular order for those who might be interested in digging further. Number one, throughout the world, there is a very strong political and economic force, the labor union. Labor unions have done a great deal to improve working conditions for many working people, but there is no question that some union tactics have generated continuous conflict. Unionization has also had the effect of creating a mild form of feudalism by magnifying the superficial distinction between managers and non-managers and bringing the two groups into conflict. Interestingly, one of the key forces behind the early American labor union movements was an organization known as the Knights of Labor. The Knights of Labor were a secret society with secret oaths, just like the Brotherhood or other Brotherhood organizations. Although the Knights later dropped their mystical practices and eventually declined in strength, they played a role in creating the American Federation of Labor, the AFL, which has since grown to become the major union in America. Questions to research might be who started the Knights of Labor or any of its founders, members of other Brotherhood organizations, as seems likely from the character of the Knights of Labor. Number two, one argument against the idea that there has been a Machiavellian source behind human warfare is the fact that primitive tribal societies, untouched by the Western world, have also engaged in repeated warfare. This would seem to disprove the Brotherhood connection and suggests that perhaps warfare is really just a part of human nature. No, it doesn't. I don't think it discounts the Brotherhood connection at all. Because I don't even know why Bramley, but that goes, I mean, to me, him even insinuating that goes against everything he's written in this book. Because just as he talked about, you know, for thousands of years, you know, on this planet, before the rise of civilizations or anything else, We've had constant reports of these quote unquote sky gods coming down and, and seeding man or uh, humans with with uh, with culture, with religion, with everything else. So, I mean, I, I don't I don't think that there's there's just no other way around it to me. 
I just don't see how somebody can say, you know, mankind was seeded with religion, mankind was genetically engineered, but yet they weren't seeded also with the idea of constant warfare? I mean, that's ridiculous. How can you say that, that we were seeded with technology, we were seeded with knowledge and information and life and all this stuff and religion, but yet, of course, the only, the only way to keep us controllable and keep us in a state where we won't be a threat to the custodians is to keep us constantly killing each other. I thought that Bramley was quite aware of that from what we read in this book. That just seems kind of weird. It's almost like it took him so long to write the damn book that he forgot what he believed in when he started writing it. <laughs> Let me repeat that there are definite psychological factors behind human warfare that must be handled before the entire problem is solved. Machiavellian machinations merely increase the frequency and severity of war. Conflicts can still erupt without such machinations. It is, however, a remarkable fact that brotherhood-style secret societies are extremely pervasive throughout the entire world and exist even among very primitive peoples. In fact, such societies appear to be as common in the primitive world as they are in, a, in the civilized one. But, for example, Captain F.W. Butt Thompson, writing in his book West African Secret Society, says of Africa, the native secret societies found amongst the peoples and tribes of the west coast of Africa are many. Nearly 150 of them are referred to in the following chapters. Captain Butt Thompson, Captain Butt, that's great, Captain Butt Thompson, what a great name, divided those societies into two basic groups, mystical and political. Of the mystical type, he wrote, these approximate in organization and purpose, the Grecian Pythagoreans, the Roman Gnostics, the Jewish Kabbalah, and the Essenes, the Bavarian Illuminati and Illuminata, the Prussian Rosicrucians, and the worldwide Freemasons. In the course of the years, they have evolved an official class that may be likened to the priesthood founded by Ignatius Loya, the Jesuits. Well, that's interesting. Saying that these secret societies like the Rosicrucians and the Gnostics and the Kabbalah may have evolved into an official class similar to the Jesuits. Well, that's a huge revelation, isn't it? Well, number one, that the Jesuits uh, evolved into, into their, uh, are their, a class in and of themselves. We know that, but, um, and then number two, for, for the, you know, those are just shocking admissions there. Because that is what you find. They have, they, the, the people that exist in those groups become their own class of people. Very different from everybody else out in the world. Some of the African secret societies were obviously brought in from the outside, such as the Mohammedan societies. In many primitive areas, however, from Africa to New Guinea, such societies are native. Questions to be researched might include just how pervasive is this form of mysticism in primitive society? How did the primitive secret societies begin to do... Uh, uh, how I'm sorry, how did the primitive secret societies begin... And do they have legends of extraterrestrials? To what degree have they taught mystical beliefs that exalt and encourage war? Number three, if a custodial society exists, then Earth's history may be simply be, uh, be a tragic footnote in a much broader history beginning long before human civilization arose on Earth. Yeah, that's what I believe. Absolutely, that, that, that's the truth. What might that history be? What caused the apparent ethical, social, and spiritual decay of the custodial society? Is there any way to find out? Uh, uh, number four. On November 18, 1978, a tragedy occurred in the South American nation of Guyana. Of, uh, Guyana where the 900 men, women, and children were mysteriously murdered in an isolated religious commune known as the People's Temple, Jonestown. A large vat of drink containing poison was found at the scene, leading to an initial assumption that the deaths were caused by suicide. Oh, yeah, well, British, British SAS was just right off the coast of there. That was an op front to back. The victims' bodies were discovered lying side by side in neat rows as though the people had drank the poison and had then been laid down together and died. However, when autopsies were performed on the victims, it was discovered that 700 of the 900 people had died of gunshot and strangulation, not poison. They had not committed suicide at all. They were brutally mass murdered. 
It is very likely that those who drank the poison either did so involuntarily or did not know what they were drinking. The only people to escape the tragedy were not present when the 900 victims were murdered. There are no known witnesses to the entire event. The question is, who murdered the inhabitants of Jonestown? On September 27, 1980, investigative journalist Jack Anderson ran a column about the Jonestown incident. One newspaper headlined the column, CIA involved in the Jonestown massacre, with a question mark. Mr. Anderson cites a tape recording made of People's Temple leader Jim Jones, in which Jones referred to a man named Dwyer. According to Mr. Anderson, investigators have concluded that this was Richard Dwyer, deputy chief of the U.S. mission to Guyana. Dwyer had accompanied U.S. Representative Leo Ryan to the Jonestown encampment on that ill-fated day. Leo Ryan became one of the murder victims. But Richard Dwyer somehow was not affected and even claimed later that the reference to him by Jim Jones was a mistake. Richard Dwyer, as it turns out, has been listed in the East German publication Who's Who in the CIA as a longtime CIA agent. Dwyer had reportedly begun his career with the spy agency in 1959. According to Mr. Anderson's column, Dwyer replied no comment when asked if he was a CIA agent. After the massacre, investigators found at Jonestown large quantities of weapons and drugs. The drugs included powerful psychotropics, quaaludes, Valium, Demerol, and Thorazine. Another drug found at Jonestown was chloral hydrate, which had been used in the CIA's secret mind control program known as MKUltra. Was Jonestown a CIA mind control experiment which recruited subjects, especially poor black people, through the guise of religion? The Jonestown massacre was triggered when a U.S. Congressman, Leo Ryan, flew to Guyana to investigate Jonestown personally after he had failed to obtain information about it from the State Department. Leo Ryan never lived to tell what he discovered, and nearly every last man, woman, and child was silenced. The massacre occurred during a time when many American newspapers were carrying stories about CIA mind control experiments, experiments which the CIA claimed that it was no longer conducting. Did the CIA slaughter 900 people to cover up the fact that it was still conducting such experiments on a massive scale in a small jungle compound in Guyana? Additional questions to be researched are, what is the true history of the People's Temple prior to Jonestown? What is Jim Jones' background, CIA asset? What supported him and his early church? Number five. Books, movies, and other art forms tend to give a romantic twist to UFOs, spies, assassination conspiracies, and so on. As we are perhaps beginning to realize behind the romance, there lie some cruel and brutal psychoses. A significant problem in any society geared for overt and covert warfare is that sociopathic personalities tend to find a home in government. Sociopaths are not affected by qualms of conscience and are often delighted in harming others. They are frequently promoted to high positions within agencies engaged in warfare because such personalities are able to attack and harm others repeatedly without it adversely affecting them emotionally. Sociopaths with high IQs can be quite clever in how they harm others. This deviousness is often valuable to intelligence agencies. As history has shown, the more that a nation is oriented towards war, the more it will become dominated by sociopathic personalities. This domination, in turn, leads to a rapid decay of a nation and will eventually cause its ruin. This is one of the great dangers any nation faces when it becomes involved in long-term conflict, no matter how democratic or humane that nation might otherwise be. Questions to be researched might include to what extent are true soci sociopathic personalities dominating governments today? Why do people tolerate them? Have those custodial religions which demand the worship of criminally insane beings as angels and God perhaps blinded many people to being able to see soci sociopathology for what it is? Number six, this book merely touched on the influence of brotherhood organizations in Asian history. I discussed Hinduism, but there is a great deal more to be found. For example, the Bloody Boxer Rebellion of China in 1900 was instigated by members of an Asian branch of the Brotherhood Network, the Boxers. 
the boxers were fiercely anti-foreign. They massacred over 100,000 people and often photographed the beheaded, vi the beheaded victims. They stirred up revolt, which brought to China the armies of several major Western powers to quash the uprising. Questions to be researched might include what other wars and uprisings in Asia were caused by Brotherhood organizations, and what has the full impact of the Brotherhood network been on the, the history of Asia? Well, I mean, in China, they believe their whole bloodline of the leadership was seeded by this reptilian snake dragon serpent thing. I mean, my goodness. Number seven. A topic I wanted to do to research deeper was the subject of drugs. We discussed drugs several times, but not in any great historical depth. While drugs seem to have always been a part of human culture, was there a time when drugs were really first pushed on society? If there was, when was it and who did it? Number eight. One highly publicized problem today is that of vanishing children. Many children are abducted every year by parents during custody disputes by relatives and by strangers. Many more children vanish by running away from home. Runaways and parental abductions are easy to account for, and they constitute the majority of missing child cases. There has been, however, some confusion about the extent of child abductions by strangers. In the early 1980s, the nation's leading missing child agency, Child Find Incorporated, stated, that anywhere from 20,000 to 50,000 children were vanishing every year as the result of abductions by strangers. In 1985, Child Fund revised that figure down to 600. I called Child Fund to learn what caused such a dramatic change in the number, and I was told that the earlier figure was really a broad catch-all and that 600 was the true number of stranger abduction cases per year. To further confuse the issue, I later learned from another source that out of all runaways, about 3,000 in the United States disappear yearly without a trace. Will that figure also be changed? As the reader can see, there seems to be some genuine confusion regarding how many children are really vanishing. Many children are eventually found, of course. Others vanish completely. I would become interested in this problem because of reported abductions of humans by UFOs. The UFO abductions we learn of today are those in which the human victims are returned. Are there many known cases in which UFO abduction victims are not returned? Might some of those instances involve children? I even found myself asking this unthinkable question. If the human race had been created as a slave race, might it still be providing manpower, perhaps, in the form of human children to the custodial society? A respected UFO researcher of this generation is Jacques Vallée. Jacques Vallée, who has authored several influential books about the UFO phenomenon, was one of the first researchers to focus on the fact that the UFO phenomenon has been very closely linked to episodes of social change throughout history. Mr. Vallée also noted an apparent connection between ancient folklore and UFOs. Some of the little people in folklore have been described in much the same way as modern UFO pilots. UFO-like phenomenon have been occasionally described in old stories of little people as well. One activity attributed to the, to the little people in folklore was their frequent kidnapping of children. Many of those children would never be seen again. This was a major source of upset between humans and the little people. This raises some rather startling questions. Are there any recent child-stealing episodes with a UFO connection? Is it conceivable that there could exist on Earth today a child-stealing network which feeds an ongoing custodial demand for human labor? These questions are admittedly far out and the stuff of supermarket tabloids, but they may actually be worthy of investigation by some brave soul in the light of all we have come to know about the UFO phenomenon. I hope that some of the above questions will provide good starting points for additional research. In the final analysis, the important thing is to be flexible with ideas and even to have fun with them. By sticking my neck out, as I have done in this book, I hope that I will encourage other people to explore those topics, which they are curious about, and to share what they find. You and I may not always be right. The important thing is that we are willing to explore and communicate. Here, here to that, my friend. Be careful that you do not base all of your beliefs upon a mere handful of writers, teachers, ministers, or scientists. 
learn from them, but also explore on your own and have fun doing it. Do not always look to others for approval of what you have discovered. If your integrity says that something is a certain way, stick to it, regardless of any snubs or criticisms. On the other hand, be ready to change your mind if you discover in your own mind that you are wrong. Learning that one has erred is often a hard pill to swallow, but it is a part of the learning process. The man who pretends that he has always been right is either an egoist or a liar, and he does not learn much of anything either. Good luck and happy sleuthing. So there you go. Uh, the author welcomes questions and comments about his books. Readers are invited to write him at the following address. 5339 Prospect Road, number 300, San Jose, California, 95129. There you go. So that's uh, that's William Brown's The Gods of Eden.